All right. So uh, this stream, we're going to mainly do a bunch of cleanup of kind of the code. We're going to add a lot of documentation. We're going to answer a lot of questions that people have about how that code is organized and developed and how it interfaces. So today, I want it to be kind of like the... I want this to be v1.0 for the the framework of the kernel not for the like the end goal which is arbitrary research but like for the core framework of the os to be solid that it works multiple cores spins things up it works reliably um maybe we'll get to a network dri driver but i think that'll come tomorrow uh, I'm going to try and keep the stream a little bit more focused on not adding features, but improving quality, improving documentation, fixing any bugs we come across, maybe writing some tests and some fuzzers and trying to iron out some kinks and really stress test this on different machines, um, and then get this code pushed up because I haven't pushed to GitHub in about three days because I haven't had, I haven't had this in a code, this code in a state that I consider stable, um, so, yeah, I want to get everything merged up there. Yeah, today's a test day. Hell yeah. Semi-serious question. What do you think about functional programming in general? Uh, let me... Let me... I'm, I'm going to Google functional programming to see, like, more formally what people consider functional pro programming. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, lines up with what I expected. Honestly, I've never gotten too into it. I I don't really know like what drives people to it. I don't know what makes people big into like Has Haskell and uh, like Erlang and other I I don't know what other languages you'd consider functional languages. But I've never really written them, so I've never really got into that mindset. I think they're really common in more like mathy folks. I don't know if there's some expressiveness that's better uh, when you're working with those sorts of languages. Um, I honestly don't think I can speak to them that much, to be honest. So, Chronix, 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 thank you for the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Okay, so I think where did we leave off yesterday? Cause I've I I did like eight hours of development yesterday when you guys weren't around. Uh, mainly a lot of a uh, uh, polishing and cleanup, kind of similar to what I'm gonna uh, finish up today. But I actually the reason I stopped. Uh, and turn on the, uh, the stream is I actually figured out the bug that I'm having. Well, not provably, but I, I'm pretty damn confident that, uh, I'm pretty damn confident I figured out the bug. So, you guys might have been wondering for the past, like, two days why a lot of this stuff is super hard. And we're actually making this really difficult on ourselves So some of the, some of the things we're implementing, mainly soft reboot. Now, for traditional operating system development, uh, you'll notice that we haven't really had many bugs. Um, you'll you'll find that while it looks like we run into all these things that aren't working and we're constantly fixing bugs, especially for kind of the past two streams we've been doing a lot of fixing bugs, we actually really haven't run into many crashes or misbehaviors of the kernel itself. What we've run into is that soft reboots stop working. And that's because soft reboots are exceptionally hard problems. And the reason is what we're trying to do is we're trying to put all of the software and hardware and memory back to the state it was in when the BIOS passed off execution to us such that we can jump back and still use the BIOS and it still functions and it still has its uh, interrupt handlers installed and it behaves exactly as it did before. And it turns out that is a really, really, really hard problem. Um, so, I hope you guys realize that that we're not really, we don't have too many bugs in our actual code base itself. It's more on the side of getting everything to work in the soft reboot, which we've set as a requirement for the, this OS, which is a pretty unrealistic um, goal to have. But, hey, I like unrealistic goals here. Uh, nearly all of the good features of Rust came from Haskell. Lifetimes are uh, too close to linear types. Interesting. I did not know that. I, I've legitimately never programmed Haskell, so I cannot speak for or against it. Uh, I've looked at the syntax before. It looks a little bit convoluted, but that's basically all I can say. <laughs> Rust is like Haskell for people who want to write code with side effects and not who have to in understand category theory. That sounds pretty accurate. <laughs> 
The original Rust developers were OCaml fans, and that's why the original compiler was written in OCaml. Yeah, I heard that. I think I poked around with that very early on and like looking into how the language is bootstrapped. Well, now it works. <laughs> it's all in Rust. I, I don't know if they have a full chain to recover it if for some reason there were no compilers left in the world, but I think it's safe to say that there will never be a day where there's not a Rust compiler anymore. <laughs> there's always going to be some random server that has a Rust binary or a backup somewhere, so... It is kind of interesting. I think I asked that question on an older stream of mine where I, I literally said, um, like, if you had whatever code base, a work project, whatever whatever you work on in your daily programming life, if you were to lose the entire build system, all build servers, all of your like Git repos, not of the code, but of the history and the logs. So you like delete all of your make files, all your build scripts, all of your build uh, like uh, CI testing, pipelining, building infrastructure, and you just had the raw source code files. How long would it take to get things w running again? <laughs> And for a lot of projects, it's like, fuck me, it's not going to work ever again. There's some version of some library and some thing that's on one server that has the right linker, that has the right makefile script and two hard-coded paths with a, with three symbolic links set up, and it kind of it kind of builds in that environment. <laughs> I don't know, I've, I've always been very picky about getting things to build very generically in almost any environment. Uh, it means a lot to me to be able to build the code on Windows and Linux and FreeBSD and OS X uh, without uh, much environment requirements. Uh, and I think we did that with this kernel. I don't know how many people have downloaded it or played around with it. It's, I guess what's commit right now is honestly not really much to do anything with, but yeah. Uh, the thing I work on would take about a day to get working again, but about two years of bureaucratic overhead. <laughs> That sounds pretty fair. <laughs> I've been debugging a bug in a tool chain we use at work for the past couple of weeks, and that was with minimal changes. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Do you know how many like lines of code or the complexity of uh, what you're working on is? Approximately. Okay. So the issue, the reason why I started this stream is I actually identified what this bug is. And what I found is that if I put this delay in here, which uh, 5 billion cycles, uh, it basically divide your cycles by the clock rate of your processor. You'll see me do that a lot. Um, in this case, the processor is like 3.8 3 gigahertz, I think, on one of these machines and 1.3 on another. I just usually assume that like processors never really go over 5 gigahertz, and thus 5 gigahertz is a second minimum on every machine. And worst case, it's like five seconds. You know, usually uh, under an order of magnitude doesn't matter too much for this. Um, so what I found is that having this delay in here actually broke soft reboots. And I got to thinking a lot about why having a delay would cause soft reboots. After all, I have interrupts disabled. Um, if interrupts are disabled, I reset everything actually off stream. I reset the APIC, all the APIC code, I reset back to its original state. So previously, um, I added a bunch of code in here that basically any register that I ever write to, um, so like here, oh, I actually stylized and I made an enum for these things too, and I put all of the APIC registers in an enum. This now takes an enum, uh, not write ICR, but write APIC takes an enum, and read APIC takes an enum. So I kind of polished up some of this code already. Um, but what I did is when I initialized the APIC, oh, I added a lot of comments uh, talking about the APIC and transitioning it from different states and what's supported and what's not. Uh, pretty cool stuff. But what I ran into was um, here. When I start the APIC, when I start programming it, I actually save off everything before I change it. So before I change these pick states, I save them off. But before I change the APIC base, I save that off. Uh, before I change all of these registers, all the timer state and all the things that we end up programming in the APIC, I save them off. And that means in the drop handler, what I can do is I can restore everything back to its original state. And this is important because the machine that I'm currently running on, actually the two hardware machines I'm testing on, uh, my CPU land, and my uh, Xeon Phi machine, both of these, um, 
they both have Intel NICs. One has an X540, which is a 10 gigabit NIC, and one has an 80... Uh, something. It, it's in one of the E1000 series. And both of them fail to soft reboot when I put that sleep in there. So what I actually determined, and I haven't proven yet, uh, but I'm so confident, I'm not even remotely worried about being wrong here. Um, basically, I think what the problem is, let's go, the, the sleep is in pan, uh, uh, that's the bootloader panic. The sleep that we add is in kernel panic here. And basically when I had that sleep, I would no longer be able to boot. It would get stuck in the bootloader. And whenever something gets stuck in the bootloader, that's pretty much always a sign that the Pixie implementation stops working. It's not that there's a deadlock. It's not that the, the, the bootloader panicked or stopped working because the bootloader is pretty fixed in what it can do. The odds that the bootloader panics are basically zero on a soft reboot because it worked before. Right, it's impossible that we're soft rebooting unless it worked before. And if it worked before, then there's going to be no panics the next time we go through that bootloader. Unless something were to change, maybe the PE file gets corrupted or something. But, one thing that does change is the option ROM sensitivity to hardware state. And what I think is happening, and I've been doing reading, and we're going to be able to actually display this information, so I'm super excited. Um... What's actually happening is we have the timer enabled at this point, so we're panicking. We have interrupts disabled. We have interrupts disabled long before we get into panic, but we definitely have interrupts disabled because we disable them here. But we still have a difference in state whether or not there's a delay here. And nothing happens on the system if there's a delay other than interrupts. And I, I finally figured out what's happening. What's happening is the timer interrupt is coming through it sees that the, um, the interrupts are disabled, and it stays pending. That interrupt is sitting on the APIC waiting to happen. So there's a, there's a timer interrupt that's been blocked off from happening. Then we do our soft reboot. We tear everything down cleanly. We, dis we, we disable all the things that we can. And then we go back into the bootloader. And then we do a Pixie call, and I know that the Pixie implementation on the, um, the hardware that I have right now clearly is relying on the APIC uh, or interrupts in some way or another. And what's happening is when we actually go back, that the, the driver, the Pixie code that's driving the network card uses interrupts, and it turns on interrupts at some point, and BAM! Right out of fucking nowhere, a timer interrupt comes through on a vector that it's not expecting. So, because we program a different vector for a timer, and now all of a sudden, some random interrupt comes flying in out of nowhere, and that zaps it. It either kills it in terms of uh, it causes the pixie code to get stuck or to break or to crash, or it causes the pixie code to not handle it correctly and not EOI it, or it causes the pixie code to do the wrong thing because the wrong interrupt vector gets set. Whatever it is, there are so many possible things that could go wrong because it's getting an interrupt it's not expecting. So what we have to do is we have to clear that pending interrupt. And I'm not aware of any way that we can clear a pending interrupt other than A, maybe doing a software disable of the APIC, and I'll look into that. But I tried that before, and that kind of hurts, that kind of hurts the bootloader's ability to bring it up anyways. Uh, I think that's what I originally, like, Ideally, what I would do is I would reset the APIC and then put it back in the state it was before, but I'm actually keeping in the APIC from the previous state, and then I'm changing some, some of it and then putting those back. And I found that that's been more reliable. That might mean that maybe we need to save off more state of the APIC, and then we can restore more state of the APIC, and we can put it back to its original state. In that case, if disabling the APIC in software releases those interrupts, uh, then that's one vector that we can do. And the other vector, which is really difficult, um, the other thing that we might potentially have to do is we might literally have to, before we do a soft reboot, we'll have to check if there are any pending interrupts on the APIC. And if there are, we'll have to enable interrupts, have them cause the actual interrupt to happen, EOI the interrupt, and then return out. So we might have to make uh, EOI stubs where we, where we basically put all interrupt handlers to like an EOI ret 
and then we'd just quickly turn on interrupts, wait for everything to clear out, and then we'd turn them back off, and then we'd transition back to the bootloader after disabling all the devices that cause these interrupts. Um, this is a, an exceptionally unique problem to this kernel. This is not something that is easy. This is not something that's a mistake of our own. This is not something that normal developers in operating system context do because we are, we are relying on the fact that we can reset hardware entirely to the state that it was prior to getting execution such that pre-boot execution code still works as intended, which is a very, very, very complex guarantee, and no kernels are even close to having that functionality. And that's how we get soft reboots. Um, so we're gonna take a look at it. Uh, I've, I've been doing a little bit of reading. Let me talk you through some of the things that I've changed, uh, like a little bit la uh, yesterday and a little bit today. Um, so, uh, Basically, I touched a couple things in the APIC. I made all the APIC code. Uh, it now, anything that we can affect, any state that we can affect in the APIC, we revert back when we release the APIC, when we drop the APIC. That'll cause us to revert everything back to the original state. Uh, there were some things that were causing IPIXI and QMU KVM to break, uh, all of these. We re-enabled the PIC to the same interrupt states that it was prior to our execution, as well as all the APIC states, we put those back. Um, except for that pending interrupt. Um, I cleaned up this code to use enums instead of actual register numbers. This way I can verify those, uh, those values. It makes the code more readable. It in increases the confidence that we're doing the right thing. It decreases the amount of uh, wrongness that can be presented to these APIs. So it kind of tightens a lot of that control, which I really like to do. Um, the other thing that I added today uh, was actually really cool. So... Um, one thing that I added is I put this core check-in here for all the cores. Uh, I think I wrote core check-in the last stream, but it only set kind of the states. Um, what version of Clang does Chocolate Milk expect? I, I use 10, but I can't imagine it wouldn't work on Clang 3 plus, uh, cause this is the same development model I've used pretty much forever. Unless Rust is causing some object code to get created, which is pretty LLVM recent, but I don't think that's the case. Actually, Rust is, Rust will produce objects that will go, that LLVM will link. So it probably shouldn't be too bad. Oh, file align. Oh, interesting. Uh, I can actually relax that requirement. Um, file align is not required for our kernel. We're, we're leveraging it to pack things in a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, we, we definitely don't have to do that. So we can look at changing that. And that file align 1000 hex is for, oh yeah, that's for the bootloader, I think. Um, but yeah, we, we, could, we could relax that if, if, uh, if LLVM 10 isn't super available. Um, I, know, I know it's readily available, but if it's not super common, I'd, I'd like to adapt my build system. Sure, yeah, file on issue, thank you. Okay, so the other thing that I made is core check-in now blocks all the cores from continuing from this, uh, uh, from this point on until all cores are initialized. Uh, and when I say initialized, I mean they come up and they check in. So basically until all the cores check in, this code will not release. That means that this is a barrier to the, the whole kernel. And what's really nice about that... Um, I was doing some theory crafting, and I was doing theory crafting with doing this uh, free mem allocation in a loop. So basically I would sit here in a hot loop and uh, allocate free memory. Now the problem with that is that cores, on a four core system it's not very noticeable, but on my 256 core Xeon Phi, the, what would happen here is cores are coming up through the bootloader and the cores coming up through the bootloader want to get an allocation. And they want to allocate some memory for their stack, right? The bootloader needs a, uh, the bootloader cores need a stack so they can uh, transfer to the kernel and have a unique stack. But if this, if something in the kernel is in a hot loop, doing allocations, that means that those cores will never be able to actually win that race. If if all of the cores are fighting that one other core, it will unlikely not win. That means that the um, 
those cores will get stuck in the bootloader. That means the BSP will never release because the BSP is waiting for that core to come up. It's blocking for the cores to come up before it releases the cores. Unless the BSP doesn't get anywhere. Um, and it just kind of turns into this whole shit show. So what I did is I made core check-in now blocks everything. And that means that basically cores will do their initialization procedure and then they'll stop. They'll be quiet until all the other cores are up. At that point, they can all thrash and do whatever because the cores are stable at that point. They've been, they've allocated their core resources, which are required to tear them down aggressively. They've allocated timers so we can do soft reboots and, and capture all these different states. Um, so there's a lot of things that we kind of change by, by forcing that. One other thing that we can look into doing is putting ticket locks back in. Uh, ticket locks uh, are the first style of lock that we added, and they're a fair lock. They basically mean that you get serviced in the order that you show up to the lock. Um, so you're guaranteed to not permanently lose a race in any condition. In the, in the case of your one core versus 255 other cores, uh, you would still win every 255 times the lock comes up for use. Um, which, in the case of anything that's not permanently grabbing a lock, pretty good. That being said, I still like having the barrier here because it is theoretically possible that a core could grab a free memory lock here and then panic. And then that causes that not to get released. Another core hasn't come up yet, so it can't allocate its critical boot structures. And if it can't allocate its critical boot structures, then the BSP isn't going to be able to shut it down in a meaningful way. Uh, so let me, let's hop in. Let's go into that code. So the way that works, it's uh, really straightforward. This we implemented, I think, on ACPI. And here's our check-in code. Uh, we have the number of cores that have checked in. We require that all cores, including the BSP check-in, that means that every single core has to get to this point, regardless of the BSP uh, or not, has to get here before anything can happen. And that guarantees that all locks have been dropped. Everyone is up in a meaningful running operating state. Uh, so what we do is we just, we have a cores checked in variable. At the end of the function, we will check in the core by incrementing this count, and then we wait until that count is equal to the number of cores that we're expecting to boot. Um, in the case of a BSP, we expect that it's already in the online state. In the case of an AP, we expect that that core has transitioned from a launch to an online state. This also means in our uh, spin up code on ACPI, when we bring up the other APIX, uh, we actually set it to the launch state for that core, we launch the core, and then we wait for it to come online. This means that we'll always launch the cores in APIC order. And that's really important because it means that the cores will come up in the same order every boot. While that doesn't matter for almost every circumstance, for us it does matter because it means cores will always have the same core IDs upon reboot. That's really helpful for uh, kind of hacky debugging if you want to hardcore some core identifiers. Maybe you have some weird race condition or, or a crash on a specific core. And that allows you to know ahead of time what core will have that crash occur. Because all of the, all of the cores will always have the same numbering with respect to their physical cores. Uh, I like that a lot. It also means... Um, it also means... Uh, we have a lot more confidence about which cores get which stacks at which locations. So all the cores should be getting their same uh, virtual addresses for their stacks, same physical addresses for the pages that compose those stacks, all this stuff. Is there a reason you're calling uh, IPI4608 twice? Yes. Uh, this is called the init sippy sippy sequence to bring up other cores. We send an init signal here, and then we send two I, uh, startup IPI messages. And that's just, this, that's just the protocol that Intel defines that you should use. Uh, typically, init sippy does work. Uh, I don't know why specifically Intel says to use init sippy sippy. It's probably something legacy. I'm guessing most modern processors can handle it. Um, but it's just what we do. And we're actually going to change that a little bit even more today. So another thing that I wrote today that is really, really cool, and I love this. I implemented this function called disable all cores. And uh, right now, what we have is if an application processor causes a, uh, a panic, um, which happens from an exception or, or you know whatever condition causes the panic, it will send an NMI to the BSP and say, hey, I panicked. I'm letting you know, I'm going to sleep now. Um, please uh, print my panic message and bring the system down. 
So that's what we previously had here is we had this code path where if the interrupt number was number two, which is the NMI interrupt vector, and the core ID was zero, then we would panic. And then our panic handler is aware of if other cores have panicked. So that's kind of how we handled those NMIs. But then what I actually thought is I'm not super confident that I, if I'm like resetting a processor that it's actually coming, uh, that we're actually getting control back again. So what I did is I added something the other way where that BSP will init all other cores on the system or it will send NMIs to all other cores on the system until they check in. So this is the check-in path. If a core gets an NMI, it'll go to here. The interrupt handler will be two. It'll go to set core state, where it will set the core state for itself. Uh, instead of online, it sets itself to the halted state, and then it permanently halts. And what's really neat about this core state is that means in ACPI, I can implement, actually in panic, I can implement disable all cores. And what this does is it goes through all of the cores on the system, it sends them an, an NMI to cause them to halt, and then it waits for them to halt. So when this function returns, this guarantees that all other cores have halted. This isn't like what we were doing before where we would send off some init to the other cores and we just, we'd assume that they probably were reset in a given timely enough manner. In this case, we don't do that at all. We actually wait for the cores to truly check in and say, I have halted, and then they halt. Um, and this is really cool, it, it guarantees that. So I'm really happy about that code. We're actually gonna expand on this. We'll probably have some timeout thresholds. Uh, if they don't respond soon enough, we'll send them another NMI, just in case they're blocking NMIs, so we can kind of come through and, and send a couple through. They should really never be blocking NMIs. In fact, I don't think they ever will be blocking NMIs because this should be the only source of NMIs on the system. That being said, once we do actually add hypervisors, they will block NMIs when running a guest and that will appear as an NMI to the um, hypervisor and they'll get a VM exit for an NMI. So we'll have to be able to handle that, but that's easy, we can do that. So this makes sure that all of the APs have gone to a, a fully halted state before we do anything else. And we do that both here in soft reboot as well as in panic before we start getting access to things that we're not supposed to have access to, the, these serial ports. This will provably guarantee that all the other cores are done doing anything before we start breaking locks and kind of changing them, some things up on the system. I guess we don't break locks. We actually uh, reinitialize the serial port, which is the correct way to do it. Okay. So that leads us to where we're at with this bug. So what we want to do is, uh, I'll talk you through a little bit about the APIC and how it works. I'm not much of an interrupt guy, to be honest. Um, I haven't done too much work with interrupts. My interrupt knowledge is is very basic. So I don't want to I don't want to consider myself an expert on this specific aspect of kernel dev. Most of my kernels do not have interrupts, and thus I don't really think about these things. Anyways. The way that interrupts basically happen on APIX, uh, APIX allows scheduling and up to two pending interrupts for every interrupt slot. And the way that two pending interrupts happen is they go through, um, I think somewhere there's a pretty good table here. Um, let me find it. Actually, we'll just probably look at the APIX register. You know what? Look at... Uh, Interrupt acceptance. This might talk about it. Okay, yes. So basically what happens is when an interrupt gets asserted, whether it's a local interrupt from a timer interrupt or whether it's a remote interrupt from an IPI or an actual piece of hardware, what happens is it will set a bit in the IIRR, which is the in request register. So these we have three registers. We have the IRR, the ISR, and the TMR. And the IIR has one bit for every bit on the processor, and that holds whether or not there is a requested interrupt for that vector. ISR holds whether or not there is a servicing interrupt that is out there. And the TMR holds information about whether that is a uh, level or edge-driven interrupt. Um, I think that might actually tell you the level of it just in general no i think it actually tells you if it's level or, level or edge um 
Anyways, we don't care about the TMR. Uh, yeah, the trigger mode register. It indicates the trigger mode of the interrupt. Uh, yeah, so it tells you whether that is a... Um, it tells you whether it's a, a level or a an edge triggered. Uh, I think if it's one, it's a level triggered interrupt. Anyways, so what that means is when an interrupt comes through, let's say an interrupt comes through on 255, an interrupt comes through on hardware or in whatever, and let's say interrupts are disabled by having the interrupt flag clear, the interrupt will come into the IIRR and request that that interrupt happens. So bit 255 of this 256-bit register will be set to 1. Then, once interrupts finally get disabled, uh, it'll end up getting transitioned from the IRR, where it will be cleared, and it will be set correspondingly in the ISR, the interrupt service register. And the ISR is basically what's telling you that that interrupt is being serviced. And then once you send the EOI, the end of interrupt actually clears that servicing bit. And it also potentially causes a bus message to go out to notify things that the uh, interrupt has been handled. But nevertheless, that's kind of what happens. It comes in, it's pending. Once it's active, it goes into the ISR. And then once it's done, the EOI will clear it out of the ISR. Now, APICs are relatively complex uh, interrupt controllers. At least they were in like 95 when they came out. Um, what is EOI? End of interrupt. So you, to do an end of interrupt, you will write to an APIC register with a zero. Uh, since it's, you're writing a zero which, which does nothing, but it basically knocks on, uh, it rings a doorbell to the APIC saying I'm done. So we'll write a zero to a certain APIC register. Hardware will see that that write occurred, and then that will cause the end of interrupt to be uh, triggered. And that will cause that ISR bit to get cleared. So, the APIC allows for all sorts of different priorities. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can program your TPR, your task uh, priority register, which is your CR8 register, which is mapped directly to some bits in an APIC register. So, the APIC register space corresponds to the bottom bits of the CR8 register, which is your uh, task priority register or something like that. Um, and effectively you can have a bunch of different pending interrupts. In theory, you could have two different interrupts pending on every single uh, core, or every single vector for every single core. Um, and what happens is when it goes to select what interrupt to process, it'll actually grab the highest priority bit. And that's a complex equation of your priority uh, register and how you've programmed the pick, but effectively you can designate certain interrupts to be higher priority than others. It's also really weird that if you are in an interrupt handler and you have not EOI'd yet, so you haven't marked that you have finished the interrupt, if a higher priority interrupt does come in, it'll cause an interrupt and you'll get an interrupt inside of your interrupt because the higher priority one will get control. Um, yeah, uh, I think that mentions it here. When the handling of the higher priority interrupt has been completed, the servicing of the interrupted interrupt is resumed. <laughs> and that can pretty much go to an arbitrary depth of the level of bits that you have here and the level of complexity that you can build in your TPR uh, level. You can just CLI, STI in your ISR though. Um, well, you the, the processor does that for you when you enter an interrupt. And uh, yes, if you do that, you won't get a higher priority um, interrupt. But this is for more complex cases where maybe you have an interrupt that comes through that isn't super sensitive and you end up turning interrupts back on again. It'll ignore the EOI, which means you'll get this like stacked interrupt, uh, but you still need to enable interrupts. You need to explicitly allow that, of course. If you, if you don't have those interrupts enabled, um, everything will get masked off. And that's the state we're in. So what we're gonna do is, ideally, we would be able to clear the IRR, uh, the ISR, which is what we currently have pending for a timer interrupt, but we cannot do that. Um, those registers are not writable. So what we're going to do is we're going to read those registers because they are actually readable. And we're gonna make some friendly APIs that allow us to get all 256 bits of the IRR and the ISR, and then we'll be able to display those as bitmaps. And that will allow us to verify that we have truly identified what 
what bug we actually have here. Um, and I'm super excited for that. We're basically going to get true visibility into what interrupts are pending when our kernel exits. And what we're going to do is before we return execution back, we will make sure, we'll assert that there are no pending interrupts and that all of our interrupts have been disabled. So any devices that we enable interrupts on, any uh, timers that we enable interrupts on, we're going to turn all of those off and we're going to make sure that those are disabled. I do think we might be able to, able, we might be able to disable the APIC and then turn it back on. I think that might clear the IRRs. Let's take a look here. Uh, local APIC state after it's been software disabled. Um, let's see. Oh, when you do disable the APIC, the pending interrupts in the IRRs and ISR are held and they require masking or handling by the CPU. Okay, that, that leads us to only one way of solving this problem, which is to turn on interrupts and then dev null the EOI. So we'll basically have to make a dev null interrupt handler for a small amount of time right before we exit our kernel. Really interesting problem. Never had to do that before. Um, actually super excited. So typically my soft reboots uh, historically have not relied on the BIOS. Uh, basically I would pixie boot the first stage and then I have, I'd have a networking driver uh, in my kernel, and I download the seconds, or I re-download the new kernel in the in the functioning kernel with a, its own UDP and uh, TCP or whatever stack that I'm using, and then I'd give that to the bootloader to have it boot that. And I've never had a bulletproof soft reboot mechanism that uses the P, uh, PXE, the Pixie APIs, and that's because of this complexity. It's because of I've never been able to get that in the right state. So to me, this is all new stuff. Uh, what we've been doing for the past two days is a problem that I've never solved. I've only ever worked around. And while we could work around this by writing a network stack, since this is an open source kernel, I want to make sure that it works in more environments. So I want it to work in the environment where it, you maybe have a network card that doesn't work on that machine, um, and it will still work. What exactly is the problem? The problem is we're returning execution back into the uh, into BIOS routines when we have a pending interrupt that we set up, and the BIOS does not handle that interrupt well. So basically, the BIOS gets an interrupt it's not expecting, and it behaves unexpectedly. It either freezes or it crashes or whatever it does. Um, the result that we see is that the Pixie download never completes. We call a Pixie API, and it never comes through. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to print that out right now. So let's close everything down. Um, uh, serial. We'll leave these debug prints in for now. We'll close that file, the bootloader, the range set, uh, kernel panic will want, ACPI, interrupts will want, assembly routines. Oh, I also, um, assembly routines I don't need. I also uh, unblock NMIs, so when we do a soft reboot, I also make sure that I um, unblock NMIs, which is something that I previously wasn't technically doing. Uh, it's impossible for my kernel to boot back up without causing an IRET, uh, because it's going to use those Pixie routines and doing uh, like E820 stuff, and that causes us to use IRETs in our transitions. Nevertheless, it's cleaner for me to kind of explicitly do that. So right here, we unblock uh, the NMIs. Um, because our panic handler, our panic handler in the BSP that calls soft reboot is actually in an NMI that never returns. So this is where the IRET ends for that NMI, and that's where the um, interrupts get re-enabled, the uh, non-maskable interrupts get re-enabled. So that's really important there. So, okay, um, basically... We're going to go into the APIC code, and we're going to add some new registers to our register bank. And these are going to be all the I IRR and ISR registers in the APIC. And let's check out what we got here. Here we go. Here's the table. So here's the 256 bits of the ISR, and here's the uh, 256 bits of the IRR. We're going to make a .IRR function and a .ISR function that will return two 128-bit uh, integers that can be used 
to dump these states. And then we'll be able to pretty print those as binary numbers in Rust, and we'll see a nice bitmap of the states of all of the interrupts that are pending. Um, and we'll use that to provably debug that that is actually what our problem is. And I'm pretty confident that is the case. So let's, uh, let's get in there. So these ISRs start at 100 for every 10. So we're going to say ISR uh, 31 to 0. Yep. So this is at 100. And we're just going to have to do this, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. I think that's all of them, right? Goes to 70 inclusive. OK, so then we have, this is, uh, actually, I'm just going to do, I might do like ISR 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh-oh. Did I just lose internet? Sorry about that. Had a short internet outage. So should be... Yeah, I'm definitely back. Okay. Move my cursor. Yep, I see that. Okay, cool. We are live! Woo! I was out of my control. That was not my. That was not my router. Wasn't my fault. I I couldn't have prevented that. Blame blame the ISP. Anyways, if you missed the last part, we're basically going through and we're gonna write some things that allow us to dump these ISRs and our IRRs. But I think you guys were around for that because I was still connected in my game. Okay, so we're gonna do this. Okay, so the IRR start at 200, and yeah, we're going to go, I guess we can do this then, ISR, um, this is the inner in service register bits 0 to 31, and this is bits 32 to 63, oops. Uh, this is bits 64 to, whoa, what is that number? 32 plus 64, is that 71? No, it's not 71. I, I'm so bad at math. 95, I wasn't even close. Holy, 71, what was I thinking? The fuck, why did I think 72 there? 96 to, uh, 128, that one's easy. 127. And this one is 128 to, you know, I don't know the non-power of two numbers, to be honest. 159, this is 160 to whatever this is. 191, 192 to 223, and this is... 224 to 255. You know, we can actually move those docs here. I think this works. The setup is fine. 0 to 31, 63, 32 to 63, 64 to 95, 96 to 127. This is a comment, so it doesn't matter too much, but I do like my comments to be correct. 192 to 223 and 224 to 255. Okay, sweet. So we got all those. Now we can yoink these. We can unyoink them here. And we can say replace all instances of an OX1 with an OX2. We can replace all instances of an ISR. Oops. ISR with a IRR. And we can replace all instances of in service register with a interrupt request register. There we go. And that's how we that's how we program. 
Okay, so those have all been loaded, and now we will do, we'll implement some routines here. This will be pub fn irr. This will return u128, u128. Uh, returns, and I think low high makes the most sense. Yeah, low high definitely makes the most sense. Returns the 256 bits of uh, interrupt request register state. Tuple is low, 128 bits, high, 128 bits. Okay. There's no 256 bit in Rust. Otherwise, I would use that. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we will read these into IRR. Um, this will be U32 for eight. And if I provably initialize those, can I, can I do that? I wonder if Rust is smart enough to do that. If I initialize them on different lines, but guaranteed, let's let's see if it if Rust allows that. Then here we'll return a tuple of zero zero just for testing, while we first start out. Okay. Okay, so let's see if I do ir zero is five. Oh, il wow. ILR, that's my uh, IL register. Okay, use of a possibly uninitialized. Let's see if I can do this. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I do that, is that provably initialized? No, not enough to rust. Okay, well, we'll zero initialize it. Not a big deal. Okay, and then we're gonna read these. Uh, this is gonna be self.read apic register IRR1. You know, should I zero index these? I think I will. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero, one. Two, three. I typically only zero index uh, kind of in memory things, and this one's kind of technically like in memory, so. I'm okay with doing this. P, P, oh. Let's make sure that works. Should. Oh, self. Uh, takes a self. And that's an unsafe function. We'll just make this unsafe, to be honest. Why, why, P, 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 P. Okay, that's enough. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Of course, it's not an atomic op operation. Uh, and now here. Oh, you know what? I'm going to have to change this, aren't I? This needs to be a U8 for 32. And then this will be. Uh, OXO8, OXO4, copy from slice to LE bytes. And then we got to ref that. So that's going to convert it into bytes. Yeah, unfortunately, that's what we have to kind of do in Rust land, which sucks. But Rust does have pretty bad uh, binary manipulation right now. So. Unfortunate, but hey, whatever. Hey, HL uh, 521, how are you doing? Let's uh, let's go through these. I could potentially make a loop here if I put all the registers in a, uh, yeah, let's do that. Let to load is equal to register I R zero. Uh, yoink, paste, paste, paste. I think we can fit four of these align. Yes, we, we definitely can. Okay, that means I can do YP. These are uh, values to load. Uh, storage for the 256 bits of data. Values to load. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, four, I, I, two load, uh, reg in, two load dot iter dot enumerate, ref the reg. Now we can do an I, R, R, I, I times uh, size of u32 to ii plus one times size of u32 copy from slice ref of reg uh whoops self dot read apic reg to le bytes okay so this will uh read all the registers into IRR. Hey, jump out. How you doing, man? Let's do a. Now here, I'm gonna do U128 from Ellie Bytes of IRR. Dot dot sixteen. Try into unwrap. And then this, paste, there we go. And then this will be a 16 dot dot. Okay, so this will be uh, turn the 32 bytes into two uh, U128s. Okay, expected tuple. Hmm. Ah. There we go. Trying to... We don't have that pulled in and then size of, I think, as well. Okay. We'll pull in use core mem size of use convert uh, core convert try into Okay. Uh, 234 and we gotta call that function. Okay, so I I times size of a U32, then to plus one. Okay. So let's try this code out, make sure it works. Um it's on panic, I guess, is where we're writing this code. So when we go to panic, we will print to the emergency serial ports. Uh, write e serial. This will be the i r r, and then this will be an o sixty four b o sixty four b new line, and then we'll just do a let i r low i r high is equal to apic dot i r r. Is unsafe. And I R R high, I R low. Let this just discarding the result to the right. Just so we have fewer warnings and errors. Let this is equal to that. Okay. Now let's see if this works. Um, unpause that, reset. Okay, that looks like it does work. We're gonna we'll send that off to three. Nice. Pause. Okay. So, huh. It's just that there's a spurious interrupt pending. Kind of surprised. But other than that, there are no other bits there. And then let's see if we can get this to work. Um, so that's for IRR and then ISR. So we'll say S I R I S R G K of the interrupts. What is this? In service registers. 
Ah, register state. Okay. So now we have the ISR. We have the IRR. We'll grab that and we'll print those too. Boom. This. Replace the IRR with ISR. And now we're going to see which ones. Uh, we'll say servicing interrupts and pending interrupts. Still have, okay, those registers, thank you. I did not see that. That would have been quite confusing. Yeah, IR, oops, those are good, these ones. IR, ISRG. I was kind of wondering why I had that message. I thought that was maybe because this code was not used. Um, all right. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, IRR, and then IRR, look, case insensitive, no instances there. I think we got it all then. Okay. So I can reboot this, and I just have it in a, a reset loop right now. Oh, and that's not 16. That's 128, uh, 32, oh, 16 bytes but it's 128 bits when we print it. There are big ones. Okay, so then it isn't, we don't have a pending on spurious, which makes sense. Okay, so here we go. Wow, those bits do not quite fit on the screen, do they? But yeah, we see there's one bit pending here, no bits being serviced. Makes sense, because we're not servicing that timer interrupt right now. For the record, I only watch the stream for the lull, because I have no clue what's going on. Well, feel free to ask questions or anything you want to know about or learn about. Feel free to ask. We're, we're here to just have fun, sit back, relax, chill, have a good time. So I don't know what bit number that is. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to parse it, because I'm, uh, I'm a... I'm good at that. So we're going to do pending interrupts for bits in 0 to 256. Let's IR index is equal to bit mod 256. Uh, we'll just say index. Uh, let's uh, div 256. And this will be, or 128. And bits will be, yeah. I, I, there we go. Now we're, now we're cooking with portals. Mod 128, and if, uh, shit, I kind of wish that was a set of a tuple, an array, a fixed size array of two. Uh, array is low, high, same, this, this for two, makes it easier to programmatically access, tuples are very difficult to programmatically access, so we'll put it there, okay, now this will just have IRR, and then here, if IRR index and one shift bit, uh, is equal to zero, or is not equal to zero, print one, two, three, four. Uh, this is a let under right is equal, oops, equals right to e serial, and I'll print the interrupt vector as a 04x and the ii, which is the interrupt vector. So that's pending interrupts, and then this is servicing interrupts. And I'll oh, we'll say vector that, vector. And we just gotta change this up to use I, uh, IRR replace with ISR, and that's it. 
Okay, apparently not. Probably, probably put some commas in here for uh, parameters. Okay, so this should work. This will be really cool. Hell yeah. Pending interrupts, E0. Servicing interrupts, none. Hey! Hey, it works. You could write uh, zero dot dot equals 255. Yeah, zero dot dot equals 255 is, is relatively slow. Um, I have a bug open for that, but... Yeah, uh, Rust, inclusive range, slow. Um, let me see. Yeah. Wait. Anyways, I have a ticket open. Uh, that's basically uh, related to that. Yeah, range to inclusive code generation, much worse. And I kind of show... Oh, apparently it was fixed and now it's back. But yeah, the code generation. Here's the here's and stuff, uh, which uses a um, this uses an inclusive iterator, and this is the exact same thing with the same range. Um, and this is the code gen. So I try to really be careful about using uh, inclusive. Yeah, look at that, look at that shit compared to this. It's like so much worse. <laughs> yeah. 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 A little bit of a problem, but apparently it was fixed for at at one point. What did they say? Problem if, is fixed on 42 and it is. Oh wait. No, I think that dude just read it wrong. Wait, where is that function? Oh, both of them alias did the same function, I guess. If I do an or equal, they'll be different now. Yeah, okay, so we'll say or stuff. And it looks like it was fixed on 4.2. 4.1, it was fine. 4.0. Yeah, at some point it regressed. Wow. Actually, it seems like it's just a problem in only nightly. Because all of these seem fine. Okay, that one just didn't build. Wow! 1.26 had some really bad code gen. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, yeah. But yeah, for some reason it's broken on nightly. Beta. It's broken on beta too. I wonder if it's some option they have enabled for beta and nightly, which is slightly different. Anyways, yeah, a little busted. Squish that back in. I had big performance differences between stable and nightly. Interesting. I only ever use nightly. I've never run stable. Is that a, a the generated assembly on the right? Yes, that is. That is a uh, um, that is Godbolt, and that's Rust's Godbolt. So I will paste a link for that if you want to play around with it. It's actually really fun. Uh, to play around with that. So I use Godbolt pretty much daily uh, to do random um, tests like that to see uh, on a small level if there's a better way for me to design something. Um, yeah, I think it's really useful for, for developing in, in kind of those environments. But yeah, uh, let me see here. Get my Tibby characters all up after that internet outage but yeah now we can actually see that there is a pending interrupt on e0 which means that the next person who enables interrupts given it's not me and I don't think it is is going to get that interrupt uh, which is probably not good so all right okay Okay, that, 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 tack, tack, tack. Okay. All right. So, now that we see that, that is so nice, man. Being able to see which interrupts are pending. So, what that means is that's why it's not working on real hardware. And 
what I could do to prove that is on real hardware, I could go back to my old ACPS. So what I did in my APIC um, is I actually set the timer, enable timer. I set the counter to five. So this is this is probably triggering like millions of times per second, <laughs> but it's just meant to be as aggressive as possible to really stress that environment. Hope you're a patron for Godbolt. I am not, but I, d I should make a donation. Is there a Patreon? Should I do a Patreon or a donation? Which one's better? I actually really like Matt Godbolt. He, uh, I don't, I, I doubt his name is actually Godbolt, but that's his name on Twitter. Uh, he really seems like a stand-up dude. He, he always seems to just be outreaching with the community and... I don't know. I, I really respect the uh, communication skills. This is actual name? Really? This is actually Godbolt? What a fucking name. <laughs> he has a fantastic talk about how shitty the Godbolt back in is. Oh, man. That is such a cool name. Hey, Advent Cheese. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Um, what was the original state of the APIC timer? I wonder if this whole time it's just been due to having this pending. So I can show you what happens in, on real hardware. And, yeah, let me, let me, let me demonstrate that. I'm going to put the APIC timer. Where the fuck that code is? This five. I'm going to change this into a 10 million. Which is probably like 10 times a second or something. I think APIC timers typically run at like 100 to 500 megahertz. They, they typically run at your front side bus speed. So this is probably dividing by two. Uh, probably running at 50 megahertz or something. So this is happening like 5 times a second. 5 to 50 times a second in that order of magnitude ballpark. <laughs> um, is that bot down? I don't have website or site. Um, so I don't have either of those. Yeah, I don't think the bot's down. Yeah, it's not. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab this code, and I'm going to copy pasta, and I'm going to put it before and after the delay of 5 billion. And then we're going to run this on real hardware, and we'll see if there's a difference between the two. So let's try this here. We might actually be able to see it here. Can we? Yeah. Pending, servicing, none. And then after that delay, pending interrupt, E0. Isn't that cool? So we can see that that interrupt is pending. Obviously, we have interrupts disabled, so it doesn't get uh, fired. So what we're going to need to do is... We're going to need to implement an interrupt table that's kind of like the dev null interrupt table. Um, so when we disable all interrupts, yeah, we'll disable all interrupts, reset the APIC to the state that we want it to be in. Currently, we only enable the timer. So the timer is the only interrupt that we have to actually manage because that's the only, only interrupt we cause. Oh, I think it's bang blog. Um, check out this sick requirement in a recruiter email. Familiar with STM 32F42932 bit ARM platform. Okay, so I know exactly what that recruiting email is. That is when a recruiting person has to do the recruiting uh, and they just like took some random thing from a developer who either didn't care or something from a random document cuz that's probably the that's probably the specific processor that they use in their product obviously if you know how arm32 works you can work with pretty much any arm32 platform uh, of course they differ a little bit like arm has a lot of flexibility on interrupt controllers and stuff but i don't know i feel like i feel like it'd be pretty easy to learn a new one <laughs> um let's see Hell yeah. Uh, 
Do, 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 do. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Lord Dankinton, how are you doing? What do you do for your day job? I, uh, I work at Microsoft and I do security research. Uh, I just try and find bugs in random Microsoft products. Nah, fuck the SDM32. F4 has some fucked up shit. Every ARM processor has fucked up shit. ARM is one of the worst. ARM32 is one of the worst platforms. The only reason ARM32 made it big is because it's so cheap. But it's a fucking terrible platform. The, the bytecode sucks for ARM. Writing the Verilog or like actual hardware description language for ARM sucks. Uh, the fact that they have flags on almost, like, flags and conditionals on every single instruction. The fact that they have arm versus thumb versus thumb two. They have a Giselle mode if you want to support that. The encodings are incredibly bad, but encodings don't matter too much in the hardware. Um, because they're just lines at the end of the day. Um, but basically arm really only specifies very lightly <laughs> the instruction set, which has a bunch of undefined and unimplemented. And then, the system side of things, it's like, fucking bring your own interrupt controller, bring your own timers, bring your own, like, PCI, USB controllers, all this It's just completely in the fucking air. And everyone does it in a proprietary way. You got, like, Raspberry Pi that, like, does, uses Broadcom. Basically, if you see Broadcom on a chip, uh, on any dev board, if you ever see a dev board with a Broadcom chip, run far, far away. Because it means there's really nothing you can do with that chip other than use an existing BIOS and binary blobs. <laughs> it's, just, it's like, never a good sign when you see that. Um, I'll probably joke about that when we, when we get to the dev, but let me look for a Broadcom, a Broadcom Nick manual. Let me see if I can find the spec for a, a Nick. Um... Oh, this is a this is a relatively common one. This one might be easy. What is this? Oh, this isn't this isn't the coding spec. Fuck. Let me find it. Broadcom NDAs as far as the eye can see. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why the Raspberry Pi got so popular. I really don't. It's one of the most locked down devices out there. Um uh, programming spec. Let me see. I know that some of them are public. Most of their network cards are public. Um, I can't remember which fucking Broadcom chip I had. Um, documentation, data sheet. Here we go. This might be it. There we go. Oh, nope. Wow, this doesn't have the programming spec. I know at one point I was writing a, a Broadcom spec, uh, a driver for a Broadcom device. I'd really like to find the, the data sheet, but maybe they've really stopped releasing even, even those. Uh, whatever it was, uh, whatever it was, the Broadcom spec had a 120 bullet point initialization process for the NIC. Not, not to set it up for use, but to initialize it. On Intel NICs, it's like you flip a bit, it's fully reset. And then you set up your like pointers to your like ring buffers and you're good. It was unfucking real And I know exactly what it was. It was a bunch of hardware engineers who's like, eh, we'll do that in one in software. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Growth. Okay. Uh, what compiler are you using? I'm just using the Rust compiler. There's just, there's only one. Well, technically there's, uh, what is it? Uh, the Powers Gang, I think, has uh, a Rust compiler that he's working on. Um, but it's not a safe Rust compiler. It, it's able to interpret Rust and, and build the code, but it can't do the compile times checks and uh, borrow checking enforcements of Rust. So it's only meant for like, it's the C compiler for Rust code effectively. But it cuts down on a lot of the um, overhead and it adds some redundancy to the market, which is okay. 
okay by me. All right. Camel keys are underlined. Underlined for uh, function names. M Rusty. Yeah, I think that's his. Right. I think he did that. Yeah, it's the Pirates Gang did that. Okay. He's also a, he's a he's another big OS ever. Okay, so, yep, we're able to see that there are pending interrupts on vector E0. All right, so that is a good sign, and that means that that's our issue. So we need to, in our interrupts, I think what we're going to do is we're going to make, um, when you init a processor, when you init a processor, are the interrupts cleared? They have to be. Right? Right? You would think? Question mark? Like, in a full reset, sure. Okay, local APIC state after an init. Response by beginning, uh, beginning the initialization of that in the local APIC. Lo state of the APIC following an init reset is the same as after a power up or hardware reset, except the APIC ID and the arbitration ID IDs are not affected. It's also referred to the wait for SIPI state. Um, I would then hazard that that uh, clears the pending interrupts. So when you do a software disable, those are held. Let's see. Oh yeah, here's a power up reset. All of these are zeroed. Okay, so everything's, everything's reset. Okay, so when we init a core, um, that core will get pulled down. So what we want to do is, I think, hmm, how do I want to do this? I can either have a different interrupt table that I, I load a new interrupt table where I can drain these interrupts, or I have them go to their dispatch, but somehow I have their dispatch um, in like a drain mode. And I think I might go with that like drain mode. And the way that I'm gonna probably do that is currently a, uh, this timer interrupt that I have. The timer interrupt does a, um, this does an EOI. And what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a register interrupt with the APIC. And then the APIC will wrap your interrupt handler in its interrupt handler. And then the when you register an interrupt, you'll register it with the APIC, and that will register it with interrupts. And then that will be wrapped by the APIC. It'll be wrapped in something that I'll call EOI. So it will basically it'll dynamically dispatch to your interrupt handler and then call EOI because it's an APIC-based interrupt. Um, or I could have that on the interrupt side of things. Uh, whatever it is, uh, we're going to get rid of that. Although we don't necessarily have access to the APIC because we we alias that. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think I'm going to shatter that lock on the APIC and I'm going to change the semantics of shatter. Um, let's get that onto my clipboard buffer before I fuck it up. Paste. Well, yeah, it's not quite where we want it yet, but we'll put it there just so we don't lose that line. Uh, EOI, okay, so I have EOI as private. Uh, EFI, uh, EOI, make that pub. Okay, now what I'm going to do is... Um, Hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we're going to go into kernel source lock cell or shared lock cell source lib. Um. Uh... This is the uh, uh, trait that allows access to OS level constructs defining 
uh, interrupt state exception state uh, core unique core IDs and um, enter exit lock uh, for interrupt disabling and enabling uh, primitives. Okay. Now, what we're going to have is shattered bool and I guess I need to make this an atomic bool. Yeah. This will, uh, if set to true, this lock is shattered, which will cause all locks to complete without actually locking. Uh, this is used during uh, uh, system critical events like panics and anonymize where certain resources like the APIC will need to be accessed um, and are generally safe to do so without a lock. Um, and, well, actually, where certain system resources like the APIC will need to be accessed, and, uh, it's been, and all other cores have been shut down, making the system single, uh, tasking and, uh, safe to use without locks. It's not necessarily true, because interrupts can happen. But, uh, yeah. The other option is we can special case the APIC and say that the APIC does not need, um, does not need to be locked, which is not necessarily true. There are certain circumstances where, like, maybe setting up a, a timer interrupt is going to be dangerous to do. Well, I might be able to safely expose everything on the APIC. Yeah. Yeah, I might be able to make the APIC always safe to access. I might I might special case the APIC and not have it in a lock then. Um Huh. If I don't have the APIC initialized, well, then I have a huge problem. So, that would basically mean that the APIC is always available. Huh. Yeah, I might do that. Let me let me see what I let me see what I do in my APIC. Basically, any public function, uh, or really anything that I do, has to be basically atomic. This one is fine. You can have two cores doing this at the same time, no problem. You can have two cores doing this at the same time, or you can have an interrupt occur. The APIC is per core, and other cores don't have access to your APIC. So these are exclusive things. So the only thing we need to think about are NMIs, which could cause an interrupt at any point at any stage here. So we have, can an interrupt happen at any point in this function and it's safe? Yes. Um, can an interrupt happen here? Yeah, because we'll either write to the ICR or we won't. <laughs> this, this is a single write MSR or write to memory, which is atomic. Well, technically, oop, nope, technically that's two. Technically, that writes a high part and then latches a low part. If you were to have, if you were to have an interrupt that comes in right between these two, 
slides right in these DMs, you would actually have a problem there. Ah. Oh. And then that means that I either need a lock. Shit. I could special case EOI. Yeah. So like that's not safe without a lock. EOI is safe without a lock. So what I need to do, I think I just need a special case EOI. I think that's what I'm gonna do. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I think that I think that's what we're gonna do. Um, and how do we do boot up? I think we initialize, we initialize interrupts and then we initialize the APIC. So at this stage, the APIC will then be available for use. Uh, we shouldn't have an interrupt firing before. Well, actually, can we go the other way? Do I want to initialize the APIC before interrupts? No. I want interrupts first, then the APIC. Well, unsafe is actually really difficult when it comes to the ordering of these things. Because in safe code, I can move these around and make things invalid. So maybe I should make the entry point unsafe. Now I feel better about myself. Um, and we'll say uh, kernel entry points uh, marked unsafe because a lot of the orderings of the uh, functions inside of here are critical. Technically, you do unsafe on the code that you're calling, but um, I mean, the APIC code actually can panic if it's not set up. If we set up interrupts, yeah, this is this is tough, really tough. Figuring out where to put unsafes in a kernel is actually a, a, a really hard problem. Um, to make things actually adhere to the true safety of the system. Anyways, we're going to have shatter. Return a raw pointer to the internal locked value. Regardless of the lock state, this bypasses the lock. Okay, so then on APIC, we'll have an EOI. This is no longer going to be... Yeah, this is now a static function. And what we're going to do is APIC is equal to... Um, core apic shatter, uh, and then we're going to turn that into a mute deref if let sum apic is equal to apic, then write an apic. So this will uh, get access to the apic uh, without needing the lock. This is safe in all situations as we issue one EOI write MSR, which is atomic with respect to other interrupts. Um, we can't preempt a write MSR. It's, it's just one instruction that's atomic and serializing. So then here, this will be on APIC write self. Have I not got to user space? I'm not going to have a user space. There's no user space in this uh, kernel. Okay, now we're going to do apic EOI. All right, 273. 273, that's on interrupts. Yeah, here. So now this will do uh, with it. APIC EOI. Okay, 272. User space in a research kernel. What is this? Plan 9? <laughs> Use crates. APIC. We don't need that user space stuff where we're going. 
Okay, so now we have EOI, an APIC, and that won't require a lock. Um, uh, it's important this function works without getting any locks as the APIC, and technically we could replace the APIC on core by grabbing the lock and replacing it with a sum value. So there is some unsafe here. Um, I really need like a set once. I probably should initialize that. Yeah, maybe I should look into that, is making set once things. Because right now I'm using a lot of nuns inside of locks that I then transition to a... Um, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna... It's important this function works without getting any locks as the APIC. Uh, uh, well, actually, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, you don't have to EOI NMIs. And the APIC lock will disable interrupts. Thus, it is impossible to have the APIC lock held. Oh, but we're, yeah, we're going to enable interrupts in an NMI. Oh, we're doing some weird shit. Um, <laughs> as the APIC may need to be accessed in an NMI, which we can't control if an APIC lock is held. Uh, the execution flow for a lock list requirement is as such. Um, uh, BSP panics leading to a, um, BSP panics. This leads to a, uh, uh, Draining EOIs by enabling interrupts, uh, which needs APIC, uh, draining pending interrupts, interrupts via draining, uh, wow, wow, pending, pendinging, draining pending interrupts with sending EOIs, which, uh, requires access to the APIC for the EOIs when the panic may have occurred during a section of code with the APIC locked. Okay. So, draining pending interrupts with sending EOIs. Uh, with using EOIs, yeah, sending EOIs, which requires access to the APIC for the EOIs, uh, when the panic may have occurred during a section of code with the APIC locked. Uh-huh, that's true. That's true. It drains into the EOI ocean. We're doing some weird shit, Gamozo 2020. <laughs> yeah, it's only for this APIC, but we basically need a clean path. Well... Fuck. I also need one other lock, don't I? In interrupts to get the handle table. Yeah. I have to be able to get this table. Shit. Shit. Well, you register a handler. Uh, we can make another table of whether or not that handler requires an EOI. All right, we can we can make this work. Um, 
You know, it'd be nice if the Vim help just told you how to write an OS. Just like, oh, uh, yeah, you should do this and uh, send your EOIs here and you need to figure this out and it all works. <laughs> Is it okay if I listen to your stream for hours without understanding 99% of what's going on? Absolutely. We're here to have fun, get excited about programming. Programming is super fun. So we're here to have fun. It, this is an entertainment programming stream. <laughs> I see you're trying to make an OS. <laughs> I feel like in 1995, if, if Clippy saw that you were making an OS, I'm pretty sure you're getting a cease and desist from Microsoft. <laughs> it's like Clippy shows up. It's like, it seems like you're making anything competitive to Microsoft. Here is your uh, pre-formatted two bracket company name, close bracket. I am issuing you a cease and desist from Microsoft. <laughs> oh, the 90s, man. Oh, good old Gates Microsoft. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, when I register an interrupt, I will also register static AOI required. This is for a bully. A, a, this is a atomic bool. 32, 256 equals Atomic bool new false 256. Um, it, uh, if a given interrupt requires an EOI when it is handled, uh, if a given interrupt requires an EOI when it is handled, then the corresponding offset into this uh, table will indicate true. Okay. And then uh, atomic bool use use core sync atomic atomic bool ordering. All right. And if we add an interrupt handler, I'm going to make this unsafe. Why why not? You, you give it an unsafe interrupt dispatch, so like technically the unsafe is on the caller, but we're gonna actually have this take um, needs EOI. It'll be a bool. Needs EOI, and I'll take a bool. And since that takes a bool, we'll now register it. So we put it in the table, we have the locks held and everything. So these two tables get updated under the lock here, but that means that we can actually read them while this lock is held. Um, if for some reason that lock is held. If that lock is held and we're in an interrupt handler, nothing can change in the tables anyways, and we can't dispatch to it, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so this is safe, and we're going to... I want to disable... By the time that you call add handler, you have... Um, oh, you don't enable interrupts on your target until you added a handler. You add handler, then enable interrupts. And then on the other side, you disable interrupts, then remove the handler. So there should never be a circumstance here where these functions do not bookmark the interrupts for your device. And in that case, what we can do is program this dispatch. Now we can say um, EOI required. Uh, you are required for num as u size store. Uh, oh, this doesn't need EOI. We only allow one handler per. That means it'll always go to false. And this will uh, disable um, EOIs for the device, uh, for the interrupt number. And then here, where we install it, we'll do the same thing. 
um, potentially enable EOIs for the interrupt handler, and then this will be needs EOI. And then to make these functions consistent, since the ordering kind of changes, we're going to put this at the end. Needs EOI is a bool. Why are we running so much unsafe code? We have to. It's an operating system. There's no option here. We're required to write unsafe code because we're doing a lot of things here which are interfacing directly with hardware. There's no way to not write unsafe code for a lot of the things that we're doing. Uh, we're keeping our unsafe code to a minimum, which is nice. This kernel has a very low amount of unsafe code, which is really cool. Uh, it makes me happy. I, too, like to reduce the amount of unsafe code as it is critical for having a stable system. Kind of defeats the purpose of Rust to have a lot of unsafe code. All right, this one does need EOIs. And copy, not implemented for atomic bool. Oh, you piece of shit. God damn it, Rust. God damn it, Rust. Ugh. Why do you do this shit? This What's this? Const in array repeat expressions. Do you just enable this feature? Relaxes the rule for repeat expressions, xn, such that x may also be const, strictly speaking, r value promotable, in addition to copy. The result of tn where x is const is itself also const. Yeah. 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 We're just going to enable that feature. Hell yeah, same thing we ran into yesterday. Yeah, exactly. So we're gonna go into uh, kernel source main. We'll enable this feature. Fuck yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure this is not going to change in its functionality. It's pretty straightforward in how that works. I can guarantee you this is gonna get, uh, uh, this will get accepted. Like there, there's no way this isn't going to get accepted. Uh, documentation, civilization, PR. This is definitely going to go through. It pretty much has to. Um. Mm. Let's see. I'm just starting to see if this is broken recently at all, but I don't think so. Um. Blah, blah, blah. It needs to be copy or const expert. Yep. But it doesn't look like there are any bugs. It's really old though. It's not too old. This is pretty common for things to go uh, a while. Um, yeah, this falls under const generics. I bet when const generics lands, we'll probably end up getting this. So. Okay, so that works. Let's uh, let's go. What code did we write yesterday where we did that box? Uh, somewhere we have a slice in a global. This apex. Ah, oh, we did an atomic U8 there too. We're we gonna store it. There we push it. Um, so what we can do is we can do box. Hell yeah. Box new atomic U8 new apex state none as U8 uh, for max cores. Hell yeah. If that's some apex, go through all of these, set them to that here, and then here we're going to do a box. Into raw from valid apex. 
Uh, are we using Vec? Yeah, we still are using Vec. Okay. Use Alec Boxed Box. Whenever you hear Box, I hear Box. box. Too much OSF, not enough rust. Uh, 293. Oh, so this one you can't do. Really? Wait a minute. Why is that even in an atomic pointer? To be honest. There we go. I don't know what reason we didn't do that from the start. Now we're going to have some problems. We're going to have to reformat a bunch of stuff. Did it get partnered? Uh, not yet. Looks like they're transcoding. Yeah, that kind of happens once there's just enough, uh, enough people watching frequently enough. Okay. We're going to load the... So in this case, we, al we always have access to that. Always have access to that. Now Apex. 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 Okay. Apex. Uh, initialize the state of all the known Apex. Set those to offline. Set that our core is online. Fuck yeah! Upgrade. Upgrade. That cuts down on some, uh, some uninitialized stuff. Which is nice. We now have now that global is always uh, correct and stable. Five no longer using atomic pointer. Love to see that. Okay. So then, what were we doing again? So you set up all those cores in the global. Total cores we got. Apex, we got a list of all the Apex that are valid on the system. Then, we were in interrupts, I think. All right. EOI required new. Set that it needs an EOI based on what was uh, mentioned. And then here, we're going to store that we no longer need an EOI because we removed the interrupt handler. Okay, so now where we do EOI, we will do, regardless of the handler, if needs EOI, oops, uh, let me handled is equal to false, handled, handled is true, signal that we are We've handled the interrupt. Uh, if needs EOI, uh, what is this? Fuck. EOI required. Get a uh, load ordering sequentially consistent is equal to true. Then, uh, EOI the APIC if this vector warrants uh, EOIs. If handled, if the interrupt was handled, return out. Okay, so in the case that we can't get access to the handlers, handler will be false, 
We'll go into the or handle handler will be none. We won't handle it. Handled will never get set to true. We'll still EOI the eight pick. Um and then we will now is that gonna be really confusing? Uh if I end up having the let's see. If the handler doesn't execute, I'll still EOI the APIC. And is that going to cause problems for any drivers? Um, well, we can't... This can only happen during an NMI. Or an exception. So if there's an exception, we're crashing. If there's an NMI, we don't have a handler. So, correct. There's no way that you can't get this lock on the interrupt handlers because this disables interrupts, which means you're not in an interrupt. You're in an NMI or an exception, in which case you're panicking or you're returning out uh, or you're halting. So this is NMI. And then if it's an exception, you're, you didn't handle it. Bye-bye. Okay. So that's good. Uh, you are required, and this is number as you size. So look up if... Look up if an EOI is required. If it is, uh, we don't need equals true. If an EOI is required, then we EOI the APIC, then we return out. Okay, perfect. Handled is true. Never read. What? What? Is that Windows by any chance? No, this is uh, Linux. Um, let's see. A better suggestion than Eclipse or NetBeans? Use IntelliJ IDEA. It's the best Java IDE. Ooh, I've never really done Java Dev. I can't say I really like the Java language at all. How is that overwritten? Oh, because of the return. Nice. Fuck yeah. That was a bug. That's why we fix warnings. Okay. Handled is false. Handled is true. Break out. We then will load... If we need an EI, we'll EOI the APIC. We'll return out if it was handled. If it was not handled, ooh, yeah. So what we're gonna do? So that's gonna handle EOIs for us. Um. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a drain mode. Um, I'm going to have some bit that I'll set that'll cause us to go into drain mode. So now we know that we'll have an EOI handler. So every time we'll have EOIs getting fired, there's no locks being held. So what we're going to do is an a ACPI, or actually an APIC. We have all these rights and shit. Uh, no, this is in panic. All these. So we're gonna delete these. Delete these. And then what we're gonna say is, um, when we drop the A pick. When the APIC gets dropped, we will drain. Let me see if I have prints working in this right now. Uh, print. This is technically using an invalid lock. Um, actually, this should deadlock. It does. Yeah. 
So that deadlocks because we prevent using print in those situations. Uh, and we do that via this. So we lock the old serial port. This will give us access to that. Well, it depends. If something's printing, we won't be able to print. Let's see here. Um, I'm actually going to put this delay at the top. So we're in panic. We drain that. We delay for long enough that the other cores will probably no longer be having the print lock. There we go. Yeah, so there we're getting dropping APIC. Uh, it's really kludgy, right? We're just hacking to get debug information right now. We're using the old serial driver even though we replaced it. So this, we're dropping the APIC, and then what I'm going to do is we're going to go through all of the vectors that are enabled. So... Um, yeah, if it booted up with the timer enabled, actually something, I feel like boot code would have to enable a timer. I feel like you have to reinitialize the APIC timer every time you want to use it in a Pixie driver. I don't think you can initialize and assume that you're the exclusive user, the exclusive owner of the timer code. Maybe you're installing a timer hook or using a an existing one potentially. Anyways, um, if you have the timer set up to fire, then I think that's on you and we will put it back in that state. So yeah, we'll go into APIC code here. So, um, and this will say, at this point, the APIC has been restored to the original uh, state's the BIOS gave us execution with. Now we'll drain any interrupts that we handle uh, that may be pending. Okay. So we will do a, uh, we're gonna have to do, this whole thing's unsafe, nice. Okay, for So let's, yeah, IRR is equal to self.IRR. Let ISR is equal to self.ISR. Is it going to be a loop? And then, I guess we're just going to drain anything that we cause, but we don't know what, we don't know what vectors that we have enabled. Well, the, the previous BIOS might have passed us some fucked hardware state with some interrupts enabled, potentially. No, I think, I don't know. I feel like that's undefined behavior to have the BIOS use interrupts that it doesn't turn on and off in routines. I'm sure things will be broken and we'll do that. So, and then we'll do if IR0 is 0 and IR1 is 0 and ISR0 zero is 0 and IR0 is zero, 0. Oops. ISR1 is 0. Uh, break. So this will... Um, uh, if all interrupts are handled, break out. Yeah, I kind of want to disable all the timers in the APIC, but I don't know if I can safely. Anyways, CPU enable interrupts, or disable interrupts. This is uh, unconditionally disable interrupts. And then, here we will uh, unconditionally enable interrupts. CPU enable interrupts.
Okay. Um, so technically this should work. And this will be, here we can print, uh, apic drained of interrupts. This is not technically gonna, gonna work yet because it's gonna cause the timer code to get hit. I think this might work, but it's not correct yet. Apic drained of interrupts! Fuck yeah! Okay, let's see if it actually did anything. Um... Uh, I guess I don't know what state things are in. I was gonna, like, print drained an E0 or whatever, but I can't really do that. So, anyways. Um... Drain any interrupts that we handle that may be pending. The problem is that might infinite loop if there is a pending interrupt on something that we don't handle. I can make an unconditional drain mode that drains anything, but I kind of only want to drain the things that I use in my OS. And I don't necessarily know. Um... Huh. Helps a lot to learn that the root of functional programming is lambda calculus. Some fancy shit, man. Yeah, lots of cool language stuff. Cool language talk. What is what is Elixir? Who who does Elixir? Is that a is that a company open source project open source company funded project? Me, I do it. What what do you use it for? Is it a compiled language? Okay. So, what I want to do is from here. I want to get the um, UI required. I'll make a pub fn pub fn UI required will return a for two. This will returns a bit mask of the um. Returns a bitmask of the interrupts, which are handled with EOIs uh, in the current state. This is racy, as we're going to construct the bitmaps from the list of atomic pools, and thus must be only used in situations where the EOI required table is not changing or uh, the code is not sensitive to the correctness of this output. This is a safe function as it um, as it doesn't do anything dangerous. Uh, it's just some data. okay. So here we're going to go through uh, for let mute ret is equal to zero for two ret for bits in zero to 256, or we'll say ii in 256. Let index is equal to i divided by 256. Let bit is equal to i mod 256. Ret or equals ret index or equals one shift bit. And in this case, it will be a um, EOI required load ordering sequentially consistent as U128 shift bit. So this will be accumulate the EOI required states into two 128 bits representing the, and we'll say two, uh, entire interrupt uh, 
vector space. Okay. Can't do OS dev and, and only pure functions. It's jitted, uh, but not native compile. It's a hosted language, but the runtime is very efficient. Interesting. So it's probably, uh, what does it require for like threads? I'm guessing it requires having threads. And then ret load. Ah, this is ii as u size load. Uh, val is equal to i ui required ii as u size load ordering sequentially consistent. We'll yoink this out. We'll order the value. Shift it over. Hell yeah. Okay, so no one's using that. And then we'll say, if I R R zero and uh, let's require uh, can EOI is equal to interrupts EOI required. And then we'll say crate. Elixir Erlang is the actor model. A lot of little processes, multiple multiplex on threads. Ah, I really don't like that. I don't know. I hate I hate the abuse of threads. I, I recognize that it like allows for some interesting constructs. But man. I just don't. I just think threads are, are so expensive to use. It's just the, the overhead is so high. Okay. You don't use threads directly. Yeah, it abstracts the con. Yeah, but like, yeah, just the the context switching overhead and the IPC between threads is just brutal. I mean, it depends how often you actually interact, uh, like have the threads interact. But the latency from thread to thread is like minimum. Uh, like 80 cycles. So it's basically if you have if you have two threads that are like IPCing each other even over shared memory, it's like it's like 30 to 80 cycles depending on the uh, locality of the cores. They're not OS threads? Oh, I see. Okay. I mean, if it has, like, actual OS threads that it's repurposing, it still has the same issues. As long as it's not spawning and despawning. Uh, if it's spawning and despawning threads, that's a uh, game over. But, um... Yeah. Okay, let me, uh, let me order these together. If... IR0 or ISR0 and can EOI is not equal to zero or, and this is, um, this is, uh, pending handleable is equal to this. And then we'll yoink that, do this. This will be one. This is, are there pending interrupts which we have handlers for, um, which we have EOI handlers registered for? If so, we are the ones responsible for these interrupts and we must drain them in the case of a pending interrupt from a an interrupt caused by the bios and not anything we generate or program uh we will simply leave those pending as the bios should be able to handle its own uh, interrupts. Okay. 
or those two together, or those together. We're only going to do this in this case, so we'll say if pending handleable, or if they're not pending handleable, break. Um, nothing more to handle, break out of the loop. And then this, we'll say uh, uh, as we may have enabled them during the drain process. Hey, Bean Senzu. I'm transitioning from a beginner to intermediate in terms of programming, and I wanted to learn C++ or Rust. If you have the time, could you explain your decision in using Rust over C and C++? So the reason I and a lot of other people use and, and kind of preach for Rust is Rust is a safe language. And when we say a safe language, uh, we mean that there's a, a way that you can write Rust code, uh, actually by default, unless you write literally unsafe. Um, by default, everything in Rust is safe. And that means that all lengths are checked. Everything has an associated length if it's an array, if it's dynamic. Uh, if you acquire a lock and release the lock, Rust handles that locking and unlocking for you to prevent you from ever unlocking something that someone else is using. Uh, same with alloc allocates and freeze. When you allocate something, uh, it gets freed automatically when you no longer can use that thing, which guarantees that you don't free something that you're going to use, which is something that we call a use after free, which is a very common corruption bug that you see in C++ code and C code that has mistakes. Um, now, as a developer, Rust is really nice because when you make a mistake as a developer, it shows up very cleanly. You can't kind of have this weird thing where it's a Heisen bug and it's something that just is kind of broken and it's really hard to reproduce because it's either correct or incorrect in Rust. And if it's incorrect, it'll be detected and it will alert you that you, you wrote something broken. It'll panic. It'll, it'll soft crash. Uh, you'll end up seeing exactly where the bug was rather than some random place down the road that got affected. Um, on the security side of things, uh, those bugs that you write in C and C++ are typically exploitable. And that means that a comp someone, if you're writing a server in C and C++ and you make these mistakes that Rust prevents you from making, your code is likely going to be exploitable, meaning I could send something to your server and get full control of your server, start running my own code on it, steal all your documents, do whatever I want, mine Bitcoin on your machine. Um, so that's why we want to go towards the direction of these safe languages. So it's kind of a, t a, a two for one. It's really important for security. And two, it's really, really important for like getting good developer feedback and, and detecting bugs right when they happen. So those are my two big reasons for Rust. It's also, I would say, a faster to write in language since it has higher level constructs like iterators, dictionaries, and all these things compared to C. Pretty similar to modern C++ in speed of writability. I think the code, the whole trait system, generally is uh, more readable compared to the uh, style of code in C. Um, but yeah. Putting all those factors together, that's why I write Rust. Uh, there is no, there is no C or C++ developer in the world, ever or will ever exist, who is capable of writing C and C++ code without security bugs. So, I would say that humans should not be writing any unsafe languages. So, I really don't think anyone should be doing C or C++ anymore. Obviously, there's legacy code, and people are still working in old code bases, and they're forced to do that. There are a lot of people who are too scared of new languages. We can't retrain our whole workforce to learn new languages. But I would say, if the world could have the like correct move, we would just, from this point on, never write any more C or C++. Because we can't do it. We can't. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my mini rant. Okay, so if IRR or ISR and can EOI is not equal to zero, or IR is one, ISR is one, and EOI, if that's not equal to zero, then there's nothing pending handleable. And then at this stage, I will say uh, print 
current pending handleable new line 0128B, 0128B. Put these on their own new lines because we know that they overflow the lines. And then here we'll do pending. Um, I actually kind of want this vector. Well, uh, what I can do, I'm going to do this. Let mute handled something is false. Handled something is true. Print handled interrupts this handled something. It's just for debugging, but I just want to see if it's actually doing something. Um, we made it. Oh, uh, print done draining. Okay, let's get to there. Handled interrupts, false. Huh. Huh. Really? I are I are zero, I are one, I S R I S R No more C or C plus <laughs> plus And I don't care what language it is. I don't care if it's fucking Python. Uh, okay, we got one bit here. What's that bit? Oh, it should be one followed by zero. But that is the timer bit. And then HDL handle. This will be a uh, can EOI one can EOI. And this means that the can EOI bits are not set, which is surprising. Yeah, so that, oh, whoa. Can EOI one zero, what's going on here? Go through, set that bit. I want to return low high, and that's what I'm doing. Oh, whoa! There we go. See, that's why we that's why we write these prints and don't assume that it's working. Okay, so we're getting a lot of spew because we have we have an interrupt pending, we have an ISR pending, and then we have something that is marked that we can handle at. So this is saying that we have a, uh, we've got an IRR, we've got an ISR, so we have one that is requested, we have one that's being serviced, and we have one that is handleable. And we're basically waiting for that to get cleared, and we're never getting it cleared because, I guess, we need to drain before reprogramming the APIC. So at this point, we want to drain everything in the APIC state that we initialized. And then down here, now we'll restore the APIC. That'll re-enable a timer, potentially. If the old, if the old state had a timer enabled, then uh, there you go. Have, enjoy your new timer. Um, we'll disable the timer first. Uh... Disable the timer. Timer. Disable the APIC timer. And then here. Okay, let's see. Nice! Nice! Oh, wait. Is this getting stuck eventually? Weird. Save me, I'm being forced to write Objective C. No!
No, don't do it. Okay, why is that getting stuck? Why is that getting stuck? We forcibly enable interrupts. Oh, because we didn't handle it. Wait. We didn't, yeah, we didn't handle it. Do we unregister a handler? No. Oh, because we don't have access to the handler. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Um, this was the next stage of code that I had to write. Uh, this is going to be um, static draining EOIs, atomic bool, atomic bool, new, false. Uh, if set to true, the EOI will be, I guess, EOI required. No, we always EOI. Oh, but we're not returning. If we couldn't get the interrupt handler, if we couldn't get access to the interrupt handler, and we had an EOI required, uh, I'm going to say this. If not handled, CPU halt. We're going to see if that gets triggered. Because I suspect it might. What the fuck? Is this stuff you make while streaming similar to your work? Yeah, it's pretty similar. There's a lot of overlap in the in the work I do, and uh, a lot of overlap. Um, let's see. Why is that not getting handled? And we have an IR and an ISR. We disable the timer. If we don't break out of the loop, we're enabling interrupts. Hmm. Hmm. Is it because it's calling the handler? What does our interrupt handler do? Attempt soft reboot. Is that panicking? Is this just recursive? No, I don't think so. It works for the first couple, as I would expect, which is where it's kind of strange to me. And then it and then it starts going on our rant. Weird. Uh, well, anyways, let's write this, because this is required for it to be correct. Draining EOIs. If set to true, the um, uh, if set to true, EOIs will be handled and the uh, where uh, EOI required is set and no handler will be invoked. And we're gonna make that pub temporarily. Um, EOI required. Okay. Here we'll say if Draining EOIs, load, ordering, sequentially consistent, is true, uh, is false. Yeah. If, if we're not draining EOIs, then we'll attempt to call the dispatch. 
Uh, only dispatch if we're not in EOI draining mode. Okay, at this point, we'll say uh, let draining EOIs is equal to this state. Latch it once. Whoa. Let draining EOIs is equal to EOIs is equal to paste. If we're not draining EOIs, and then here, if we're draining EOIs, um, if we're handling, if we're only handling EOIs, return out uh, as we have handled what was requested. And there's handled. Oh. Uh, track if we handled the interrupt. Oh, here we can just do this. Handled is true. Uh, we handled the interrupt. Then we can get rid of this. If the interrupt was handled. Okay. Um, as we're just here to train UIs. Well, that's going to return out. No, I do need this. It is slightly different. Okay, track if we handle the interrupt. Then here, if EOI is required and we're draining EOIs, so if that is required, we EOI. If we're only draining EOIs, then we return out from the interrupt handler and we're done. Otherwise, we continue on, in which case, if it's handled by an interrupt handler, then we will return out. Otherwise, we will uh, panic saying unhandled interrupt. Okay, so that's good. Now what I need to do is we have to set this. Um, and we have to set this in the panic handler. No, drop. We're doing all this in drop in the APIC. Okay. So now we're going to uh, core or crates. Yeah, I think Go would probably be a better language if you're doing uh, higher level stuff. I, I Rust is a pretty low level language, so you'll be around forever. Learning it will. Uh, Learning and playing with it will make you a better programmer since it forces you to be aware of the hardware you're running on, how careful you have to be, you'll appreciate Rust more. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Like learning Rust, uh, learning uh, C is a good place to start, I think. Yeah, learn C then learn Rust. I, I kind of agree with that. Um, from my limited time looking around, I'd rather be closer to bare metal and higher up in the stack. I will alert you <laughs> right away Writing C and C++ code has many fewer jobs than, like, JavaScript, Java. I guess C++ has a decent amount, but, like, raw C and, like, systems-level development is very limited uh, if you're looking for, like, work. Um, if you're really good at it, you can, you can pretty easily find work, uh, but starting off, it's pretty difficult to get into low-level development. Um, there are very few companies that are actually making low-level code, uh, even people making new IoT devices are literally just porting Android uh, to their device. They're not really writing any code. Uh, they're just like taking boilerplate from Broadcom from their NDA and gluing it into their Android source code tree and basically writing make files and then clicking build. <laughs> like... Most of the job offers for Rust today are crypto bullshit or AI. Yeah, that's pretty fair. Uh, Rust is a, a glam, glamorous language. Um, it's a language that's kind of on the hype train. And hype trains for programming are typically run by programmers. And programmers are typically, uh, sorry to offend any of you here who are programmers, uh, typically shitty programmers with no interest in programming. And all they want to do is make as much money as possible, right? So they're, they're basically the gold rush equivalent. So they're looking for whatever's the hottest fucking thing they can put on their resume that's going to be really hip, 
that companies that are not competent enough to have recruiters that are capable capable of sifting through the bullshit will see like, whoa, this dude does crypto blockchain? Wow, this guy must be really good. When it turns out that like, no, they're not at all. I'm not saying you can't, I'm not saying you can't be a good programmer and be into like blockchain. I, but I will say that that Venn diagram of good programmers and programmy blockchain people is a very small sliver. <laughs> What's a programmer? You've never heard that programmer term, Napalm? <laughs> programmer is typically like the Silicon Valley, go to a startup, drink beers with your bros. It, it's like, it, it's kind of like, I, I mean, it, it's a stereotype, right? It's not actually a real fucking thing, right? But it's, it's, it, it's effectively like, society expects programmers to be nerdy, geeky, into math, into learning, understanding, you know, greasy. And then you, there's this kind of new wave of people, especially in like startup East Silicon Valley, that's like, people kind of interested for the money, kind of, kind of just going along with the flow, not really breaking any trends. They're just kind of there to go along with it. Or it's the biggest hype, riding whatever bubbles there, typically not actually interested in the results or what they actually do, whether the, their code actually works. It's like, if you can write shitty code for two years and sell it for $5 million, it's much better than writing good code for two years and selling it for nothing or a couple hundred K, right? That's kind of the common thing. <laughs> the chat of CS. It's yeah, it's kind of the chat of CS. I don't know. It, it's it's definitely a stereotype, but I would I would bucket most programmers as people who are um, more interested in the in discussing what they program in terms of like the the business that they're going to make than the the underlying code. <laughs> Have you ever had a programmer phase in my career? I have not. <laughs> Sounds like you're talking about someone we both know. I don't know about that. I don't I don't know too many people I'd consider programmers. It's it's really hard to describe a programmer, but I would say it's typically a, a non-passionate about the actual tech and more passionate about the the business side. It's it's the MBA it's the person who would have had a business degree 25 years ago because that's what they're interested in, but instead they get a CS degree because they know they can make more money as a business person wearing a hoodie uh, than as an actual business person. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's a good description. I recognize that these stereotypes are offensive. Uh, it's hard to actually categorize that, but I also think there are people who are like, I don't, I don't know, just, just look at like Stack Overflow on Rust and it's like people who are whoring out for the language who have no understandings of like the capabilities of the language. They're like, yeah, everyone should be using Rust. It's such a great language and you can use it for systems dev. And it's really good for system devs because it they're they're adding async and it's like, dude, do you do you know what you're trying to sell? <laughs> like, just admit that you like it because it's a cool new hip language, and that's fine. And it's got some cool concepts for like normal application development. But to be honest, the language shouldn't exist. Like, I am so happy the language exists, but at the end of the day, like. Something like Go is just kind of better for the average developer in almost every circumstance. It's faster to write code in. The runtime is, is basically the same. It's negligibly different in performance. No one's writing it in low-level stuff. There's a better ecosystem for it. It's a, it's a high-level language that's harder to fuck things up in. Uh, threads and async and those sorts of things just kind of work a little bit better. Maybe people really do like the trait model of Rust, but I, I just can't, 
imagine why anyone not writing systems level code would want to use Rust over Go. Or even like Python, OCaml, whatever. How satisfied are you with uh, Rust compile times? I've had no problems at all. I've never really had a project that's over five seconds of build time. <clears throat> Key point here is our programmers are Googlers. They're not researchers. They're typically fairly young, fresh out of school, probably learn Java, maybe learn C or C++, probably learn Python. They're not capable of understanding a brilliant language, uh, but we want to use them to build good software. So the language that we give them has to be easy for them to understand uh, and easy to adopt. Rob Pike. Oh, interesting. Because high level languages are all pretty garbage. I would say that the higher level the language gets, the higher the level the the higher level the the higher the level the language gets, the more constrained you are to the mindset of the language team. Right? In C and C++, you can kind of do whatever you want. In other languages, you're kind of forced to use explicit paradigms. I will say to some extent, to some extent, it's probably good to have people pushed a little bit into normalization. I do like that about Rust. I do like that Rust requires um, you to... Like, I like that it gives compiler warnings on stylization issues. Um, so, Rust is popular because it has a crab as a mascot. I mean, it is a pretty good mascot. So what are we going to do? We're going to go to crate uh, interrupts. I think it's in my clipboard. Yes, it is. Dot store true ordering sequentially consistent. All right, let's see if this fixes the issue that we're having. Um, and we're just going to do this for now. Um, I'm hoping this fixes it. If it doesn't... Fuck! What is... Let's see the start of that print if we can. Yeah, I'm going to stop it when we see that print start. I bet I bet we're panicking after Yeah, maybe we're panicking after we um we do this drain. Here we go. I keep Okay, I think I clicked fast enough. Nice. Uh, all course online. Okay. IRR, ISR, HD. Okay. Huh. So this means... Basically... What the hell? That means the interrupt is disabled in some other way. Oh, because it's ISR. What? Whoa, what? Disable the APIC timer. Um, have you seen Go for OS? I did look into that early on. I don't think Go is a good language for an OS at all. But... I mean, I don't know. It kind of works out. Like, you can make it work, but I think it requires more making it work than I think uh, should be required in a language. I don't know. I'm reading through this code. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing roughly what this code looks like. Yeah, it looks pretty gross, to be honest. Dude, where are the comments? I'm not saying Go can't be a, can't can't be written in a better way than this, but I don't like the import stuff. One thing I don't like about Go is the whole Go path. Fuck that. 
Why, why is it so restrictive of where I put my projects? Just build the thing in the folder. Come on. They don't use GoPath anymore? Well, thank fucking God. How, how was that ever a thing? Why? Why was that ever a good idea? Who, who did that and was like, yeah, this is pretty nice. Let's, let's force the shape of a project. It's the same shit with, with Java, where you have to use the, like, reverse notation of a file name, or a, a domain. Like, fuck you! Just let me organize my project. I don't want to have eight nested folders for every single boilerplate factory factory in my project. I mean, honestly, fuck any language that encourages people to make a thousand ten line of code uh, files that are like 10 scopes deep. They're like pub class, scope, 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 function, scope, scope, static, scope, 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 return, close all the scopes, and that's the file. And then you have to do that 50 million times in a bunch of different directories. God, I fucking hate that mentality, man. I just don't. Ah! Oh. Ah, oh, that language is so bad! Caveat, I will caveat my complaints with Java of the language does go back and have backwards compatibility to a, to a decade where we are still learning how to write, write languages. So I'll give them a pass on that, but I will say that some of the decisions in there are clearly made by executives sitting around a fucking table than actual programmers who have any desire of any sort of sanity. Ugh. Ugh. What's happening? We're ranting about Java. We're actually trying to debug something, but we're, we're mainly ranting about Java at this stage. Fuck, why is that getting stuck? Okay, and then... Okay. Why would this ever happen? Uh, uh, we disabled the timer. Okay. So in this stage, blah, 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 blah. We have an IRR. I mean, quite frankly, I don't know how there's an ISR. I, how is it in the handler? Unless we are panicking inside of the handler. But that should be fine. Because we can... If the bit is set in an ISR, I think we have to just EOI. I think that's what we have to do. I think... I think this logic, and I, I don't like it because I don't understand it, and I think it's a workaround. But I think if there's an ISR, I just have to EOI it. And that could happen, in theory, if the exit happens, if we do the soft reboot inside of a handler. If, if we have an interrupt handler that panics, then it's going to be an ISR for the request, the reboot request. But I don't think that's the case right now. Let me um, let me get rid of this. Oh, I panic. Okay. So I panic here. That panic happens. Oh, it doesn't. Wait. No, we're in that we're in the panic. Handle interrupts true. Done draining. I'm curious if it has something to do with my prints themselves. I'm a little bit spooked. But let's see. Uh the the way this would look is uh this would get stuck. Not stuck. Oh, is that? 
Triple fold. No, that's the delay. It's not getting stuck. I think the issue is I'm getting... I think the issue is those prints. Yeah, because I can get a... I can get an interrupt when I have that print lock. No, well, the print will disable the interrupts. I'm going to re-enable them. Um, ooh! I think this code is correct. I think the prints are causing the interrupts to get disabled. So the interrupts are enabled for such a short period of time that the interrupt handler doesn't get called? What? I'm going to do this. I'm going to enable interrupts, and I'm going to delay. I'm going to make sure there's some time for the interrupt to get handled before the prints will go and turn them off, because the prints will grab locks, which will cause those to get turned off. Okay, it still gets stuck. Um, print, print will grab locks, print will disable the interrupts while a print happens. Yeah, there shouldn't, there shouldn't really be a race here, in my, in my humble opinion. Enable interrupts, then we loop, grab the IS, IRR and the ISR. Quite frankly, I should never have the ISR hit, I think. Like, that's my interpretation. The only way we get ISR is if we're in the interrupt itself when we get into this, when we drop, how would that ever happen? That happened if we panic, but if we panic, hmm. All online. Then we IRR. <sighs> Let's see. Colang Bean Counter Factory. I haven't read too much. Oh, thank you so much, Meta Construct. Hell yeah, thanks for the three months. Um, I haven't read too much Go Code, but a lot of the Go Code I have looked at is not, not very readable. And I don't know if that's just because the people who are attracted to Go maybe aren't, a, aren't as invested into their code quality. Um, or I don't know if the language is forcing them into those. IRR, ISR. This is saying that we're currently servicing an E0. Am I... Disable interrupts. I disable the timer. That's what I'm so confused about. Have you read parts of Go's standard code? I have not. Is that better? How? I think it is something to do with the prints. And I'm not supposed to be printing here. Just a FYI. But I'm trying to think through how the prints are wrong. I recognize that the prints are wrong. I don't know if they're just adding enough delay. 
Let me add a simulated delay. After the prints. I'm going to see if that causes it to break on the first try. Because right now we see it succeeding a couple times and then failing. Um... Um, what? We made it all course online. Oh no, I myself died. Go code is generally quite pleasant to read in most cases. Okay. Um, that's so strange. Where's my panic code? Why am I not printing the panic here? Oh, I'm forcibly panicking right here. Interrupts are disabled. I delay. Is it that the timer does not immediately get disabled? Let's try this. We're going to delay after disabling the timer. I'm curious. A timer can be pending. And we disable that timer. Let's see what we can get here. Does the APIC run uh, a sort of cleanup code every so often? Uh, in this case, oh, did that fix it, actually? Um, does the APIC run a sort of cleanup routine every so often, uh, right when things happen? So this is when we're tearing down the whole system. Okay, this seems to work. What the fuck? If I get rid of this delay, it doesn't work. Right? One, two, after a couple prints, it'll get stuck. Okay. What if I add a very small delay? Like, it just, a so small, wouldn't really make sense that that would be related to that. Let's try this. Okay. So at some point we're hitting ISR. I just don't understand how. Oh, um, hmm. Yeah, so basically ISR says that there is currently we are currently working on that interrupt, which is not true. But let's do this. We're going to print in interrupt this core in interrupt. We're going to see if we're in an interrupt. We shouldn't be, but maybe we are. The delay is just for testing in this case. Um, I'm trying to find the condition that I can check for. I, I don't want to, I don't want to be able to, I, I don't want to rely on any sleeps and I don't in this entire kernel because sleeps are typically a sign. Okay. In, interrupt false. Okay. I'm going to print that when we do this. Somehow we're ending up in an interrupt, I think. No, inter in interrupt is false. What? 
See you around, Alex. Thanks for stopping by. Um. Okay, that's really weird. That's saying that we're currently servicing an interrupt. And we're not. But it works the first couple times. I think that interrupt is somehow... I don't think disabling that timer is, is happening instantly. One, two, three. That one starts out with ISR. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab all these. I don't care about that. Grab these. I'm gonna put this in the init code of the APIC when we first launch the APIC. And this will tell me the state of interrupts when the APIC launches. Here. Um, this is, you know, maybe it's this shit now. I no longer want an EOI, except from in that one spot, and I think that is true. I think I only EOI now in one spot in this entire code base. Cool. Um, that could have been it, potentially, but this is now going to print uh, 546 as self new apic g this is going to print the state of the apic upon the boot so when we boot up this is going to print these the initial states uh and we'll say initial or asdf so those are the initial states of the apic and then when we get to this Let's see. All right, let's see what we got here. I'm curious if when we reboot, when we reset, we eventually end up in a state. So there's the initial states. Oh, wee oui, wee. Oui. ISR is one. That's on core zero. Ah, why is that set? That's our, that's our vector. That's our vector. That's what's so weird about it to me. Reset. Okay, so this was the first reset, and this ISR was zero. This IRR was one. We drained it down, so IRR, so we booted the system. Everything's zero, as I would expect. This is a, this is a full reset at this stage. So we have a full reset. Everything's zero on all the cores. That's exactly what I would expect. Everything has been handled. Um, nothing is pending. Everything has been hand. Uh, nothing is currently running. Then we get down to here, where we have a pending interrupt, which is what we want. We expect that. We then we have nothing serviced. We loop. We still have that. Oh, this is the final loop iteration. Everything. There's nothing pending. Nothing being serviced. We still handle that if it comes through. At this stage, we say we have handled all of the interrupts. We've drained all of those with EOIs. At this point, we then go and reboot. We, we soft reboot, and we have ISR1. When we come online, ISR is one for that. How? The only way that can happen, the only way that can happen is if that timer 
sends another interrupt while it's disabled. And that means that the disablement of the timer is not atomic. And that is what we're going to check now. All right, check this out. We're going to go here. We drained everything. We disabled the timer. We disabled the timer. We re-enabled the timer here. Maybe that's what's biting us, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to say after. So this is after the draining. So once the draining is complete, I'm going to print all these. And I'm going to do a CPU delay long enough for an interrupt to come in from the APIC. So that's going to wait for potentially a new timer, because we disabled the timer. We drain all the EOIs, and then here, we're going to see the state. And if this doesn't have a bit set, then the issue is that this is somehow re-enabling the timer. Uh, yeah, that might be putting it in one-shot mode. Maybe I don't want to reprogram the timer. Maybe that's my issue. Why would it be E0 vector, though? That's what's confusing to me, is we use E0. Okay, so we're going to reset. That's where the reset is. Okay, stuck. Scroll. Still highlighted. Okay, so this is the first, first boot. Zero, zero, zero on all the cores. We come through. We have an IR pending, which is expected. We wait for it to clear. Aha! Done training, and we have an IRR pending. Okay. That means... That means that the timer is not actually disabled. What the fuck? We're, we're getting an interrupt. We disable the timer. According to the spec, I'm pretty sure... We drain the EOIs, and then we still, after enough of a delay, we still get one. And that means that one might be in flight. But I would expect, I need an atomic operation to disable more from getting generated. I could add a delay, but I really don't want to. Uh, let's take a look at the APIC timer. That's the divide counter register. After each is zero, an interrupt is generated, and the timer remains at its zero value until reprogrammed. Okay. In periodic mode, the current count register is automatically reloaded from the initial count register when the count reaches zero. Blah, blah, blah. A write of zero to the initial count register effectively stops the local APIC timer in both one-shot and periodic mode. I don't like this word. I don't like this uses, use of effectively. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> you piece of shit. God damn it. Ah! Are you fucking kidding me? God damn it. How, how do I stop that? Do I intentionally put it into one shot mode? What happens is it goes till it reaches zero, generates the interrupt, and stops counting. Yeah. You know what's next? Control F effectively. Oh, I'm sure it's a lot of those. A right of zero effectively stops it. But we like print. We like fuck off for a long time. What if. Do you think I should pull that? Do you think I should pull uh, the initial count? While self.write apic register. 
initial count is not zero. Fuck that. Yeah, we'll do this while wow, that's not zero. And the current count, we'll add that register too. Because it generates an interrupt when the current count is set. Uh... Three ninety, APIC uh, a current count register for APIC timer. So we got a three ninety uh, initial count. <sighs> okay, disable it. While the initial count is not zero, I'm gonna try that one first and see if this one has the same issue. Uh, well it's. Uh, read APIC. While the initial count is non-zero. So that'll make sure that it's actually reflected as zero, right? <laughs> God damn it. I think that was close to the first one. Oh! I think we did it, guys! Oh, fuck. I don't have the first one. Yeah, um, done draining. After after the drain, we have a one. Oh, that's on a different vector. No, it's the same vector. It's just we have more more letters here. Okay. Um, what the fuck? Okay, yeah, we'll add the current count one. I might have to add a delay. There's probably a latency before it counts down and the interrupt is actually generated. And there's like probably nothing I can do about that. Yeah, this doesn't work either. And we know it after the first one. Yeah, the after. God damn it. I'm going to add a halt in here uh, down at this stage. I'm going to say if IR1 or is not equal to 0 or IR0 is not equal to 0, CPU halt. Okay. That's just for debugging. Checking, technically, I should check ISRs too. But this one will halt when it hits that condition. There we go. It halted. And it halted. Yep. It halted because it saw this condition. Cool. So this now we don't have to scroll up the screen. So this uh, kind of helps. Um, yeah, we're getting... That's not disabling the timer. What the fuck? Effectively stops it in both one shot and periodic. I'm calling bullshit. I'm calling bullshit. Effectively stops at some point in the future. But we print, we print. These prints take so much time. These prints are probably like tens of thousands of cycles and somehow it's still not disabled how the fuck do you disable the apic timer what on earth why? Do you think this repro's on hardware? Let's try it. Let's try it on real hardware. I think the APIC timer is, um, 
I think the eight pick timer is actually handled by by hardware. Uh, you can virtualize, I think, the timer on the APIC. I think that's one of the parts that you can virtualize. Let's take a look here. Uh, okay, let's see what we can get virtualized. Oh. APIC timers can't get virtualized. Uh, timer. That's 31, yeah, no time, there's no reference of a timer in here. Holy shit, I bet this won't re repro on hardware. We might, we might have a VM detection uh, technique here. <laughs> fucking serious? KVM? KVM question mark? Oh, that's Phyland. It doesn't reproduce on hardware! Oh! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> we did it! We did it! We wrote the first OS that works on hardware but not in a VM. <laughs> it's almost every time it's the other way around. <laughs> oh my God, that's so cool. And yeah, we do have an IRR and we do, we do clean it. We do drain it. KVM, why? <laughs> <Ree>! <laughs> I will say, I will say with, with, with a, a big smile on my face, that I feel like this is a, a compliment to my persistence in debugging problems. <laughs> when this is the sort of shit that I find, I feel like that's maybe why I'm a good security researcher, not because I actually know how to find bugs, but because I just don't give up on debugging. When something doesn't seem right, I don't just band-aid it and like put the delay in there and it's like, okay, that fixes it. I try to figure out root cause, what the issue is. And in this case, it's KVM will deliver a timer interrupt after the timer's been disabled. Do you get that from me? Probably, <laughs> I got a lot of shit from you. All right, we're gonna relax these. We're gonna get rid of this shit. Uh, we're not using current count anymore, so we'll get rid of that. KVM, you bitch! <laughs> we built that. Uh, that's now deployed out to here. Let's try it on the Xeon Phi. Let's get that Phi up and running. So the Phi... Also, one thing to note is that neither of these machines were able to soft reboot prior to this drain. Before I wrote this draining code, these couldn't reboot. So we also, just coincidentally during debugging, found that these are actually able to soft reboot, which shows that we've also fixed the other issue. <clears throat> According to the source I found, let me, uh, let's pull this up. Um, there's an infinite time before interrupt. So this is the timer driver. Um, infinite time. What, what line are you referencing? Infinite number of ticks. Yeah, look at this. Zero disables timer. So, in a tickless kernel, if ticks is not equal to k forever, then it programs it. Otherwise, it sets it to zero to disable it. 
So if it is K forever, in this case, that's a special meaning. That's, that's an OS level, uh, they made a meaning for K forever to be negative one. And if you specify K forever to their API, then they will program it with a zero to disable the timer. God damn, man. It's hard to say if this is working or not. I think it is working. I think it's just printing a lot. Um, there we go. Yeah, drained. Boom, done. Okay, so this is working. It's just printing a lot, so it looks like it's not. Um, we don't care about the ASTIF ones. The ASTIF ones are printed every single um, every single boot. So this will reduce some of the spew. This now only shows during the drop handler. Uh, we can get rid of these new prints. New two kernel source main. I was trying to debug so much stuff here. Core online. We'll get rid of that to quiet these. Okay. We've reduced the spew quite a bit. Uh, and then, then bootloader. Bootloader source main. Uh, serial write. Uh, right. Uh, that was a test. Gone. Downloading kernel. We don't need that. Uh, actually, we'll keep that one. We'll keep downloading kernel. And then kernel downloaded. Uh, complete. And then SP bootloader source pixie. Delete. Delete. Okay. Uh, cargo run. Okay, so this is running uh, on the five. We don't have that free mem thing. Okay, done draining. Ah, fuck, we do have that free mem. Oh yeah, that's in the bootloader. Um, the bootloader doesn't get soft reboot, only the kernel does. So I'm hard rebooting both of these machines so they get the, the newest bootloader. Let's see, how much do we change? Um, zero index core ID. Uh, I made check stack, added global assembly. Uh, the interrupt state stuff. We store that, we change that. Added some prints. Got the address of the trampoline table, good. Enter 64, panic now. Uh, scopes the serial port, so we'll drop the lock on a panic. Um, pixie guard, disable interrupts. I changed how I did the, the soft reboot code. Okay, I don't think I have any debug code in there anymore. So, we got these booted up. It'll take a second. And then, yeah, let's get this going. Reset here. Yeah, so this is the new... Yeah, this is the new one. It prints a lot less. Bootler starting, downloading kernel. Kernel download complete. Kernel execution started in BSP. I don't need that print. That one is in the kernel, so that one we don't, we can uh, soft reboot that one out. Um. Okay. Draining. Okay. Sweet. So this is on real hardware, and we're not getting stuck. Otherwise, we'd hit that halt. We're draining the interrupts. Done draining. What the fuck? How do we fix this for KVM? It is cool to know that this does now work. We have, we have confirmed that we have fixed our soft reboot issue, which was the whole point of this stream, is to fix that issue. And we see that we're now able to go back every time. So fucking cool, man. Really happy with that. And then on the Xeon Phi, it's the same thing. Uh, it should be working on the Xeon Phi, let's see. K. 
Commit and note the bug in KVM. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you get the KVM bug report? I did see it in chat, but I never clicked on it. Do you, do you have the link again? I'm sorry about that, man. Get commit AM. Uh, broken uh, get status. Wow. Get add kernel source. Get branch. What am I on right now? I'm on master. Uh... Get what do I do? Uh, get checkout dash b to make a branch, or do I have to commit these first? I I cannot lose this code. I cannot lose this code. I might just commit it here and be fine with it, cause we're about to patch this shit out. I'm I'm fine committing this in master. Um. Oh. Yeah. Get commit am. Um. This pock triggers. A KVM bug where the APIC timer gets disabled. We drain the pending interrupts for it, and we still get a timer interrupt. Uh, it seems KVM... Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. Free commit message. Get push. Uh, get status. Get push. Technically, I shouldn't be pushing this in this broken state because it's mainly for debugging, but whatever. Uh, history C... We're about to clean up this code anyways and repush. Um, uh, okay, we got a kernel, we got a patch bug here. Fix pending interrupt in IRR blocked by software disable lay pick. Uh, 2019, July 2nd. Fix pending interrupt in IRR blocked by software disable lay pick. So, this is, this is different. The way that I read this is that when you software disable the APIC, we're not software disabling the APIC, um, but let's see if this is maybe somewhat related. If the APIC is not enabled, and then this is if the KVM APIC hardware enabled. Wow. Yeah, that literally, I'm guessing APIC enabled is probably for the host. But, okay, let's read the... Done by clearing the SPIV, APIC enabled bit in the APIC SPIV. Yes, and that's how you that's how you software disable the APIC, which we're not doing. When the CPU comes back online, the startup code triggers occasionally not warning this. Um timer vector whose IRR bit is set and stays set. APIC V enabled. Yeah, so this is with uh, the APIC virtualization disabled. And in our case, I bet we're using the APIC virtualization. I would suspect we are. How would I check that? Um, uh, check. But yeah, we do not have um, Linux something. Surely there's got to be a way. Check. Epic V. Ah, there we go. All right, guys, taking bets, taking bets. Place your bets now. Will it say true or will it say false? Here, we'll even give you a stream term so you can read it. Place your bets. Place your bets. Oh, it's, oh, it's not enabled. Oh. Okay, let's enable it.
What do you mean it's in use? There you go. There it is with enable apic v. And let's see the print. Hmm. What? This does have an X to apic. Yep. Oh! Oh! That's interesting. Appar apparently it uh, it didn't like when I set the uh, 10 nanosecond uh, timer <laughs> so here's here's my guess I don't know KVM code but here's my guess KVM code or, or QMU or whatever's virtualizing it probably has a tick rate that they set the actual APIC to or have a timer available on the system of so they set that timer um, and then if you request a timer shorter than that, it'll still tick at this. So basically, this is the granularity that uh, they will support in KVM. And what I might suspect, dangerously, um, is that they probably don't allow, like, they probably latch that you requested an interrupt a timer interrupt and then it starts its timer which is for like whatever that was that like two milliseconds or massive amount of time or like 0.2 milliseconds or wh whatever it was so if you set a timer that's less than that you get a longer timer and then clearing the timer does not stop that for some reason it just latches that you requested a timer you know what i wonder First of all, let's see if we're still seeing those prints. Um, let's see if those are fresh prints of Bel Air or if they are old prints of dead code. So... <laughs> yeah, those look ancient. Those look ancient. Those are from earlier at the early part of the stream where we set the APIC timer to like five uh, enable timer here or we set this to like five <clears throat> if we do this we'll get a new record when we boot this VM if I reset there we go I wonder if this will always work in this case, but we do see the new print. This one does work. What the fuck? What the f fuck? This one doesn't get stuck? Is APIC VM enabled now? Uh, it's not supposed to be. I'll put this back and we'll see. But it said no. But we'll see. We're stuck. Yeah, it got stuck. So, it's... <sighs> God damn it. So this is where we had it. Uh... Drop. All right, I'm gonna tr I'm gonna try something fucking crazy. Cause the APIC timer to naturally expire 
super early. And this is uh, disable the APIC timer. Right, let's see what we get. Now we don't get stuck. Um, I think KVM doesn't emulate disabling the timer while it's counting down. Ah, uh, but that's strange because why wouldn't writing zero overwrite the prior state? I do think what I have done is probably created a very short race condition. So instead of being the large race it was before, it's now this, whatever that is, what's uh, 0.2 milliseconds. Um, if I get rid of these prints, I bet we might be able to get stuck. Um, disable interrupts. And then we do our prints. So now we don't do any prints there. And we got stuck. The prints, the prints took more than uh, 200,000 nanos. So yeah, it took more than 0.2 seconds to do the prints, which means that the um, timer actually expired. Uh, but yeah, basically, you cannot disable. Let's see if this is working on real hardware. It is. We have, we have two physical machines that are working. With this code, we shipped up this code, right? Because they auto-downloaded this new one. And they're both taking it, no problem. So, that means... That basically means that the... Uh, fuck! Huh! I think... Yeah, you just can't you can't disable the APIC timer unless it naturally counts down in KVM. Which is a, I would say a pretty big fucking oversight, to be honest. Let's go take a look. Let's find that KVM code. Uh QMU KVM. Actually is that is QMU is KVM baked into QMU if I just get the QMU source code, which I probably already have. Uh, git clone. Do, 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 do. It's a lot of deltas to resolve. All right. Isn't KVM part of the Linux kernel? KVM is, but the devices are in QMU. It's hard to say uh, where this code will be. This is, yeah, this is probably going to be kernel side here. Um, yeah, so this is actually going to be kernel side code. But the APIC emulation is likely in uh, user space. Well, maybe not for the APIC because it's fast. They probably optimize it by putting it in the kernel. Uh, but, like, the device emulation in QMU is done in user land when you use KVM. So let's uh, let's grab the Linux source, and we'll do KVM LAPIC disable. Let's see if we can find a bug for it. Honestly, this might just do the trick. And here we're gonna have a disable. Hardware software disabled. This is the APIC that they emulate. This is where we find a security bug on stream. <laughs> it's like, find some fucking massive heap corruption here. <laughs> um, so here's the EOI, read and writes, and 
Send Ippy. Uh, let's find timer. Uh, where's that fucking search string? Requested. There we go. Right there. Uh, do not allow the guest to program periodic timers with small intervals since the HR timers are not throttled by the host scheduler. Okay. Uh, okay, so limit periodic. This is update the, uh, um, LVTT. The fuck is that? The la local APIC virtual timer. Let's see, what, what is that? TT. I think that is the initial timer. Where is my doc? Where are my docs? Where did I put my docs? Here. Okay. Three twenty. What is LVTT? Oh, that's the uh uh that's the LVT for the timer. Okay, that makes sense. Get that. Uh, update LVTT. So this is when I write to the LVTT, but what I care about is writing to the, um, the initial count register. I'm guessing this TMICT, Tiber initial count, probably. Notice my home directory. What's my home directory? Uh, 380. 380. Okay. So this, this is the code that executes when we write to the TMICT pleb. Oh, yeah. Uh, HR timer cancel. Um... Yeah, all right, we're fucking checking out the Linux kernel tree. I can't fucking do this online, man. Killing me. Do 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 Oh my god, come on. Maybe I should have done like a depth one shallow clone. God, how much code does it take to make a kernel? My kernel doesn't take this long to check out. Do you just want the KVM part? Maybe. I might actually be curious about some of the XREFs if they end up going to Linux kernel timers. But we'll grab it to, we'll, we'll just get this going. It's a race. It wins. Oh my god. <laughs> go! Go! Is the Linux kernel gonna win? I think the Linux kernel is gonna win. Place your bets here. Place your bets. Colonel or KVM? In it for my boy KVM. Let's get it going for KVM. Here we go. KVM. <laughs> oh, we got a lot of confidence in KVM. We're resolving deltas. We got a lot of deltas to resolve. We're coming up on... Uh, oh, oh, oh. 
I think KVM's got this in the bag. Oh, KVM's pulling ahead. Linux has to make a big leap. A big leap. It's not doing it. Oh, KVM's just eking it out. 35% complete. Oh, not even close. <laughs> this is the high quality content you can expect here. <laughs> Well, the deltas are all local. We've already done the download. <clears throat> now we're just comparing which one uh, resolves faster. I almost choked on my drink when the news article said that the ventilator machine needed over a million lines of code. Yeah, it's probably a lot of Java boilerplate. Good content. <laughs> Watch two concurrent checkouts. Okay, we're gonna do this to make the other one go faster. And then we're gonna just do this. <laughs> this th it's so close that I'd rather just use the kernel. Do the vents run on Java? Probably. I'm just assuming they do, because the code was probably written in the 90s. Okay, now we can do some real fucking source auditing with a real tool. So we'll be able to navigate this quickly. Ventilators run on a poorly written VHDL. Did you read some of the uh, VHDL? Good old C-Tag. C-Tag's the only way, man. I don't do any work in anything outside of C tags. All my Windows source auditing, I do in C tags and Vim. You just can't beat it. There's nothing that's even fucking close. Uh, okay. Um, all right, now you guys get to see my uh, code auditing environment. Okay, so for code auditing, it looks very similar to my dev environment, except on one side I'll have an, uh, a rip grep session, and then over here, and I'll use this to search for things in the tree that C tags can't pick up, and over here. Um, and look, it takes, how long did that take to search the whole fucking kernel? 0.2 seconds? It's faster than any XREF tool out there, and it's a, a I guess, yeah, real 0.2 seconds. <clears throat> Burnt sushi is a treasure? Yeah, he is. Okay, so we can go into that LVTT. Here we go. This is where it's updating the LVTT, which is 320. This is the LVT entry. That updates the LVTT. Interestingly, let's see if they call that when you update the, the TMICT. So, Okay, here's here's this here's the scenario I have in my head. <clears throat> the scenario in my head is um I, I I'm just looking for bugs. When I'm looking at code, I'm looking for bugs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I can't get straight to the point of what we're trying to do here, but I saw something interesting. This periodic limit frequency which causes us to limit the frequency that we can count down at is only set when the LVTT is updated, which is only done when we program the LVT, which is the interrupt uh, entry. So I'm curious if I could override that by writing the LVT and then programming that ICT. Well, that's what I currently do. So somewhere in here, that'll update it. So if it's using the TSC deadline, it'll just do nothing here. Um, really? Okay, so it's going to cancel the timer. If we write any value, it's going to cancel the timer. Wait for the handler to finish. Um, cancel wait. Ret. One when it was active. Zero when it's not. It ignores that result. So that apparently cancels a timer. 
We then LA pick set reg. Oh, it literally. Re oh. It literally just writes that value to the lay pick. Okay. Which is at the regs. Register page. Uh, it's one to one of the guests because it's accessed via VMX microcode. Only one register. The TPR is used by the microcode. Okay. Um, so that's literally just going to set it to the value. And then this is going to start an APIC timer. What the fuck? If it's in periodic mode or it's in one shot mode and if it's in periodic mode, which it is, or it's in one shot mode and it's not target set expiration. Print is the TMICT, that's the initial count. If the period is zero, my interpretation of this is this will get the TMICT, multiply it by that, multiply it by that, which will be zero, which will mean that the period will be zero, which means we'll go to, we'll return false which will cause us to return here. So we won't actually start the timer. So we cancel the timer, we set this. Any buffer overflow in the Linux kernel? No, nope, never seen one. <laughs> uh, oops. Okay. That's my interpretation, is this should cancel that. Um, what is this file? How do, how do I see my current file? There we go. Um, get blame, get history, get blame, arc, x86, kvm, lay pick, M dash. Let's take a look. Uh, 1875. Um, okay. Uh, oops. log, reorganize, restart, uh, move it around to cancel it in the caller just before it starts a HR timer. Move the code to cancel that into the caller just before it starts the timer. Check availability of the, okay. Okay, let's take a look here. Same code, git blame, 1675. This. Maybe. Really disarm the late pick timer when clearing the team ICT. Twenty seventeen. How the fuck does that go for? How? How? How did that take until twenty seventeen to add? 
Are you kidding me? Ah! Oh. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, let's take a look. Do 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 do. Uh, this. I'm gonna go over here. Okay, uh, uh, right, that should be the same version. I was hoping I'd have a, a version package there, but I would suspect, I would suspect that's the right source. Oh, that's a uh, meta package. Is this, this, this one work? No. Oh, yeah, that one works. Um, what was our new name? I think that lines up, checks out. For nineteen ninety eight one, yep, definitely got our actual source code. Um, so we're gonna go into the same file arch x eighty six kvm lay pick c set target. Oh no, nope, that does have that. Oh, there's the bus cycle stuff. So this code has like changed a little bit. Interestingly, this doesn't check that bus cycle anymore. Hmm. So this is trying to compute the target expiration time on the APIC, we're gonna get the TMICT, which we just wrote. We'll do it on, we'll, uh, we'll do our source auditing on this. Get those C tags going. It does look like it should be disabling that timer. I wonder if there's a race or something. Or there's a bug in it uh, clearing the IRRs. It's clearly sending an interrupt. Set target expiration. Let's see if this code's actually used in that spot. Start APIC timer. Okay, uh, we're gonna cancel this timer. Okay, start epic timer. Atomic set pending zero. Delayed work pending. Okay. If not set target expiration. If the period is zero, then return false, which will make this false. And that period comes directly from TMICT times this times this, which 
the TMICT that we just set is zero, right? Yeah, because this sets the TMICT by writing to that offset. Uh, how are we, what is going on here? That's getting that register. Let's see. That's just going to deref it. Yeah. That's a U32. And these are stuck because here, but they'll come back up and they're still working on hardware. Yeah, these are all good here. Done draining. Done. Fuck. I mean, now that we have soft reboot, we might as well just dev on hardware. <laughs> If it's periodic and there's a period, where's the period set? Oh shit, I might see the bug. Um, let me see, let me see, uh, start APIC timer. If this, this will call restart APIC timer. Start HV timer. Where do we set the period? Uh, this is setting the software timer. Uh, so HV timer. Okay, I don't know which one I'm using, but this will go in. If it's in use, cancel it. If that... If the period is zero, cancel. Um, start, if not period, K time after, So here, here's here's what I'm suspecting. So if we take a look at when the timer expires, um, or actually restart AP, a, APIC timer here, expired HV timer, this will automatically restart it if the period is set. Uh, although this is probably the timer code. But basically what I'm seeing here is that this is checking the period of the timer which will be the old value because I don't think we actually set that in the, if we look at where, where you write that uh, TRR, wh whatever they call it. Uh, um, yeah, where's the best spot to go to search for that? There we go. So when we set the LVTT here, um, that's not enabled LVT. Oh, that's the LVT. We want TMICT. We're not in deadline mode. It'll cancel this, cancel this timer. So that might be to question. This will set the reg. This will start a timer. Um, these will check if it's in periodic or one-shot mode. If it's in those modes, and this is... This in this case. Oh yeah, that sets the period to zero. Okay.
So the period goes to zero. So even if someone rearmed it somehow, uh, let's take a look. Restart APIC timer. Start HV timer. Not LVTT period. Start HV timer. Check pending. What's this? In case the start S triggered in the window for a periodic timer, leave it running for simplicity. So if it's not in periodic mode, R. What? Um, God damn it. Where does it actually, when that timer triggers, so this starts a timer, but this cancels it. And that starts, this restarts the APIC timer. That gets the LAPIC timer. That's a KVM timer. Try to cancel. If the RET is greater than or equal to zero, RET. Okay. One, when it was or equal to zero. Negative one when the timer is currently executing with a callback function and t cannot be stopped. Check lock list first, yep, makes sense. Then we lock it. Um. Then we lock it. If the callback's not running, move the timer. Yeah, I, I have no idea how this would not work unless this is not actually canceling the timer. What does it program that routine with? Start the APIC timer. Start a timer, expiration. Restart a timer. I don't know what gets called. Start HP timer. I'm guessing it's this is what actually gets called. I would suspect. Let's see what this is. Handle preemption timer. So they have a preemption timer that they use on the uh, on Intel processors. Okay, on a preemption timer, if we don't request an immediate exit, then we'll go into here. It's got to be called from another spot too. 
Oh, they abstract preemption timer to a different meaning then. No, because this is Linux. This is a uh, Intel specific. Interesting. I wonder what they do for AMD. What the fuck? Uh, if it's not in use, go to out. Preempt disable. Is it like an actual race? But I write to that, which will cause it to cancel. Preempt disable. Let's say, let's say I write to that register. If I write to that register, that other code will execute, which will cancel the timer. Is there any way? Because it doesn't happen every time, right? It like works a couple times. Um, did that work once? Done training after IRR. How did that? How did that not get stuck? Oh, it did. Okay. So that got stuck first try. I mean, I don't see any locks here, so I'm a little bit sus when I when I don't see any locks in this code. Um, cancel HV timer. Linux turn on a threader for only 23 seconds. That sounds pretty fair, but the Linux kernel isn't really that much code. I'm pretty sure I was doing like 30 second Linux kernel builds back 10 years ago uh, on a six core. I would hope it could build that fast. It's probably just linking that whole time. Pending. Dude, I have, I have no idea. 10 years is a long time. Depends on your k-config. Yeah, exactly. I would doubt that you can build that in a generic. But if you're building a targeted one, it's always been like under a minute to build. Dude, there's like no fucking locks on any of this stuff. I love it. It's not in use. Wait, cancel. How many fucking times is this gonna cancel? Restart. That's gonna start the timer. If it's periodic mode, it'll just restart it. Advance the target expiration. Somehow that timer is not... Where does this actually get delivered? Where's the, like, deliver interrupt? Inject timer, IRQs. Okay, okay. That looks pretty good. Atomic read, if pending is greater than zero. So if there's a late pick, if there's a pending interrupt, so this timer accumulated triggered timers. Whoa. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to read that. If the number of triggered timers is greater than zero, then we're going to deliver through the LETT. Lock free code is easy to write. Just delete all the locks. Yeah. If the pending, if it is pending, local deliver. If it's deadline, set deadline. If it's one shot, set deadline and target expiration. And then set pending to zero. Okay, my work is done. I can finally sleep. My huge corp client will be happy with their Objective-C code. Good luck, man. See you around. Hope you had fun. Best of luck finding the bug. I mean, eventually I'll just say fuck KVM. Uh, they have bugs. I don't know how much I want to add workaround code to my fresh kernel. Because KVM is stupid. Like, I don't want to bloat my code because their code sucks. Because I only plan to run this on hardware. It does help for testing to run it in there, but now that we have soft reboot, it kind of doesn't matter. Okay, local deliver. And it's not masked. The hardware is enabled in that. Except IRQ. Okay. Okay. Patch KVM. Uh, where's the other tag for this? Oh, it's static in this file. What's the, what's this? <laughs> uh huh, nice. That's, okay, that's some high, high quality stuff. You can't get that uh, EPIN. So here's what's really interesting. This is telling me masking the LVT will cause those. If I mask the LVT, will the IRR get set? Like my my interpretation is that. Um, Masking will cause it to be pending, but I guess masking it might cause it to just literally get ignored. Because this is getting... Oh, except RQ. Yeah, 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 here. Yeah, this is saying if it's not masked, so if it is masked then it's not going to deliver this at all, which would make me believe that it's not actually going to set the bit. Uh, what is this? This is matching on delivery mode. In this case, the delivery mode is going to be, um, it's fixed, but I'm just checking all this code, it's kinda cool. Okay, we got a fixed trigger mode. Level trigger, okay. Result is one. Okay, here's where we're gonna set the IRR. Yeah. So if I if I mask off the APIC in the APIC register, the LVT entry, uh, then KVM will not set the IRR, which will cause it to not get pending. But I feel like that is not what I would anticipate from the spec because masking interrupts, like doing a, a CLI to mask interrupts does not actually prevent them from being pending. But let me see. The mask flag in the LVT timer can be used to mask the timer interrupt. I Yeah, I guess that probably does disable it from being delivered entirely. I, 
I mean, is that just the play? I can I can write to that. I can write a zero over the um that LVT entry for the timer, but I didn't think that was how masks would work. Handling local interrupts. Okay. Vector, mask, plus. Mask. Interrupt mask, zero. Enables reception of the interrupt. One, inhibits re reception of the interrupt. When the local APIC handles a performance monitoring, it automatically sets that to zero. Set to one on a reset can be cleared by so only by software. Um, okay. Inhibits reception of the interrupt. Okay, what? Mask. Next. Has a mask bit that can be used to inhibit interrupts from being delivered on the processor from the specific, uh, from lint, those, APIC timer, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Pending interrupts in the IRR are held and require masking by the CPU. Yeah, I think masking them probably will cause, yeah, I guess, Without regard, when an illegal vector value is written to an LVT entry and the delivery mode is fixed, the APIC may single signal an illegal vector error without regard to whether the mask bit uh, or whether an interrupt is actually seen. Can we use the mask it? I mean, mass are no longer re no longer target the APIC. Um, even if you set the mask bit, And now we're past that. I don't know. It's it's really hard to say if the mask will just block it and put it in pending. I think not. I think that, yeah, I think the mask will actually truly mask it. Because we are talking about the APIC and not the CPU. So the CPU will just not accept the interrupt. Uh, so, yeah, here's our fix. We, we, we got it, guys. We got it. So we're going to have to write to the IR to disable it. And then we'll write zero, which is weird, but this will be program the APIC timer. Um, LVT entry mask, where is that offset? I gotta find that. Uh. LVT, bit, bit 16 is the mask. Okay, uh, const LVT mask U32 is equal to one shift by 16. Uh, the mask bit for LVT entries, timer, but we have confirmed that on hardware, it does disable the timer by just writing that. So masking it shouldn't be necessary, but we're gonna do it. So we'll write a timer vector. And in this case, we'll just write uh, LVT timer mask, I think. Um, mask the timer LVT entry
Okay. And I might do this. Uh, LVT mask. So I'll read the current value and then we'll mask it off. Okay. So now that'll mask it. All right. This will probably work in KVM now. Yeah. So that disables the timer. It's so weird, man. so weird but that does work the problem is we might actually re-enable the lvt based on the if the bios had it enabled i don't know maybe i'll just hand execution back to the bios reset because i think i i kind of want a software disable the apic because i'll mask everything i mean i'm gonna try this i i think this might break on hardware on hardware these are up and running, and this one's up and running, I think. Yeah, that one works. After TRR, done draining, yep. Mask the timer LVT. So what I can do is I can software disable the APIC, uh, and I can do that by writing to the spurious vector. Um, write the original. So I restore that. But I kind of want to disable it. This will, like, just software disable APIC. APIC by setting software able to zero. Okay, so let's see if this breaks hardware on self. So I had problems with this on hardware, but I think it might have been the other IRR not training. Okay, it's working on hardware here. And it's working on hardware here. Okay, so I think that's what we're going to do then. So this whole timer thing where we save the old state of the timer. This, I don't need anymore. I'll just, uh, actually, yeah, I'm gonna get rid of this timer state stuff. Get rid of this. The pick ones I'll definitely want. The original SVR, I don't think I, need to restore that we'll see um so this is to store the original timer state oh that was the restoring of it so that's gone gone saving this gone okay See if that broke hardware. It did not. Yeah, because hardware should not. Hardware should reprogram the APIC. Uh, it shouldn't assume exclusive access to it. So we're going to go to um, save off the original SVR. Probably don't even need that. We'll save the original APIC base. Yeah, we'll keep the original SVR, which has the enablement state. Ah, uh, do I care? Does it matter? Uh, Ridge SVR. So, I'll reset the original base and those. So now I'm only setting, so I think, 
yeah, that's working. Yeah, I like this more. So this allows us to keep the Apex software disabled. Okay. So. Blah, blah, blah. Handled something. Um... Software disabled to APIC. Setting software enabled to zero. Uh, by setting software disable. By setting software disable. Okay. So at that point, and that'll mask everything as well. So according to the spec, when you disable it, it'll mask everything. And we can double check that, but I'm pretty sure. When it's been software disabled, it'll respond normally to init, NMI, SMI, and SIPIs. The pending are held and require masking and handling by the CPU. The local APIC can still issue IPIs. Um, the reception of any interrupt or transmission of any IPIs that are in progress when the local APIC is disabled are completed before it enters the software disabled state. Okay. And then the mass bits from for all the LVT entries are set, attempts to reset these bits will be ignored. So the, everything is masked. And then the, we jump back. So at this point, we've like, basically we've disabled the APIC entirely, which actually makes me really confident. Then, um, interrupt should be disabled when we're running this code. And then we go in here. If, Enable is not zero, then that's a big issue. Then here we're going to write MSR. Uh, we're going to restore the original APIC base. And then we'll reload the PIC's initial state. And let's confirm that this is a problem. I'm pretty sure it is. If I don't do that, I keep the PIC masked. And I think this breaks. No, that... behaves differently, which is weird. Oh, yeah, I got rid of those prints. Maybe I don't even need that. This has all been an interrupt drain issue from the start. Okay. So... Um, this is going to be... Uh... Put the interrupt handler into training mode. Put the interrupt handler into draining mode. At this point, the APIC has been restored. Uh, here, we'll say, at this point, the APIC has been uh, software disabled. Check if there are any pending interrupts that we may have caused and drain them from the pendings. Okay. Then here we're gonna say if IRR or ISR, if either of them are set and we can EOI, is uh, actually if ISR is set, we actually wanna panic I think. And then this is nothing more to handle, break out of the loops. So what we're going to do is we're going to enable interrupts. While we're in this loop, interrupts will be enabled. Uh, and then we'll check if there are any pending interrupts that we can handle. Technically, we only want to check the IRR. Um, if it's in an ISR, which can happen... I actually think this can happen. If we're in a timer interrupt when we soft reboot, which is valid, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna add some code in here for debugging. Uh, basically, the code that I had before. Let me yoink this. Yoink. Okay, done training, delay, 
print all this stuff if IRR is not equal to zero or, or ISR one is not equal to zero or IR zero is not equal to zero or ISR. So if the IRR is not zero, the IRR zero is not zero, ISR or the ISR one or zero. Okay. So this will work. Where are my prints at? Oh, here we go. Here are the prints. Okay, yep. Everything's drained, which is good. APIC has been disabled fully, which is good. Um, everything gets masked. Um, okay, so now what we want to do is we have those IR. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to get the get rid of the automatic soft reboot, which is currently what I have set up for debugging. Now we're going to be into normal soft reboot state. LET mask we don't we're not using right now, so we'll get rid of that. Okay. So this reboot that will delay. We get a panic. And then I can shift Z to soft reboot. It'll drain. Done draining. And then we soft reboot and everything's hunky dory. But that is based on a panic. And the panic code is not going to be um, soft rebooting. It's not going to be calling that drop from a timer. This will cause drop to get called from a timer. So I'm going to shift Z. Where are my timer interrupts, actually? OK, I seem to have broken timer interrupts. They work on hardware. Oh, it gets stuck. Yeah. OK, yeah, because it never can break out of that loop. Cool. Um, so that is what I suspected. Yes. Yes. Drop. Here we go. So, check if they're pending handleable. This will be from this or this. Uh, pren. Can EOI. Okay, so here what we're going to do. Um, Check if there are any pending interrupts uh, that we have registered handles for. Uh, han handlers for. Uh, registered EOI expecting handlers for. Okay, done. Okay. So yeah, this is causing this to infinite loop because the IRR tells us tells us pending, and this clears pending. We want to have another loop. ISR is equal to uh, let's sell ISR is equal to self dot ISR can EOI, and this is going to uh, put the inter interrupt handler into draining mode. Okay, well at we want to do that here. Okay. It is possible that we're uh, soft. Uh, we're dropping the APIC from a uh, timer interrupt handler. In this case, there may be a an interrupt which is currently in the servicing state. Uh, we will EOI on behalf of the timer as we're tearing down. OK. So ISR tells us what interrupts are currently being handled, meaning the CPU has accepted them, meaning we are currently in that interrupt handler. The IRR tells us which ones are pending. So we will get uh, this will. 
check if there are any interrupts that we typically handle that we are currently servicing. ISR. If uh, currently servicing. Honestly, check if there are any... Check if there... Check if there are any, any interrupts we're currently servicing. Uh, in fact, I don't even need this shit. In this case, we may be in an interrupt. Okay, I'm not even going to check that. We're just going to say get ISR. Um, if... ISR zero is zero and ISR one is zero. Uh, no interrupts are being serviced. Break. Otherwise, uh, at this point, we know there is at least one interrupt being serviced. Uh, EOI the APIC and try again. So now we can do self dot uh, EOI. Uh, and this will be get the current interrupt vectors being serviced. OK. If they're both 0, then no interrupts are being serviced, in which case uh, break out of the loop. Otherwise. There are thing. There's at least one being serviced. EOI the APIC. Go back up to the loop. Try again. <laughs> and we do this until there are no more interrupts being serviced. We've software disabled the APIC. So uh, I think I think the APIC, when software disabled, responds to EOIs. So we need to figure that out. Uh, I've got that documentation here. So this will tell me um, can still issue IPIs. The reception of that that are in progress when it is disabled are completed before it enters the software disabled state. OK. Uh, let's find that EOI then. Let's find some information on that. Um, okay, here we go. Um, Uh, you have broadcast, blah, blah, blah. I'm curious if this will end up failing. And if this fails, it's because we maybe can't EOI while the APIC is disabled. We can always EOI when the APIC is enabled. Because we have interrupts masked, so we won't be servicing anything else. So that's one possible path. If this locks up, Z, that is getting stuck. Uh, let me add a print here. Print drained ISR. Uh, and this will be print checking ISR. Uh, yeah, maybe EOI isn't doing anything right now because we have the APIC disabled, which would probably make sense. Shift Z. Okay, that's not doing anything. Am I actually hitting this code? Hmm, doesn't look like it. Looks like the CPU is halted. Oh, I'm not enabling uh, timer interrupts. Okay, here we go. Done training, training ISR. Okay. 
Um, let's see. And that ISR should be set. Uh, print uh, cleared an ISR. Z. Cleared an ISR. Fuck yeah! Okay, now let's see. Counterpoint. If I don't do this, if I just always break out of the loop, right? So I'm just going to break. Instead of clearing the ISR, we're just going to break. In this case, do we lose our ability to soft reboot? Yes. Uh, well, that after ISR is set. We, um, because we are in an ISR, we're going to get rid of our test code. And we're going to reset this. Z. Yeah, that's not letting us reboot. Z. Noise. So that's like getting stuck. So what we're going to do is we're going to add this back in. We clear those ISRs. And we'll see if this lets us through. Yeah. Totally. Totally. So, we disable the APIC, we clear that ISR. Okay. So, at that point, we've drained ISRs. So, loop, disa fully disable, software disable the APIC. Get the ISR. If there are any interrupts being serviced, then we EOI them. Regardless of if we handle them or not, we're just going to EOI anything. Put the interrupts into a draining mode. That'll allow them to bypass in draining mode. They will bypass the handler callback. We'll go into here and we'll forcibly exit. So it basically means we'll just EOI and return from the function. Okay. Put the interrupt handler into a draining mode. If we can handle the EOI uh, and the IR with EOI zero and the IR one. If we want to, yeah, if this is not equal to zero or that is not equal to zero, then there's something pending. If there's nothing pending that is handleable, nothing more to handle, break out of the loop. Otherwise, we'll enable interrupts. That'll cause us to drain what we have and then unconditionally disable interrupts as we may have enabled them during the drain process. Uh, everything is masked at this point from the A pick and the pick. Now we come through here, disable interrupts. Um, if the original base was not enabled, we got a problem. Uh, here we restore the APIC base just in case we relocated it from where the BIOS had it. And then we reload the original PIC uh, values. Okay, so that means we're not using the original SVR. So at this point, we're just saving the original APIC base MSR and the original PIC mask states. Okay, I think we're good now. Uh, let's restart my physical hardware. Okay. Reset the Phi. Phi is coming up. And the other CPU servers coming up. So now we're going to be able to do our testing. So, KVM does not seem to mimic real hardware, but, but, that's not a huge deal if we can get by with disabling the whole pick, the whole APIC. So, software enable the APIC, set the spurious interrupt vector to FF, program the core's APIC ID. Then, go back up. Yep. 
Yeah, this logic looks pretty sound now. So this should pretty much always work. Reset. Z. 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 And we can Z in a loop. No problem. Uh, and we have that delay on there right now for testing. So what we do is in the panic handler, we... Oh, that's just in panic. Z. All right. So this is on physical hardware on the Xeon Phi. Shift Z. Good. Shift Z. Good. Shift Z. Sweet. Kill the Pixie server. We're going to Shift Z all of these to cause them to get stuck on downloading the kernel because they won't have one accessible. We want to make sure that we can recover from this. So these will uh, pull in a loop. They'll attempt to re-download. So the download will fail. They'll print that uh, downloading the kernel failed, in which case we should be able to spin up the Pixie server and get control back on these machines, um, which will be really nice to have. Downloading kernel, downloading kernel. Mm. These should be printing timeouts. So maybe I do need to save the original APIC state or re-enable it or something. Because all of these are stuck. Not a good sign. Not a good sign. Um, okay, sweet. So that test helps. That's on panic. Uh, we'll go back to APIC. And we might end up having to save those. Or I could maybe... Save off the original SVR. Okay. Save that off here. And then when we go to return back. Uh, boop, boop. Load the original SVR. Right APIC to the SVR of self ridge SVR. So we'll see if this does the trick. Luckily, we can test this one locally without having to reboot physical hardware, which is nice. Reset. Okay. Made it. Reset. So soft rebooting is working. And then shift Z. Now we're in here. And we'll see if we get stuck. But this will re-enable the APIC, if the APIC was enabled. Now, it will have to reprogram the timer, so we might have to save off that, that timer, that code that we had before. Um, if that's the case, yeah, the other thing is maybe it programmed the APIC. So we might need to actually just mask off that timer and do what we were doing before. Yeah, because this looks stuck. Okay, so what we have to do is, let's see, self-write APIC register LVT timer, we'll do this, uh, we'll be mask timer interrupts, and this is at, uh, this is at one shift 16, I think. Let me double check that bit. That bit is in LVT. Bit 16 is the mask. Okay. So we're going to mask timer interrupts by reading the LVT timer. Self.read apic register. LVT timer. So we won't software disable, but we will 
read the APIC LVT timer entry, or it with that. That'll cause it to be masked. And we'll see if this breaks. But we might have to restore the timer state, which will actually be pretty cool because we'll get to bring that code back. And I did like that code because it did make sense, in my opinion. Okay, soft reboot works. Kill the server. Soft reboot. And in this case, we're disabling the timer, but we're not restoring it to its original state. So we stop the timer. We then clear everything that we use, and then we restore the state. Ah, there we go. Kernel download failed. So it's something else that needs to be restored, which is interesting. So, very strange. I'm curious if they are... Yeah, I think what I'll do is I will restore the timer just to be uh, safe here. So we'll grab kind of all that old code that we had. Where did we nuke that? Wow. It's a while ago. Okay. This... Go to here, SP test paste. So we're gonna grab the LVT mask. Boop. We'll grab the timer state. Cause it might be working just because we programmed the timer to a similar value that they used but we might be changing what they expected. So I do want to restore everything. So we'll save. Oops. Original pick 21. Grab that. We're going to put this down here next to there so that's the timer state okay in the drop handler oops in the drop handler we will ah. yoink paste restore the original apic timer state Div counter, LVT timer, initial count. We restore the SVR. And then we need the original timer state where we save it. Which is right here. Save the original APIC timer state. Done. This. Nice. 26. Oh, that's no longer being used. One shift 16. LVT mask. What is this? Periodic mode? Yeah, we'll put, yeah, we'll keep that there. Okay, disable the timer. Mask timer interrupts. Mass timer interrupts. Uh, okay. So mask the timer interrupts. Then we'll drain any pending ISRs. We'll EOI all ISRs. We'll set draining EOIs mode. Then we will go through and drain any handleable interrupts. 
that we have a registered interrupt handler for. That'll cause those to get drained. Disable interrupts unconditionally. We may have enabled them above. Restore the original DCR, LVT, and initial count for the APIC. Reload the original SVR. Then we reprogram the APIC base to the location that was requested, uh, persisting the X2 APIC mode. Then we reload the original PIC states. And this should now work. So we got this going. Reboot. Z, 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 Z. Kill the server, Z again. And we should. Should be able to get that message. There we go. Download kernel failed. Okay, let's see if it tries again. And then I'll reset hardware. It looks like that did come up. And we'll reset my real physical hardware and test it on that too. So those are getting rebooted right now. Nice. Nice, 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 nice. That's looking great. This might be the one, guys. This might be the, uh... This might be the, like, basis of the kernel now. This should be pretty damn bulletproof. So I'll probably do a, a code audit and go through everything, explain kind of all the code, add comments and documentation to everything, get that commit up in a good state. But it's working on KVM. Reset, ZZZZ. So there are a couple different tests that I'll do uh, to test whether or not it's working. So that hardware isn't up yet. So the hardware is coming up. So I want to be able to reboot in a panic, and I want to be able to reboot in a timer. So both of those I want to support. Um, so if I can reboot in a panic and I can reboot in a timer, then that's probably a pretty good sign that everything's looking good. Okay. Z on Phi is online. Z? Okay. Z on Phi works. This machine works as well. Z, Z. That works as well. Okay. We're going to kill the server. Z, Z. All right, so all of those are now failing because the Pixie server's off. So I want to see all of them hit their prints. I want every single one of them to say, uh, failed to download kernel on a delay. So kernel download failed, retrying. Come on, please, please. Yes! Both of them. Fuck yeah. Okay, so then what I want to do is I want to run this, and I want to see all three of them check in. Uh, one of them's in. Both hardware servers are on. 113 and 118 on my hardware. All three checked in. Fuck yeah. So all of them got new kernels. All right, so now we have to do the same test, but from a panic from our local core and from the remote core. So we're going to change... Uh, I'm actually going to keep this delay in here because that's going to stress test that we're actually clearing those interrupts. But I'm pretty sure we are. So now, Z. Nice. Z. So this will start a panic of all of them. That one panicked pretty fast. And then this one will take a long time because we are using a fixed amount of uh, cycles. And this is, has a slower clock rate. So that's why it's taking a longer time. Okay, so this is saying all the Apex are in a halted state. And that's ready to go. So if I Z, yeah! Z, Z, halted, halted. And this one, there we go, nice. So that's surviving a panic now. Fuck yeah. Dude, that's so good. Panic. 
right? We're going to change these. We're going to get rid of the... Here's the debug stuff that I had. Get rid of this. Disable interrupts. Save the panic info. Halt forever. Ooh! I think this breaks if we panic on another core. Nice. But I think it'll break in an easy-to-fix way. Okay, let's see what we got. This will get stuck. Panic occurred on another core. Okay, I'm actually surprised by that. Um... Huh. Interesting. Panic reported by another core. That'll send the NMI to me. That core will not set. Oh, and then I will send an NMI back to the core. Nice! So it halts, but then I'll re-NMI it. And the NMI path... Come through here. Those cannot fail. If the number is two, set were halted and halt forever. Fuck yeah. Okay. So that's working on hardware. Panic on another core. Working on hardware. Working on hardware. Fuck yeah. All right, we're gonna kill the server. Kill, or try and reset all of these. So now all of those are waiting. Make sure those are in a good state. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we got this unlocked now. Okay. Kernel download failed. Waiting for these ones to report a failure on kernel download. But they should. There's no reason they shouldn't at this stage. Nice. Nice. All right. And there one checked in. Another checked in. All three checked in. So all of them have got new kernels. So we were able to recover them from a local core panic, a remote core panic, and uh, just a random, you know, doing nothing stuck uh, situation. Nice. Nice. Dude, that's so nice. Okay, now the only problem, the only place I would really get stuck from being, being able to soft reboot is if something just did a lock and a loop and it never had a window where interrupts were enabled. But I, I think I would eventually win the race in that condition. Let's try it. We'll get rid of the panic. Do this. Get rid of these. Z. 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 Okay. So these are just now looping forever, right? Yeah. Z. Okay. Okay. We got all of those. Now, let's try this. We're gonna try and, we're just gonna allocate memory in a loop. This will basically keep locks almost permanently up, such that it'll be very difficult to have interrupts enabled. Because free memory is a, let me see, uh, bootloader source main free memory. Oh, that's, Oh, free memory is not a no preempt. Yeah, because we never use that in an interrupt handler. So this will have interrupts enabled. So this one will work. Z, 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 Z. Okay. Nice. Now, I think this will eventually panic because uh, this will cause too much fragmentation. And then we run out of slots in our allocator. But that's something we can fix. So, what I want to do is I want to grab 
uh, let mute serial is equal to core boot arg serial lock. So I'm going to grab the serial lock, which will be, that'll disable interrupts. So now I want to see if I survive that. And I do. Um, this has a, yeah, I guess it's just never getting to that interrupt. Like, in theory, eventually an interrupt could be delivered here. Z. Z. Yeah, it's never getting to a point where that internet interrupt gets... You know, I wonder if this code literally never drops that lock. No, it has to, because it has to be able to go get the lock again. Huh. But I can't have the timer fire NMIs. And I'm just going to do this. Uh, print new kern. Just because I can. Okay. Because eventually, in theory, one of those might get through. But... Hey! We made it! It's difficult. But eventually, that interrupt does slide into those DMs. So, it's definitely a very long delay. But all the cores are holding that lock. Um... Hmm... I'm curious if I made the locks fair, if I made ticket locks. Um, if I made ticket locks, I might survive this a little bit better. Because basically, core zero, the BSP, has to win the lock. And it probably won't. It probably never has. I'm actually going to do, I'm going to add a print. I'm going to say, uh, if core ID is zero, print one, the lock on core zero. Um, we'll drop the serial lock. Yeah, I'm curious how often that prints actually. Yeah, it's just never winning that lock, I don't think. Which means it's never... Hey! It eventually won it! Okay, uh oh. Alright. Well, we know that right now this is atrocious. It's... It basically... It adds a massive delay. It takes so long for that kernel. Um... See, this one's fast because that one doesn't have, like, since it's uh, virtualized, it has much different timings compared to real hardware. See? Okay, let's go make these ticket locks like we had before. Um, problem is it's hard to have a ticket lock when you ha have a holder of who currently has the lock. Because you can't take ownership of the lock and update the ticket. Uh, I can technically do two locks on the lock. But I think that might hurt us a bit. Well, we know we're going to do a ticket lock. So we'll, uh, we'll just start implementing it and we'll find a way to make it work. This is the uh, core... Um, tracks the core that currently holds the lock. Can I, can I actually do this? I don't know if I can. 
Uh, ticket. Uh, a ticket for uh, the lock. You grab this ticket and then wait until um, release is set to your ticket. Okay, and then this is release. Atomic U32 uh, tracks which ticket currently uh, owns the lock. Checks the core which currently owns the lock. So how do I do that? If I take a ticket and I store my core, if I get interrupted, I can't take the lock again without panicking. Another core, I think as long as I reset that before I release, Ah. Yeah, checks the core that currently holds the lock. Uh, there's going to be a small race condition here. But that's fine. The race condition will only... It'll only break deadlock detection. It won't actually break the lock semantics. So what we'll do is... Ticket. And then this will be the core... Uh, oops, release. S both start at zero. Ticket and release. Uh, at this point, disable interrupts if needed. Let ticket is equal to self dot ticket dot fetch. Add one ordering sequentially consistent, and this is take a ticket. Okay, and then. While ticket is not equal to self dot release dot load ordering sequentially consistent. Um, okay. If we're not trying lock. Otherwise, could not get the lock return none. Uh, Re-enable interrupts. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do a try lock with a ticket lock. It's impossible. Yeah, there's no way to do that. I'd have to store metadata of like what tickets to skip. I can't I can't do that. I'd have to have like a bitmap effectively. Wow. Yeah. Ticket lock. Let me see if I'm wrong here. Yeah, and a Numa system is important to have a that Guarantees some level of fairness. Um, implementation of a ticket lock. Yep. But. Weight traffic high, blah, blah, blah. LLSC. Non-scalable. Um, huh. I don't think you can try it on a ticket lock.
Hmm. Yeah, there's there's no way. There's no way to do that. I don't know how to think through that problem, but I'm pretty sure there's no way to do that. Like, actually. Damn. Wait, I can. Uh... Uh, no, I can't because I can't I can't take a ticket. I can't compare the ticket to what is being served uh, Maybe I can Um Oh my god, I can. I'll be right back. I'm going to hit the head, but I think I found a way to do this. All right, so I think this is a 
pretty interesting, but not too hard problem. So, to make tribal ticket locks, I need to use compare exchange. Um, lock. Okay, first, let's get a ticket lock working. 123. I'm going to ignore the core ID for now. Actually, we'll put the core in here. There we go. Ticket release core. Okay, 123. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, disable interrupts if we're if we need to. Now, if try lock, try locks are special. We need to. Um, we we need to guarantee we will succeed in taking the lock. So to do that, I'm gonna get. Um, maybe ticket is equal to this uh, is equal to self dot load ordering sequentially consistent so we're gonna get uh, this is gonna get a ticket so this will get the ticket we would get if we were to take a ticket now Right? So get the ticket we would get if we were to take a ticket now. Then, um, uh, current release is equal to self.release.load, ordering sequentially consistent. This is get the uh, ticket, get the number of the tickets that is ready right now okay if maybe ticket is not equal to current release uh return if it disables interrupts disable interrupts so this is check if the ticket that uh check if the ticket that Mm. Check if it's even possible for us to be released with this ticket. I think. So I'm going to get the... I'm going to load the current ticket. I'm going to load the current release. If it's not equal, then I that ticket would not yield a release right now. Um, okay. It's possible we... It's possible we could... Ah. Yeah, here's what we're going to do. If maybe release is not equal to the current release and... Uh, if that's, if the maybe ticket is not the current release, or self dot, ticket, compare and swap, I think compare and swap is old new on Rust, let me check, Rust, compare, Compare and swap, current new ordering. Current is maybe ticket. Maybe ticket wrapping add one. Wrapping add one, ordering sequentially consistent. Or that is not equal to maybe ticket. So if the ticket, if the 
maybe ticket would be immediately. Hmm. Yeah, if the maybe ticket is would not immediately win the um. If maybe ticket will not immediately win the lock, or we were unable to get the maybe ticket, then we failed to attempt to get the lock. I think this works. Load, load. But I, I think that I think this logic works. So I'll basically, say like, in theory, right? In theory, here here's the condition: um, lock is winnable if ticket. Uh, available ticket, uh, let's say the available ticket is a 50, and the current release is 50. That means if we had that ticket, we would own the lock, right? In that case, we would check. If they are different, we could not win the race. Game over. We cannot win the race. However... If, uh, yeah, so lock is unwinnable in this situation, right? Let's say the current release is at 45 or 49, right? So someone took the 49th ticket and they, they had that lock. Yeah, so someone took 49 and 49 is currently the one being serviced. In this case, the ticket that we could potentially get does not match the current release. Thus, it's guaranteed we wouldn't win the lock. Um, obviously, someone could release the lock in this field. So, like, I could grab maybe ticket. In this condition, we could have available ticket where we take the ticket. We get the release in this state where it's 50 and 49. And 49 could release the lock by the time we even get to this code. But at that point... You know what, is this logic unnecessary? No, no, this logic is... Wait a minute, I think I can simplify this a lot. Um, I'm pretty sure that I can attempt to take the current releases ticket. That's it. That's all I have to do from maybe ticket. Yeah. Very, very easy. So much easier than this logic. Okay. So much easier. Okay. So what we're going to do, get the number that is ready right now. Then I'm going to self.ticket compare and swap the current release current release plus one ordering sequentially consistent if this is not equal um if it's not equal to current release Dude, this is so cool. I've never I've never made a lock like this. That works so well. All right, so I'm going to get the number that is up for grabs right now. And then I'm going to say attempt to take the winning ticket. <laughs> um if we cannot get the winning ticket, then give up. In which case uh, we didn't win the lock, thus return early and re-enable interrupts 
uh, that's the turn early. Yeah, we'll just say that. Does that make sense? So we're gonna get the current ticket, and let's say the current ticket, um, ticket is 50, current, uh, release is 50, in which case, I'm gonna say, give me the ticket for 50 and replace it with a 51. And if you can't do that, then bail. So that's just a standard compare and swap. Now, th these two are not atomic right in order. So it's possible that release gets incremented while we're running. But in that case, release wasn't. Yeah, in this case, let's say the ticket is 50 and the ticket and then release is 49. It's possible that we grab the current release, which is 49. Uh, release becomes 50 uh, while we're between these two lines of code. And then at that point, we basically ask, we're asking for 50 from the ticket. In which case, the ticket will not be that. Well, it could be. Well, we would ask for 49. Yeah, we would just ask for an old, um, we would ask for an old ticket and we couldn't get an old ticket. Basically, if current release is high, or current release is lagging, that means someone has the lock. In this state, someone would have the lock. Then we grab the release. We're going to ask for, hey, I would like ticket number 49, please, because that's what we thought the winning ticket was, but the winning ticket is no longer 49. It's actually 50. But the ticket has been incremented by whoever did that. Uh, actually, the ticket is 50. And we would say, I would like to swap. I would like to get ticket 49. And in this stage, uh, ticket would be 50. The compare and swap would fail. And that means we don't get... Uh, ticket 49 as it's not available So basically we'll only be able to get the ticket if it is the latest ticket and the release has not changed Because if release has changed yeah, we're always gonna we're always gonna have an old release value So yeah, I think this works in every condition with the exception of integer overflows on the number of locks being attempted. So in theory, if there were, right? We'd ask for 50, which is the winning ticket. Um, yeah. And ticket can never be ahead of release. So we're never going to ask for a ticket that doesn't exist. So the ticket either has to be, yeah. I think that logic is fine. Current release. I would like a ticket that matches the current release number. Current release plus one. They're not equal. If it's not equal to the current release, we didn't win the lock, blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, we got the ticket with specifically the current release, at which point we have won the lock. Otherwise, if it's not a try lock, take a ticket. Uh, and then while self dot release dot load ordering sequentially consistent is not equal to the ticket spin loop hint at this point we have exclusive access so we fall through and then here 
we're just going to write self.cell dot release fetch add one release the lock return none did not get the lock okay yeah I think that's correct in every case. Uh, in this case, fetch add ticket. We get the old value. While the release is not equal to the ticket. If the release is equal to the ticket, then we got it. Release. Lock, try lock, shatter. Okay, so now we need to use the core ID. Trilogs are special. We will. We need the guarantee we'll succeed. Get the current number. Get the winning ticket. Oh, uh, this is wrapping ad. Didn't know about ticket locks before it? Yeah. Yeah, they're really cool because they're fair, right? Everyone takes a ticket. And it, it ends up with, you're guaranteed to get your position in line. So if you have 64 cores on the system or 64 threads contending for something and they all take the lock, it's guaranteed that you will get access to that lock once every 64 iterations, right? Assuming they're all uh, able to atomically take the lock at the same, like attempt to take the lock at the same time. But yeah, the fairness is really important. So, we don't have deadlock detection right now. <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure this logic works. I did not know that you could do a try lock with a ticket system. Um, I, never, I never really thought about this, but it's pretty easy. It's just like, I would like the winning ticket, please. And it's like, sorry, I can't give you the winning ticket. And then you're like, okay, I'll, I'll fuck off. <laughs> Um, and then if this release number changes, it can only change to where the current ticket is. The ticket is always ahead. <laughs> Attempt to take the winning ticket. Rude. <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah. It's like, can right now I just get that ticket? I think this is correct in every case, but I'm like super scared. Current release, add one. We want the current ticket. L release always is equal to or below the ticket, which means that the, the old value of the release always has to be less than or equal to the ticket, which means there's no way that we could request a newer ticket than what this is. It's either, in the case of 49, if the lock is currently held by someone, we will attempt to ask for a ticket that's old, in which case it will fail. If the release is, if it's not held by anyone, then we will just get it, potentially. Well, what's the other case? The other case is that we actually grab what would be the winning ticket. So we start out, uh, where release is equal to 50 and the ticket is equal to 50, where you would win. And then someone comes along between these two lines of code before this, someone does ticket is equal to 51 and release is still 50. So someone grabs the lock, in which case we will say, I would like ticket 50, please, because that's what we think would win the lock. And in that case, um, the ticket is 51, so we would fail to get that. The other condition, if they don't change, then we know it's fine. In this condition, uh, we would say, I would like 50, and that is the ticket, and we would get it. And the final condition is if 
What did we test so far? We tested... Okay, yeah, we tested if someone tries to get it. And then the final one is if the someone already has it, in which case, ticket will be 50. Release will be, let's say it's still 49. I would like ticket 49, please. If that gets incremented, we will fail to take the lock because we still thought it was 49. Yeah, we always get the old value for this, and the old value for this will always be trailing the ticket or equal. Okay, yeah, this is correct in every case. All right. Thanks for hanging out while I tried to figure that one out. <laughs> that was, uh, it's important I don't fuck up that lock. Now, the next part is can I have deadlock detection that is perfect in a ticket lock? And I don't think so. I'll only have deadlock detection in this case. In this case, I basically want to say if self.core.load ordering sequentially consistent is equal to the core ID is like if the current core is the owner of the lock, panic deadlock detected. So that way, the question is, how do I store the current owner of the lock? So at this point, I have the lock. So I can say self.core.store, ordering sequentially consistent core ID. Uh, oops, all the way around. And this we can say, uh, note that this core owns the lock. Does the thread getting stolen from matter in this scenario? Not really. Well, taking the winning ticket won't steal it from anyone. It would just, it just guarantees that if I tried to take the ticket, it, it guarantees that there's no one in line. That, that's all it does. We're, ba we're basically saying, if there's no one in line, I'll get in line, which means you'll be able to be first in line. And we do that atomically. We make sure that we can be first in line atomically. We're not preempting anyone. We're not stealing the lock from someone. Uh, we're, we're just saying, only try and take a ticket if it's empty. Okay, in this case, store that the, this court owns the lock. So, in this situation, this core now owns the lock. The problem is it's possible that there was an interrupt here. Interrupt. And if that happens, if someone tries to grab the lock, it is held by the current core, but that's not reflected. But all that means is that we'll deadlock. So this deadlock detection, it's possible that if between the point that you get, that you take the lock and when you set that you have taken the lock, if you get an interrupt and take, and you attempt to take that lock again, then yeah, I won't be able to tell you it's a deadlock. <laughs> but that's fine. There's a race condition in the deadlock reporting, but it'll result in a deadlock. It won't result in giving the lock out to someone that shouldn't have it, right? The lock is the lock, and this is just some metadata that's useful. So that means that at the end here, I'll do the same thing. Before I release the lock, I will uh, set that there is no owner of the lock. Once again, similarly, uh, we could potentially miss deadlock detection here as well. But there's no way that we can have deadlock detection that's perfect. Uh, unless we had an internal lock on the lock structures, which is just not fucking worth it. So we're going to store that there's no owner for the lock. Uh, and we'll say owner. Say owner. Owner. Uh, 
Okay. Owner, set the owner there, and then here, sell owner, store zero, not zero. Okay, and then here, if the owner is the core ID. Okay, so, uh, oops. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, reset. We made it. All cores online. Z. Um. Oh, yeah. Since we changed those lock systems, we had to do... We have to do a reboot, right? And now, if I Z... I was hoping this would be more fair, but it seems to be less fair. Let's make sure I didn't catastrophically break something, but I'm pretty sure it's due to having this lock. Reset. Okay, Z, Z, Z. Yep. Boot our serial. So this is going to lock the serial port, which will then cause us. Yeah, and we're just never, we never have an interrupt enabled such that we can check that. Okay, so here's a theory. Panic should always work. Uh, oh, and we have the APIC timer for that. Um, oh, and another thing that I could do is I could, on the lock cell, if it disables inter interlock, exit lock. Lock add. Yeah, I actually have to keep interrupts disabled while I'm trying to get this lock. So the second I take a ticket, interrupts need to be disabled. Otherwise, I can get preempted by myself, take a new ticket, and then I'm deadlocked. So I do need that on the outside. So... If the owner is the core ID, so let's see if we do this. Let's trigger our, our deadlock detection, it should. Deadlock detected, nice. And then I should be able to print uh, core try lock serial is some. Oops, wow. Serial, try lock is sum, boot args. I just want to make sure that's none, because it should be, or false. Deadlock detected, what? Ooh. Oh, uh, I can't print when I'm in here. Yeah, I'll do this on something else. I'll do this on freemem. I can't print if I have the print lock. Uh, 72. Free memory, okay. Oh, and I can't print until I release that serial lock. All right, well, this is what I wanted to do. We'll just do this test. That's the test. There's the serial lock, okay, this. So we'll get a test here that'll tell me whether or not I can take that lock 
And we'll put this in a scope so we don't end up holding the free memory lock. Reboot. False. Cool. That means we didn't give out that lock. Okay. And I can't shift Z there, but let's see if I get rid of this. If I just loop forever, this should work. It's just because that lock, no one's... Oops. The odds that I win that lock are so, are so low. Z. Okay, that works. Now, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the APIC timer on all the cores. So all the cores will have their timers enabled. Uh, fuck, I keep misclicking. Text console, reset. Okay. In this case, all the cores have their uh, timers enabled. Sweet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the logic of the timer handler in APIC. Uh, check. Or print. Uh, timer. Timer interrupt. Okay. Attempt soft reboot. And attempt soft reboot will go into uh, panic. Attempt soft reboot. We're going to allow soft reboots from any core. We're going to try and get access to the serial port. If we found a Z, uh, panic uh, soft reboot. Um, requested from timer. That'll cause us to panic. We should be able to panic from any core at this point in time. So try lock that, get a bite. If we add that, then we're just gonna panic this core. We don't really care. We're in, we're in the middle of an interrupt. Who fucking cares? Panic, because our stuff should be sensitive enough to that. And now, Z, nice soft reboot requested from timer. And then that takes another Z, I see. Um, and here we can do uh, static soft reboot requested. Atomic bool is atomic bool new false. Uh, records if a soft reboot has been requested. If it has been, we will uh, soft reboot as soon as we can. Okay, atomic bool. So that'll set here before we panic. Store true, ordering sequentially consistent. Uh, request a soft reboot. Uh, force a panic. That'll NMI. That'll send an NMI. Uh, effective. Uh, panics are basically like the most handled thing in our kernel. We should be able to panic in almost any circumstance. We can panic inside of a. An interrupt handler, we can panic inside of a exception handler, we can panic inside of a timer interrupt, we can panic outside of all these things, uh, regardless of locks held. So panics are like, it's safe to do a panic. So this basically relies on the safety of the panics to get delivered correctly. So we're, we're building on those panics being really stable. So we set that the soft reboot is requested. And then down here, uh, there's another location. This is going to look for a Z. Um, if that is Z, or, uh, we'll do this, while, while the soft reboot load is not equal to true, then, while, uh, if emergency serial read byte is equal to sum b z, 
uh, store true. So wait for a byte, store it. At this point, uh, okay. And this will be uh, starting soft reboot. And then we do the soft reboot. So this is uh, wait for a soft reboot to be requested. And we don't care where it comes from. We have one way of generating it here. Uh, read byte is blocking. Um, but that's fine because at this point, it's guaranteed that all other cores have been halted. So we halted all other cores on the system. Yeah, I really like this code, man. This is looking so nice. Unreachable halt, that's in main. Free mem, unused, yep, that's fine. Okay, so, reset. Z. Fuck yeah. So sometimes, sometimes we'll get a soft reboot locally. Um, and sometimes we'll get a soft reboot from another core requested. Fuck yeah. It's just like whatever core's timer happens to see that byte first wins. So this means any core can request a soft reboot. Um, so this adds a lot of resilience to that. Fuck yeah. So now there are multiple different cores that are trying to do that soft reboot. Do you talk out loud when you're not on stream? No. What makes you think that? I, I, uh, I like to sing a lot when I'm writing code. So I'll typically have music on and I'll be singing. Um, but I don't really talk to myself. Okay, now we're going to get that serial. So now we're going to have that lock in a loop, which was previously a really hard problem for us. And there we go, we get it. Yes, because only one of the cores has to handle that uh, software interrupt. Fuck yeah. And let's put this back to what it was before. This. Enable the APIC timer. Uh, now we're ready for interrupts. Okay, so this is the same code that I had before. Oh, I don't want that print. So this was the same thing that I had before that was really hard to win that race. And yeah, we can, no problem. Panic requested from other core. Who fucking cares? Easy. Easy peasy. All right, let's try it on physical hardware. So this will test the ticket locks on the... Um, on the physical hardware, which is the harder problem. Uh, I demand singing now. <laughs> no, I don't think I have a good singing voice. I mean, I would say it's like mediocre because I can sing with I can sing with confidence, but I wouldn't say I'm a good singer. But I, I won't be like awkward. I do. I I love doing like things like karaoke and stuff. Um, okay, what is the goal with this kernel? This kernel I use for uh, miscellaneous research. So I'm going to use this mainly for CPU research. So I want a very low noise environment where I can uh, sample like sub-cycle levels of um, information outside of out of the processor, so I want to be able to like build up maps and detect exactly how caches are working, timings of all sorts of instructions, behaviors. I want to be able to observe speculative execution uh, and measure what it's doing during speculative execution and kind of map all of that stuff out. So that's one thing I'll do in this kernel. That will not be public, by the way. None of that code will be public. Um, and then I'll also use this to build a hypervisor that I'll use to fuzz uh, applications. So the goal of that is I'll be able to boot whatever operating system and um, fuzz it. So I'll be able to run that in a VM. So we've already played with a hypervisor in here before. So those are kind of the two main goals for this. Giant nerdgasms. Hell yeah. Oh yeah, these should be up now. 
So both of these servers have restarted. They are <laughs> basically the serial lock is like permanently fucking held. Z. Oh, it's still hard to win that. Those timer interrupts are just like never fucking happening. Oh, I just gotta, I just gotta get one of those timer. Like, there's a pending interrupt. One of the cores just needs to not have the lock for long enough that its interrupts are enabled. Well, let's see this one. Okay, that one's getting stuck too. Shit. Hey, that one finally made it. So, yeah, soft reboot requested from timer, Z. Oh, I guess it was never a problem to win this on the uh, VM. But in physical hardware, it's a lot harder to win that. So uh, the four-core system, it occasionally does. But I really wish I could make my timers NMIs. That is, like, what I would really like. But I don't think there's a way for me to do that. Oh, is this because I have the serial lock? Oh, my God. So I need an interrupt to come through. Yeah, I, basic, I have 256 cores holding the serial lock. I need one core to come through and get the serial lock. Or, I need a window where no one has the serial lock held. Uh, well, where one core doesn't have it held, and thus gets an interrupt, because interrupts are disabled while the lock is held. So if the core doesn't have it, or isn't waiting for it. So in the, like, five instructions between this lock and when it goes back up, when, when the lock is dropped, and when the lock is obtained, there's like maybe 10 instructions there. I have to have a timer interrupt come in, and there has to not be a single core that has the lock when that happens. So basically we need, we need to get 256 cores to sync up for the same like 10 instruction boundary. Um, it can happen. <laughs> But it's unbelievably unlikely to ever happen. And that's a special case on the serial lock, because we need the serial lock. Um, we need the serial lock to be able to check whether or not... Uh, we need the serial lock to check whether or not there is a byte available. So if we did this on another lock, we shouldn't have this issue. Even though interrupts will be disabled, the, yeah, because we're getting the timer interrupts frequently, but they're just not lining up in the right goal. Okay, so this is a really hard situation that we're just not going to be able to solve. And my watchdog through the IOA pick? Yeah. Um, I've actually never used an NMI watchdog. But yeah, let me let me check out how that's done. Um, um, but that would be really nice. Uh, I think that's through the IOA pick. There's a local APIC watchdog. How do you do that? I don't have IO APIC stuff set up right now, but uh, it probably programs like the pit, another timer on the system, to send an external interrupt. So we could do that. We could program the pit to send an external interrupt that would send an NMI. Um, It's kind of difficult because I need it to be... Right now I'm using NMIs also to signal uh, 
when the core should halt or panic. So I could wire up the NMI to be delivered to the BSP through the pit. And then I would have to determine that it was from the pit. And that's actually pretty hard to prove with an NMI. Um, well, if the pit timer is clear, all en other NMIs would be blocked? Or would they be held? If I'm servicing an NMI, if I'm using the local APIC, I can be servicing an NMI while another one comes in. That should be atomic. Thus, I would either get the NMI... If I got an NMI from a core and the pit hadn't count down... Yeah! Yeah, I can have two NMIs present. Only one of them can be from the pit. I will clear the pit counter on that NMI. Yeah, we can we can we can get this set up. Uh, let me program the um, pit XD6. This is the programmer programmable inter interval timer. This is just another timer that I can get on the system because I can't use the APIC timer as an NMI, right? If we take a look, um, that's virtual APIC. <clears throat> so the normal APIC. Oh, that's interrupts, blah, blah, blah. Don't care about that. A pick. And vector table. If we look at this, we see that the timer does not have the bits for the delivery mode, which is where you can set NMI. So there's a CMCI. Perf counters. We could actually set up a perf counter. Ah, that's a lot of work. So we can set up a local interrupt. Thermal sensor, we're not going to get that. CMCI, lint. When it's signal versus local interrupt is zero. Uh, specifies interrupt delivery when an overflow condition of corrected machine check. Okay, so that's like you get a machine check. That's the timer. Thermal monitor. Performance counter. And then specifies interrupt delivery when an interrupt is signaled at lint zero. Valid interrupt vectors. So Sounds like they require IO APIC for SMP. For SMP machines and UP machines with an IO APIC, use that. For UP machines, okay. Yeah, so there'll always be an IO APIC. Uh, this only works for some processor types, if in doubt that. Check interrupts, it's counts to zero, blah, blah, blah. So is there actually an IO APIC uh, watchdog? I've, I've, I've literally never used the IO APIC, which is like locally connected IO devices. From an IO device that is connectedly, connected directly to the processor's local interrupt pins, IO devices may also be connected to an 8259 type interrupt controller that is in turn connected to the processor through one of the local interrupt pins. Externally connected um, through the interrupt pins of an IO APIC. They're sent as IO interrupt messages from the IO APIC to one or more processors on the system. Yeah, I've, I've literally never done IO APIC, which is pretty embarrassing, uh, but I'm just not much of an interrupt person. So that's local APIC, local interrupts, IPIs. When several APICs, when several local APICs 
and the IO APIC are sending IPI and interrupt messages to the system bus. Blah, blah, blah. What is, what even is the IO APIC? Or do you not program it? Is it literally just what everything muxes through? No, you definitely program it. Um, message register. Locate to interrupts at that. One meg of area with base address of that minus 18 meg. Not all have the IOA pick. Huh. Interrupts from hardware will be delivered only to the CPU, which boots from the operating system. Yeah, the BSP. So I, I think that's the default case, but I'm curious. I don't think the IOA pick has I think the IOA pick is uh, has a local A pick, blah, blah, blah. There's an IOA pick that is part of the chipset. Yep. Multiprocessor interrupt management, stack and dynamic. With multiple IO systems, they can have their own set of interrupts. Um, yep, these are all the local A pick stuff. IOA pick. Um, for right boundaries, IO APIC registers. Okay. Let's take a look here. Uh, get set the APIC bits 24 to 27. All other bits are reserved. All the vectors. So you can redirect things. You can redirect something as an NMI. Uh, chapter three of this. What is that? Is the IOA pick its own manual? That would make sense. Really? A pick. Um, oh yeah, that five level paging. Hardware reference manual? No, that's for, uh, that's for the court core. core. <laughs> Where's the fucking spec? The fuck is the spec? All these links are dead. I wait pick here. Better than that of the 8259. With that, they can be distributed to physical or logical clusters and be prioritized. Each IO APIC handles 24 external interrupts. Find it in docs for anything Intel is cancer, yeah. So we would have to go through, we'd use the MADT, and we have that, we, we parse that out. How many IO APICs, their base, and their first IRQ or GSI. I'm guessing at startup they just all go to um, 
I'm guessing at the start, yeah, these are probably just going to go to default mappings. Oh, yeah, look at that. C++. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. Um. Most but not all legacy hierarchies are often, but not always, connected one-to-one -to, -one to the IOAPIC inputs. IOAPIC1 is the same as PIC chip input 1. No need to do the redirect. Yep. Not a requirement of anything standard. Okay. So I'm pretty sure what they probably do is they probably... So I guess, yeah, how does that work? So the interrupt would come in, it would go to the IO APIC. That would then get routed to my core and would that show up as a local? No, I don't think that's the case. Okay. There we go, there's an IO APIC. Web.archive. Ah, there we go. There we go. Wow, really short manual. Okay, so let's see how this works. This connects to the APIC bus, and then it takes nerve controller uh, system bus. Okay, multiprocessor. Interrupt management incorporates both static and dynamic symmetric interrupt distribution across all processors and systems with multiple I.O. subsystems. Each subsystem can have their own set of interrupts. Each interrupt pin is individually programmable as either edge or level triggered. The interrupt vector and interrupt steering information uh, can be specified per interrupt. Okay. Huh. APIC consists of two parts, the IO subsystem, the IO APIC, and the local APIC. They communicate over a dedicated APIC bus, blah, blah, blah. Whether or not it should accept them, broadcast on the APIC bus. Okay. IO APIC unit has a set of 24 entry. A 24 entry by 64 bit interrupt redirection table. Um, selects the corresponding entry in the redirection table and uses that to redirect it to the right. I'm guessing you give it an APIC ID. Oh, that's really fucking cool. Oh, fuck yeah. This is exactly what I wanted. I'm so glad this is here. Okay. So. We have the processors, and each processor has their own local APIC. They have a local interrupt. These are the two local interrupts. Remember when we saw that there's a lint 0 and a lint 1? So we have a lint 0, lint 1, and then a system management, which we don't need to worry about. That's on the SMI bus. So what we have is the IO APIC here. This has a bunch of... Yeah, this basically has all the interrupts go through here. Wow. So there are no connected lines. If we draw a line here, there are no connected lines between anything except for the IO APIC and the cores. So they're all communicating on the APIC bus. Um, all right. So the local interrupts come in off of here that has an NMI set. SMI out, reset. Yeah, basically they all take reset from the reset line. They're all connected on the APIC bus. Um, okay. So I don't know these local interrupts, how those happen. Let me see. Let's see if we can find more information. 
Let's find these registers. All right. Here where they're mapped at. We'll want to actually get that information from ACPI. AC ACPI will tell us where these are because uh, they'll vary. So you basically write to the IO window, I'm guessing. I probably should read it, but I'm just guessing. You probably write the register select, and then you use the window to select it. So basically, memory map registers, OK. And then these are all the registers, the IO APIC version, arbitration ID. And this is the redirection table, 64 bits each, read writable. OK. Register select. This register selects the register to be read written, the data that is read from or written to the selected register through the IO window. Yeah, so basically, you select what you want to view based on programming that. OK, and then identification register, version register, arbitration register, don't care. And then the redirection tables. And default value is just one bit is set. OK. Uh, there are 24 redirection tables. 24 times 8 is what? 192? Uh, that's 64 minus 56. That's 8. I wonder if there's like an IOX APIC or something. Thanks for all the follows, everyone. Hell yeah. Captain Profit. Thank you very much. We're going to go... Destination. If the destination mode is in physical mode, bits that contain the APIC ID, if logical mode is specified, then it has a set of processors. I see. In physical mode, you just give it an APIC ID of a single processor. And this is for every entry. So you have a destination, an interrupt mask. When it's one, interrupt signal is masked. Um, aha. Uh -huh. They're ignored. They're not delivered or held pending. Nice. Well, that's edge sensitive. Level asserts or negates occurring are also ignored and have no side effects. Oh, that's pretty cool. Unmasked and mask after the interrupt is accepted by a local APIC has no effect other on that interrupt. OK. Deliver mode. Interrupt vector. OK, so we give it a vector. Um, for fixed, NMI, blah, blah, blah. Vector information is ignored. So we would program something Oh, so there are 24 pins. 10 through 11. Uh, unlike the IQ pins, unrelated to the position. Also, I think uh, HPET, each timer can be configured to generate a separate interrupt. Yeah, the HPET definitely. Uh, yeah, the HPET I've looked at before, but I've never used it. Uh, actually, I think I did in one of my first kernels. But this is just a, a bunch of fucking timers that you can use. Now, I don't know. Um, God, there's so much stuff on modern hardware. It's crazy. Registers. Yeah, so it looks like there are three timers and potentially more. So somewhere there will probably be, I've been in capabilities, it'll tell you how many timers there are. Num timer cap. Number of timers. Yep, so it tells you how many timers there are. Counter size tells you if they're 32 bits or 64 bits. Um...
Okay, so. Um, got our value here. CPU. That there. I know about the TPR jump out. It's not, this is not TPR related right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really curious how this gets delivered. You give it an APIC ID. Give it an APIC ID and then read only. Write to that bit will not affect it, okay. No activity, send pending. Interrupt has been injected, but its delivery is temporary hold due to the APIC bus being busy. Hmm. Uh, must be set up by the OS first. Can it actually be done when the chipset itself doesn't have a watchdog timer? Setting the pit, yep. CMOS IRQ, HPET IRQ, to NMI, send to all CPUs, yeah. Yeah. Um... What sucks is that on AMD processors, you can actually set the local APIC timer to NMI. <laughs> but yeah, so what I would do, you have the destination here, but I'm actually really curious for the modern IO APIC, how that works with the X2 APIC. Because the X2 APIC uses 32-bit APIC identifiers, so I, I actually have no idea how this would work. How did you set up the large cursor? It's just default when I have a high DPI monitor adjacent to this monitor. So I have a, I have a 4K next to this. Um, dude, why is the why is the A I O A pick shit like not there? Where that be? Processors and chipsets. Search A pick I O A pick I O A pick I O A pick A pick the fuck. I don't know how this works with the um, with an X2 APIC, and apparently I can't get a later document. Uh, X2 APIC, IO APIC. Ooh, the X2 APIC spec. Maybe this will have IO APIC stuff.
What? How does this not talk about the IO APIC at all? Is it just per chipset? I, I have no idea how you would use that. God damn it. Why, why is there no documentation on the IO8 pick? See this here. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's 2002. Mm. There we go. I, I I don't where the fuck do you get this manual? Why does no one seem to want to talk about where you get this manual? Jump up, that's not really the information I need. <laughs> Sorry, man. IOA pick. Where do I fucking get that? Like th this, this shit's easy. But where is the... Nine nine? Is it in here? Has it been in here this whole time and I've just been ignoring it? I don't think so. IOA pick. Uh, okay. Um, Yeah, there's the local Apex bridged together. Let's see here. Um. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Apex, and then in this case with multiple things, these will communicate on that bus. Yeah, it, de it depends on those. Seen those diagrams. Oh yeah, what was that? Ah. IO Apex. The local Apex and the IO Apex communicate through the system bus. Um, with they blah, blah, blah. X2 APIC mode. Yeah, I kind of, I don't really understand where, I mean, I really just wish I could get the latest IO APIC documentation, but I guess that's going to come from probably the chipset spec. Um, let me see if I can find the chipset spec for the latest one, but I wouldn't be surprised if the chipset specs are uh, not easily findable. So if I do I have specs, um, that's the actual specs, and then we want manuals or something. Oh my god. I think this is where is the chipset where that lives, the IO APIC? Or is that somewhere on the physical package? But I don't know. Was there a data sheet section there? Otherwise, we'll just search. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> hey, that actually went pretty well. So the question is, will this have? I will go to this. Oops. Oh, this stuff's cool. I love looking at these things, man. It's so cool to look at, like, all this stuff. It's, it's crazy how flexible the address space is. It's unreal, man. It's unreal. IO APIC. Cannot copy is a protected document. Is it in here? Or did you find a different one? Integrated IO APIC capability. Here's APIC in 510. Where are we at? Yeah, okay. With 24 interrupts, yep. Uh, in the PCH, okay. Sweet, I think we finally found recent fucking documentation. <laughs> it's on an X99, which is uh, relatively recent. Interrupt mapping. So, okay, so those cascade from the 8259. The AD259 is like the original one. We we found the we found this chipset one. I guess we we had to Google for it, but we did find it surprisingly. Apic interrupt mapping. Yeah, so we have twenty four, and that comes from the eighty two fifty nine. Then these, you can get from PCI. So I guess these IRQs are basically what you program devices to use. So you'd like set up a device to issue one of those IRQs. 
I'm surprised there are so few interrupts. Internal devices are routable. Maybe they mux somehow. I feel like there, there's got to be a way that you can get more PCI message based interrupts. In A, in D. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Bus device function associated with the request. Allows the BIOS to program the BDA, BDF. Okay. So, like, literally the hardware specs. Huh. Wow. Um didn't have that didn't have too much information in here, did it? Shit. Um, I'm I'm looking for how the IO APIC works with an X2 APIC, but I I don't can't I can't find any information on that. <laughs> that IO APIC arm, hell yeah! <laughs> Page one fifty three. Oh, wow, that's a great, great diagram. Very, very, very many pixels in there. <laughs> 153, option three. Yep. Uh, the interrupts are mapped directly to the processor messages without going to that or that. Whoa. Edge triggered mode. That must be set. That's on some... That sounds like some stuff that's probably not, that's the standard option. Zero and one. Legacy replacement. That goes to two. Ah. Standard option. This is for H pets, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, we can't ignore this and not have an NMI uh, watchdog, but I. I would I would like to have one, but for some reason. Logical destination mode. Maybe you have to use that. Local APIC address, cluster address. I wonder if you if you do logical, do you just use the whole destination register? I doubt there's gonna be anything on the X2 APIC in here. Well, there's probably gonna be a section, but it probably won't talk too much about it. Oh yeah, they don't even. <laughs> God damn. Yep. Fuck. <sighs> How is there no X or IOA fix back? How do people do fucking interrupts? Uh. 
It's insane. ICH, ooh, ICH 10. That's old. What is the latest? I see a 17. Nope. 16? 15? Intel ICH? Yeah, let's see what version we're on. Oh, this is old. Yeah, they switched away from this entirely. I think. Yep, then they switched to PCH. IO controller. Okay, it does it does like pretty much everything. That's what the integrated oh integrated display is separate. Okay. As for Sandy, Ivy, Hazel EP, Broad OEP, Skylake. Skylake W. All right, Coffee Lakes. Desktop home. So they use like com different ones. So I really only care about servers. Skylake W. Those are fresh. Okay, let's find info on this. Uh, PCH spec or data sheet. God damn, I just want to write code. C620. Hey, 2019. Oh. So what is a C620? What what version is that? Why can't I search? My search is broken. Okay, where the fuck is 620? I'm going to have to manually find it. Because apparently I can't search. Dude, why is why does my search not work? I'll close it, reopen it. 620. Highlight all. Reset that tab. Oh, my God. Oh, it's... Uh, yeah. So this is Lewisburg. And a bunch of revisions. And this is on Skylake X, Skylake W. So these are pretty modern. All right, let's take a look at this. IOAPIC. IOAPIC. Or is this going to be the same as the last one? Here's HPET. Hey! Actual numbers. Hardcore Intel Apic Research Party. Ooh, Gigabit Ethernet Controller. Nice. Is there literally a Gigabit Ethernet Controller in there? Oop. 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 Oh, this is this is like actually programming the PCR itself, or PCH itself. Uh oh, this is this is the IOAPIC registers. Yeah, the redirection table entries. Oh, look at that! They've got a shit ton more. They've got 120. 
Hell yeah! And we have a default value? Oh man, we've got actual information here! But I guess, I guess you have no way of knowing which version you're on? Oh, they describe what they do! Oh! Oh, thank god they give us one bit of scratch pad sa space. Does ACPI tell me the version of this? Or like how many how many fields there are? Actually, here, maximum redirection entries. Hard coded to 77. That's what I wanted. That's all I care about is that field right there. That's the only bit I care about. Well, now I want to figure out how this works with an X2A pick. But I'm happy with that. Is defaulted to 17 to indicate 24. BIOS must write to this after this to lock down the value. It allows the BIOS to utilize some of the entries for its own purpose. May program this up to 78. Um, okay, so we have the redirection entries. Destination. These bits are sent to the local APIC only one process. Uh, okay. They become those bits of the address. What? So the vector. So you get you get an interrupt. So these are I guess all the IRQ entries. You get an interrupt. You then redirect that to a vector. You can say that's an NMI. Wait. Not supported. The fuck? What? Wait. What? <laughs> what the fuck? This is not supported. I'm so confused. Index register, data UI. So is how you access it. Okay, data UR. Yeah, it still doesn't mention how you deal with Epic ID. That's logical. Logical destination. The Epic ID. I guess I guess that you'll have to derive if you have an X2 APIC, the APIC ID, the APIC ID will probably be some subset of the actual APIC ID. Physical, use 59 to 56. How many bits is that? 56, 57, 58, 59. 16 processors? So there's going to be an IO APIC for every 16 processors? Or every 16 cores? Or every... Eight cores if you have threads. The f fuck? I feel like this spec is not really telling me much about what I want to know. And then... 
Redirection table entry by default. That is set to this. I think that just means it sends to actually what is that? Bit sixteen is set. It's a mask. So I guess you have to figure out your IO APIC address. Let me see what ACPI says. Maybe ACPI like will tell me what bits to mask off or something like that. Um this tables. Why has it gone and done that? How do I how do I change this and not be in this view? There we go. I don't know how I set that. Um, okay. IO APIC. IO S APIC. The IO APIC's ID. The IO APIC's address. The global system interrupt number where this IO APIC interrupt inputs start. The number of inputs is uh, determined by max redirect entry register. And that is here. So this basically says the global system interrupt number. So that's the IRQ. Each IO APIC has a series of system interrupts until I n, where value of n is from 0 to the last on the IO APIC. Declares which global system interrupts are uniquely associated with the IO APIC system interrupts. There's one for each IO APIC on the system. APIC and dual 8259, okay. Those must map global system interrupts 0 to 15 to the 8259's 0 to 15, okay. Except where source rights are over are provided. That means the IO APIC interrupts inputs 0 to 15 must be mapped to global system interrupts 0 to 15, have identical sources as the IOQs from 0 to 15 on the 8259 allows a platform to support OSTM, blah, 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 that use APIC model as well as that, that use the 8259 model. When it supports 8259, if it has APIC, it'll enable the APIC and will use all reported global system interrupts that fall within the limits of those, okay. Interrupt source override. Variances between the IAP uh, standard. Connected to IRQ zero, but in APIC mode, it's connected to two, then you need an source where the source entry is zero and the global system interrupt is two. Okay. NMI source structure. Which IO APIC interrupts input should be enabled as non-maskable? Global system interrupt that will NMI the signal. Describes that, that. Um, platform has four processors. NMI is connected to that for three and two. Two would be here. 
to specify which of the IO APIC interrupt inputs should be enabled as non-maskable. Any source that is not maskable will not be available for use by devices. Okay, so that allows hardware to like have certain IR, um, IRQs that are not maskable. All right, let's see what we can find here. Local APIC address override. Well, we don't care about that. Um, S APIC. What is an SA pick? I don't know if that's old or new. <laughs> um. Oh, is that for the Itanium? Yeah, I think that's titanium stuff. Okay. We have the X2 APIC ID, NMI structure. Um, no, nah, I think it uses something different. It probably uses the S. I I think the SA pick might be something different. I don't know. Ooh. So we have all these IOA picks. And then these are the bases, the system vector base. Local X2 APIC interrupt lint N, which it's connected. Then this is the UID. Unique identifier of that processor. How many different APICs are there? A lot. A lot. <laughs> So how do I know? Uh, I can thought of plug and play IQ numbers. They're used to virtualize interrupts and tables and those. Do not confuse them with ISA IRQs because of that. Two interrupt models. The APIC model. Number of interrupts supported by each IO APIC can vary. Adds all of them up, basically. Um, it's depicted in that. There's one IO APIC structure per IO APIC on the system. So in this case, yep, you have these IRQs, the global system uh, for an 8259. So how the fuck, I guess... How do I know what IOA pick? Local APIC structure. A unique ID here.
Um, dude, I feel like I'm making no progress at all reading these specs. Like, the only thing that would make sense to me is you take your APIC ID and you mask it off in some way, and that will give you the IO APIC ID. And that's just not mentioned anywhere. I know how to get access to the IO APIC. That's easy. I know how to program the IO APIC. That's easy. I know how to figure out the global interrupt basis for everything, and that's easy. I know how to figure out the overrides of which... Which interrupts map to which uh, IO APIC pins? So I can tell you which interrupts go to which IO APIC pins, but I can't tell you how I route that to an APIC. I know that I mentioned which APIC I want it to route to. I also know that this document says that NMIs are not supported, which is strange to me. That bit's never set for NMI. Like, I, I, I really, I can't send them an NMI through the IO APIC? I feel like that's one of the standard things the IO APIC is supposed to let you do. Where's that first IO APIC spec? The very, the... The easy one. This one. This is the original IOA pick. Registers. Here we go. Max redirection entry. Okay, cool. That's the APIC ID, 59 to 56. Destination mode. Ooh. NMI. NMI is treated as an edge trigger interrupt, even if it is programmed as a level tri trigger interrupt. Must be programmed to edge. I think edge is default, pretty sure. Level is like the weird case, All right? Yeah, level is the, kind of the weird case. Um, A bus, constant meaning the ISA, bus relative interrupt source, and the global system interrupt. <laughs> it seems like there's not a lot of information. Yeah, I agree. It'll probably all click in a second here. I'm just waiting for that click. But like, how do I know the APIC ID that I use? Why is that such a hard problem? God damn it. All right, let's program the pit. Let's just fire up the fucking pit and we'll see what it does. Jesus. Let's just write some code, man. Reading docs, never fun. This is hard programmed uh, at a specific location. So what we can do is we can program this uh, pretty easily. We'll also want to use this to calibrate the actual clock rate of the processor as well. Um, Reading the current count, that's super easy. Example code, yeah, so we can just set up a pit. And I'm pretty sure we latch in. Uh, we'll probably do a rate generator.
Um, I just find it so strange that this says that NMIs are not supported. Like, I'm going to press X to doubt there. Because, like, the original IOAPIC supports it. So either you have to, like, be aware of that specific APIC for the C620 and know that you can't do NMIs, but that there's no fucking way. So where's the... Um, mode command register. Channel data port. Command register, yeah. So I think we'll just write... Access mode, latch count value, okay, otherwise, access mode high, low. Yeah, we, I think you latch, okay, so here, where's the divider? Read back command, blah, blah, blah. Read the current count, set the reload value, example code, blah, 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 get this stuff. You are the pick. That's for the old pick, not the A pick. But we're gonna be using the A pick. Uses for the timer IQ. Yeah, I. I know how to do that shit. But where is the? My. Oh yeah, I think some of these. Yeah, this generates IRQ zero. Typically during the bias, it sets channel this to account of that. This is an output frequency of 182065. So that one is, uh, IRQ0 is generated by the rising edge of channel zero from low to high only. Oh, interesting. So does that make sense? That logic check out? Uh, it runs at 1.193182. Then if we divide that down by the divider, in this case, it is 65535. Divide that. Multiply that. And yep, that's 33. Divide by 2. Can't be divided by 0 in the same way. Use that for... Okay. Is that nine three one eight two? Okay. Blah blah blah. Six five five three five. Divide that down. Yeah, eighteen point two. Oh yeah, because that's the. It's only on rising edges. You can see how Linux does that. <sighs> yeah, that's always the worst way to go. <laughs> this is it's always awful when I go down that road. Okay, so I think we just program channel zero. We just write a single byte. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure I just write a single byte to program that. That interrupt is masked in the IOA pick. The EDK. This might be easier. Um, okay, those have the redirection entries, identification, vector, delivery mode, destination mode, destination ID. Yeah, we should be able to NMI. I think we can just NMI. Oh, and that's for the original 82093. <laughs> if Linux is so bad, why don't you look how Windows does it? I feel like that would be equally as bad. Probably be an absolute pain in the ass to read that code. Probably, it probably has a bunch of like crazy vendor-specific <laughs> things, too. That'll be like weird documentation. I could actually probably find the docs I need though. Um, is 
Sewers connected directly to IRQ0. Is it always connected to that? You can't mask it? Yeah, I think you just set it. Mm. I think I literally, you just literally set it. Set the reload value. Low byte, high byte. Hmm. Do I get that interrupt if I unmask it? I'm gonna unmask it in the um, pick and we'll see if the pick passes that through. But I, I don't think that's gonna be the case, uh, but that's at uh, 21, I think. Let's take a look. Out eight. So we'll just unmask. I think the pick, uh, let me see. Where's the pick? We'll find the pick code, pick. We just wanna enable just that zeroth one. Master is uh, 21. And we haven't reprogrammed it, but that's fine. We're just gonna write to, uh, this is the master. So we'll just write to the master, uh, just on one core. We'll do this, if core ID is zero, then we're going to unmask interrupts from the pick. Unsafe. Hey, interrupt C. Okay, sweet. So we can get interrupts from that. And that's being delivered straight from the pick. Huh. All right, all right. And that's a C, C is 12. And I think 12 maps to, maps those interrupt numbers. So I can interrupt on, actually let me just do the timer. I'll just set this to OXFE. And that will only enable the timer. And this should be an interrupt on eight. I think this should be an in eight, yeah. Perfect. So that's the that's the uh, pit timer right there. So we get the pit timer, and but then I want to turn that into an NMI, and I also don't want to. If I do that, is that alias like? With the IOA pick? All right, let's read this shit. Uh, interrupts can be distributed to physical or logical processors. Typically handles 24 interrupts. You detect those, configuration tables, pressure on many. First IRQ. You can have two IOA picks handling those ranges. One per IRQ. Actually have to be two 32-bit reads or writes. Rake cell on win. Okay. Register has an index zero.
Oh, so that has an APIC ID as well? So the IO APIC has an APIC ID. What? What? Uh, one to one, that may be the same. Use those to determine how legacy IRQs are mapped to IO APIC ones. Then use the AML to determine how PCI devices are connected to IO APIC inputs. Yeah, you gotta use the, uh, you gotta interpret the ACPI AML. That's really nice. Gotta write that, uh, that shit. I mean, this is the interpreter side of things. I'm just parsing the tables. Fucking crazy. Completely arbitrary. You can hardware anything they like to any IO APIC input. Notice so the legacy IO keys are one to one. Not a requirement. Yep, not something you should rely on. <laughs> He's a clever auto detection scheme with a high risk of misconfiguration and race conditions. Oh, these are all the different options. So, yep, that's the correct way. Multi-proc spec to figure out how legacy and PCI are accused of mapped into the IO APIC inputs. It's deprecated. Yep. Motherboard specific drivers, which no, yeah, that. <laughs> Saying everything can be over trigger active low. <laughs> Wow, that's some gross stuff. So yeah, you basically need an ACPI AML parser. God damn, that's so stupid. Nevertheless, how the fuck do I know what APIC get redirection entry that's easy. Like, I, I know how to read and write these things. That's so fucking easy. But how on earth do I know you put the APIC ID of the CPU you want to receive that? If physical destination is cho chosen, only 16 CPUs are addressable. Yeah. So... How the fuck do you do that? What's the logical mode? Let me see how logical works. If it's logical mode, then you have a set of processors. Is that a bitmap? When desmod is one, Identified by matching on the logical destination under the control of the destination format register and the logical destination register on each local APIC. Oh, it might have clicked. It might have clicked. There's a register that I can program the logical destination and then I set that up. Oh my God. That makes sense. Somewhere I will have, okay, maybe not. Logical destination register. Yes, that's what I do. 
There you go. And then you can program multiple, use the logical addressing mode. Um, yeah, we'll take the logical destination. Well, fuck, now I need to do this. God damn it, I thought I wouldn't figure this out and then I wouldn't have to do this. But now that I actually know how this works, uh, we definitely will program the logical destination register. Check this out. We'll program that with what we want the logical for this to be. And then we'll use logical on the IO APIC. And then if we want multiple cores to be able to take that interrupt, to accept that interrupt, we just give multiple the same logical destination. That's entirely what this is, 100%. Let's take a look uh, at the, wherever that is. First logical mentioned. APIC timer, TC deadline. Did you figure out the IO APIC stuff? I think so. All right. This is the logical destination register. You give a logical APIC ID here. Uh, IPI destination is specified using an 8-bit message destination address, which is entered via this. Upon receiving an IPI message that was sent using logical destination mode, it compares it with our current LFR and DFR. I see. To determine if it should accept and handle the IPI, both configurations of logical destination mode, blah, blah, blah. OK, so we'll program the LDR here. And then here, in this, selects the two modes, flat or cluster. This is by setting this to this. Here, a unique logical APID can be established for up to eight logical APICs. Here, a unique logical API, APIC ID D can be established for up to eight logical APICs by setting a different bit in the logical APIC ID field of the LDR for each APIC. A group of local APICs then can then be selected by setting one or more bits in the MDA. What? Each local APIC performs a bitwise AND of the MDA and its logical APIC ID. If a true condition, non-zero, is detected, the local APIC accepts the IPI. A broadcast to all APICs is set by setting the MDA to all ones. Cluster model. Selected by programming it uh, to zero. Two destination schemes, flat cluster and hierological cluster. Using this model, all APICs are assumed to be connected through the APIC bus. The MDA contains the encoded address to identify up to four local APICs within the cluster. And this can be used connected different flat clusters. Oh my god. Okay, it's not as easy as I thought. I'm pretty sure I can go to flat mode. Here, a unique logical AP APIC ID can be established for up to eight Each local APIC performs an AND of the MDA and its logical APIC ID.
God damn it. What is the MDA? A unique logical APIC ID can be established for up to eight local APICs. Setting a different bit in the logical APIC field of the LDR Hmm. Setting a different bit. Okay. A group of local apics can then be selected. Um. I'm guessing the MDA is what comes through. Yeah, the MDA comes with the, the destination address. Okay, so IPI destination is specified using an MDA. It can be entered in the destination field of the ICR. Upon receiving an IPI that was sent using a log logical destination mode, compares that with the values in the LFR and the DFR, these two, to determine if it should accept and handle it. For both configurations of logical mode, when combined with lowest priority delivery, software is responsible, making sure all the local APICs in or address by the IPI are present and enabled to receive the interrupt. So, in flat model, it'll and the LDR and the MDA. And if it's a group of local Apex. So I'm pretty sure if I program every pick on the system to an LDR of zero, meaning this register is zero, for all messages that come through, it will and them together with the message destination it will be zero, and thus it will not accept it. So what that allows me to do is I can put one of them, maybe like the BSP, or all of them, to accept a specific IPI. Um, I don't know if that is a broadcast or like the first one who accepts it takes it. I think that's the arbitration to determine which core, the focus processor, it may accept the interrupt. OK. So I think we need to find the IOA picks on the system. We need to figure out where they're mapped. And then we need to uh, probably dump their uh, tables out of them. And then that will let us see. We can dump those tables, and that'll let us see where everything can come through. Get that. Get the DSL. Well, I can't. I, I can't. I don't have Linux bootable on these machines, so I can't do that. But uh, we'll just quickly, in an ACPI, we'll implement it very quickly and we're going to grab the IO apex of the MADT um i want interrupt source override and then these IO apex structures and this is the MADT this will be really easy to parse uh we're in the MADT at this stage one this is an IO apex entry Um, invalid IO APIC entry. This is 
There we go. Yes. There we go. And this is type one. IO APIC entry. It is 12 bytes. We're going to get the um, IO APIC ID. I guess I don't really give a shit about the IO APIC ID, but we'll grab it. Um, this is a U16. We're going to read this from fizz adder ICS.0 plus 2. We'll have the address, which is at 4, and this is at 8. So this is the IO address. I uh, will say base adder. And this is the uh, int base. Okay, so we can say print apic, uh, IO apic ID hex base address x int base uh, this one will do decimal io apic id base adder int base and then this will just do like 04 and this one will do 016 okay that should fit and then we'll just do two on that Okay, so I should be able to reboot this, and I'll see the IO APIC base. There we go, yeah. Well, that seems fucked. When is 12? Read fizz ICS plus two, four, and eight. Oh, uh, U32s. Oh, and this is a U8. Jesus, I'm... Uh, we got a U8 for the APIC ID at 2. We got a 4 at the base address. And we got... At 8, we have another 4. Okay. Woof! And let's get rid of that test code, because we definitely don't want that. There we go. Reset. All right. IO APIC found at that address. So that's APIC ID 0. Interrupt base 0. And let's see if we can reboot this. Uh, oh, yeah. We have those broken right now because we have this stupid ass loop. So let's get rid of this loop. And then we'll reset this these hardware machines and bring them up. Reset. Did you get the one person raid? Oh, I did. I see that. I got the one person raid. Hell yeah. Thanks for that. I don't know why I didn't hear the notification. Maybe Streamlabs doesn't do uh, uh, raid notifications for like less than a threshold or something. Okay, so that's giving me the IO APIC. So that's on real hardware. Why is that IO APIC ID the same as the APIC ID? It just gives a bogus value. Oh yeah, both of these machines are rebooting. Okay. Uh... Enable interrupts, blah, 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 print that. All right, so there's going to be probably a shit ton of APIC, IO APICs, I would guess. This one only has one. We got two IO APICs on, this is on the Xeon Phi. One at FEC and one at FEC 1000. This is the interrupt base, so this one maps... Uh, I guess we would be able to determine how many interrupts, but these are the IRQs. And this one only has one. And it's at two, feck. Okay. 
So we can parse that information out. That's easy. Then we have the interrupt source override. And this describes variances between the IPC. This takes a, uh, so we want to parse this structure as well. And this is an interrupt source override. Let's cert len is equal to 10 valid interrupt source ICS entry uh, override. Okay, and this will have a flags. Polarity conforms to the spec. Active high, active low, trigger modes. You must have an interrupt source override entry for the IRQ mapped to the SCI interrupt for this if it's not identity mapped. Okay, so let's see what we got here. I, I bet we're not going to have any overrides, but we'll see. Uh, let's... I don't care about the bus. Bus relative IRQ. is equal to mm read fizz fizz adder ics.0 plus that and then this is the yeah it's the source this is the int so that's where it's remapped to at 4 and that's a u32 apparently uh, and here we can say somewhere i have an unmatched there yeah these um okay let's go into print uh source override x2 x IRQ to int. Son of a bitch. There we go. All right. Whoa. There are overrides. Nice. So this is telling me that that IRQ zero is remapped to the IO apex uh, two. And IRQ zero is actually the IRQ of the timer. Um, uh, or IRQ OSDEV. I think OSDEV has a table of all the standard IRQs. Yeah. So the PIT. So that's the programmable interrupt timer. That gets remapped to 2. 5 is to 5. 9 to 9. A to A. B to B. But yeah, that's basically telling me that the pit is remapped to um, an up two, and that'll be on. How do I know which? I'm gonna close some of these things. I got a lot of shit open. Okay. And honestly, we're just going to use the original IO Apex specs because they all seem to be conformant. Um, constant. Global interrupt that was mapped. Okay. So, basically, this is telling me that, that this... Actually, let's look at a better example. So this is telling me that zero is mapped to two. I would go based on, I would then look up that two belongs to this IOA pick. And let's see if this tells me the lengths of these things. And these tell me if they conform. I say is edge triggered. Uh, also necessary when it has a non-standard polarity. Ooh, 
that's why they're duplicate. That's why there are a bunch of these because they have non-standard polarities. I would guess. Okay. Local APIC address override. Don't care. Okay. So the question is. Well, I think that's actually all the information I need. So now that means I can code to the IO APIC. And to read and write the IO APIC, we're just going to probably do this in place because uh, we're hacking. Since we're hacking, we'll do that in place. How do you even start to learn how to hack? And how do you master it afterwards? Uh, depends kind of what kind of hacking you want to learn. Do you want to be able to find bugs like Ode? Do you want to be able to use tools um, you know, that kind of do everything for you? It's, it's, it's kind of a mix. There's, there's value to both. Uh, people who just use tools and, and throw existing things at problems typically can like, penetrate more systems, um, but they tend to be more limited uh, on the systems that they can get into. So it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a mix there. OK, reg cell. Memory address is here. This has the reg cell. This has the register address to specify the register. OK. Uh, MM write fizz. Now, we should, we should map the IO APIC as uncacheable, but we're just going to assume that it probably isn't going to matter right now. So we're just going to do this for now, kind of hack it up. Hey, Darkus, thanks, thanks for the follow. Hell yeah. Uh, we're going to do ICS plus. Uh, no, this is base adder as U64. And then that's the window. We're going to write an OU8 to address it. And then read fizz, or write fizz. Ah, read fizz. Fizz adder, base adder as U64 plus hex 10. That'll give us the address of the register window. Let val is equal to a, a u32. Print io apic ident uh, pound o10 hex val. All right, so this will dump the identifier of the io apic. It's all zero. OK. Then here we're going to grab. I'm going to write a 1u8 to get the version register. There it is. Woo! We're doing IOA pick. Easy. Easy shit. First try. So that is the maximum redirection entry. So um, let's max redirect is equal to val shift by 16 uh, oxff. Uh, 16, 24 minus 16 is 8. Uh, print IO APIC max redirect. And we'll print that max redirect. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to have to mark this uncacheable. Well, the presser probably does it for us, but 0 being the lowest entry. Uh, for this, it's 17 hex. Equal, this value is equal to the number of interrupt pins minus one. Uh-huh. So we'll add one to that. This will give us that. I've just never done this before. Like, I don't really need to do this. I don't need to have an NMI watchdog. But I want one, you know? You ever get that feeling? Any chance you want to play US X1 server with us? Um... I'm not really planning on it right now because I just have way too much invested in my main character. Uh, and I also don't really want to play PvP, but I, I might hop on just because it's a new world. Um, 
I mean, I might train on that too. It's going to be more RPG oriented. Yeah, that's what I suspect, to be honest, which would actually be really awesome. For I, I, and zero dot dots. I'm definitely interested. Uh, MM. Okay, we're going to select the. That's the arbitration register. Don't care. Then address offset 10, 11 through all these. So they're contiguous. So I'll write an OX10 U8 plus II times 2 as a U8. Wait, didn't that say it can be up to 254, uh, 239? But the register only takes, uh, the register select only takes an 8-bit. How do you index that register? Well, whatever. This will compute, uh, this will get the let load is equal to read fizz this we have a small group of friends yeah yeah that's yeah, for the good old tibia okay um that's low high 08x 08x um this read max redirect and this will be io redirect 3 is a this ox we'll print the ii the low and the high uh high and low high first then low i would suspect that's the ordering and we'll see, uh, low U32, high U32, okay. All right, so this should, in theory, everything's masked. Nice, but that's dumping the, ape, uh, the IO Apex. And here we go, that as well, and this one as well. So here are all the IO redirects. All of them are masked, which makes sense. What distro are you using? This is uh, Debian. Fuck yeah! Bam! Look at that! Everything's masked off. Totally those fields. We should remap this as uncacheable, but we're kind of getting lucky here that um, this memory region has been marked uncacheable using the MTRRs by the um, BIOS. So you can kind of get away with that. We'll want to map it uncached just to be safe. But um, anyways, everything is masked off. These all redirect to 79. This one redirects to 7D. Uh, and then what are these top bits? Oh, these are the destinations. Nice. Nice. Um. Okay. Wow, and then the vectors, uh, the vectors are just the bottom. So these ones all disabled, that makes sense. And then these ones. Oh, let's fucking go. So all of these have remapped the pit to two. So I just wanna see if I set one of these. If II is two, so we're gonna reprogram one of them. Only the uh, only number two. Uh, we'll write that index. I don't know which one I want to write first. I guess I want to disable it first. So I'll write fizz. We'll select that, and then we'll write fizz to this address.
We're just we're just hacking right now. We're just hacking right now. This is this is not going to be the permanent code, so that's going to disable it. So this will uh, mask interrupt. Right? Yeah, ten thousand, ten thousand. That'll mask it, and then we're going to program the top part. I'm guessing that's what you're supposed to do, is you mask it and then you program the top part and then the low part. So I'm going to write that as zero, and then I'm going to write the low part as uh, I'm going to write in we're going to unmask it and we'll have the interrupt vector be uh, EB. So we'll basically program that to be EB. And let's see what happens here. EB! Woo! Easy. Okay. So let's see if we can NMI that. Um, so let's enable NMIs. And let's try this on physical hardware. We should be able to reset from this state. Oh, yeah. We don't want to... Yeah, now that's permanently enabled. So we're going to get... We're going to, like, constantly be getting those now. Anytime enable <laughs> interrupts get enabled. Panic reporter from other core, EB. Soft reboot requested from timer. Then we got an EB. But yeah, that's how that works. Um, that has APIC ID zero. And that's telling me I'm getting an exception on core zero. And it's always core zero. So let's see if we change the address, the IO, the APIC address. We're in. Um. Destination field. Yeah, there are custom clients for it. You can you can use it on Linux or Windows or OS X. Okay, so we want bit fifty six is the APIC ID. So we're gonna smash in to the top part. We'll smash in a one shift fifty six minus thirty two because this is the high part. We'll or that in. Uh, so that will maybe cause these to come in on core one. We'll reset. Core one! Fuck yeah. Nice. Now the question is, is the APIC ID of the BSP always zero? If it is, then we can just route to zero. We can set that pit. And let's see if we can trigger an NMI. So we're going to do a... Delivery mode, NMI, OB100, shift by 8. So this will cause an NMI instead. And reset this. Blah, made it. Oh, that'll halt that core. If we send this to zero, this will think that an, that another core sent. This should cause a panic with another core sent. Yeah. Yes, panic occurred on another core. So we did get an NMI based on that. Okay, so we have successfully generated an NMI. Um, so yeah, we'll actually want to wrap up all these structures and do everything correctly such that we can figure out what the mappings are. But yeah. Anyways, I think I'm going to wrap up the stream here. It is midnight. I have a relatively normal sleep schedule right now, and I want to abuse that fact.
I think tomorrow we'll wrap this up, get this code pubbed, and then we'll write a, a UDP stack tomorrow. So I think that that's probably a reasonable uh, schedule. So we'll we'll write an IO APIC uh, parser and everything, and make sure we format this in some meaningful way in the ACPI global structures. Make some mappings of all all this information, but only seven hours. Yeah, I started late today. I got up at I got up at like six o'clock today, so I have been up for. Uh, yeah, I've been up for 18 hours, so I'm already pretty tired. But I really just want to maintain a normal sleep schedule. It, I actually wanted to go to bed like two hours ago. But thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Come by tomorrow, and we're going to do uh, more work on this. We'll get the IOA pick set up. We'll get that. Um, we'll switch over the uh, keyboard check, the soft reboot check to an NMI. That'll cause us to be able to... NM uh, recover from probably almost any circumstance. So, see y'all around.